What's up guys? It's your boy Om Sensei. Welcome to a new series, Star Wars. Reborn as Anakin Skywalker. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Consider joining my Patreon to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Back on the outskirts of Mos Espa, the ship used to transport the escapees of Naboo, is currently undergoing some repairs. Obi-Wan walks towards Qui-Gon who is sitting upon the camel-like creature as Qui-Gon directs a statement towards him. Well, we have all the essential parts we need. I am going back, I have some unfinished business. I won't be long. Obi-Wan replies with some annoyance heard in his voice. Why do I sense we have picked up another pathetic life form? Is the boy Wo is partially responsible for getting us these parts. The boy's mother wouldn't have helped us without the little push provided by him. Qui-Gon continues. Get this hyperdrive generator installed. Yes master, it shouldn't take long. Obi-Wan says. Qui-Gon leaves while riding the creature and dragging along another. Qui-Gon had gone back to get the answer from Anakin about his decision to leave Tatooine and come with him. At the Skywalker residence there are three people currently within a conversation between the three. I wonder what choice the boy will make, he has everything he needs or could possibly want in life by being here, but I have to insist that there is something special about him, and take him to be trained as a GD. So, Anakin have you made your decision? I am unsure about everything to do with the GD, but there must be something that I could help to accomplish by going there. For what reason would I go? Shmai is conflicted over the situation wherein she would like Anakin to follow whatever dreams that may be, he has been stuck with her practically all his life, and she could tell he wanted to go places. To see the stars. No matter how much she had tried to hide these desires that were seen through by her, mother's instinct at its finest. Anakin, I think you should join. It may not provide everything you have here or may not have everything you like, but is it not a part of your dream to have adventures? Shmai questions her son. That is true mother, but I believe there is still much more here I could do. That is not true and you know it. Everything here can be taken care of by myself or by any of our employees, there is no need for you to stay with me any longer. That is quite depressing, despite having increased her confidence, it seems Shmai doesn't believe she could give me everything a mother could. Technically it is true she cannot give me everything, but she has done her very best despite the circumstances. Anakin thinks to himself. Qui-Gon speaks up. Again, the choice is all yours Anakin. There are a lot of things that Anakin could do without the GD, but he would not be able to truly have a proper master to learn from. No matter all the holocrons, no matter all the knowledge, all he had to work with was his own raw power, potential and creativity. No matter, all the talent in the world would be wasted without some effort, and being omniscient would be near completely useless without the power or the omniscience to back yourself up. To protect oneself from the those who wish to use your knowledge for their own purposes. Anakin is well aware of the fact that without a proper master to teach him, it would take a long time to properly do anything right when utilizing the force. What he had been practicing again was only been able to be achieved through luck. It was basically plot armor helping him along get a greater start, and the fact he was reborn as Anakin speaks to the fact that he may very well be relying on his talent too much. He needed to make groundwork in other areas as well. There were truly a lot of people more powerful than himself at many points throughout history, despite the immense potential that Anakin had. No one should be able to surpass, no one from the future, and technically no from the past as well, but the original had failed or more like was kept in check and held back. Anakin does not intend to make the same mistakes. When in doubt, trust the force a lot of people would say. It is a guiding energy that tells and communicates to living sentient beings with a soul, what to do and what not to do. Albeit it is much more nuanced, but the Forcer Atlas Anakin's connection should allow him some leeway into if his decision to join should not be done. Closing his eyes for a split, asking his question his energy resonates within the cosmic force, allowing him to see if the force itself thinks his decision is appropriate. What he gets is silence. I guess this choice is truly all on me then. I think that I will come with you. I believe that it is the right decision to join the GE. Anakin reasoned that he would be able to leave the order, just as others were able to, so it wouldn't be a problem if he joined. There were restrictions of course, but that wouldn't stop him from doing the things he planned out. Anakin was very ambitious after all, he doesn't have to tell the GD everything or reveal the true extent of what he is capable of. What military mighty commands, the connections he has. Nothing. Qui-Gon still smiling, nods his head in agreement with Anakin's choice. Then I think you should pack your things. We haven't much time before we have to leave. Qui-Gon just behind Anakin speaks up as Shmai finishes. Anakin decides to make haste just like he said, but instead of packing his things because he has already prepared in advance, he is to send out some orders to take care of a thug. Originally Shmai would have been left a slave here on Tatooine, and would have died having never seen her son before the eve of her death. As much has changed, and she could now potentially visit and communicate with him as much as she would like to in the future. For now it would be best to leave her with someone who would help and care for her. There are not many people that Anakin could trust, and she has no significant other of her own. C-3PO could definitely stay behind and help her, but it would replace the loneliness she would feel. Who says I would be unable to visit her as well? The GD certainly would not be able to because I am going of my own volition, and have the knowledge I could leave whenever I want. 
Anakin thinks to himself. After Anakin leaves the room Shmai and Qui-Gon begin to converse. Thank you. Shmai says. I will watch out for him. You have my word. Qui-Gon promises knowing that and seeing the conflict on Shmai's face. After a small pause Qui-Gon continues placing his hand on her shoulder. Will you be alright? Yes, I will be fine. I have my own freedoms as well. This as Anakin is going his own way I may go on my own because change cannot be stopped just as the setting to the sun cannot be frozen. Shmai says more to herself than Qui-Gon. Anakin has all of his essentials packed away into a backpack and is trailing behind Qui-Gon as they set off past the Skywalker residence. Anakin stops for a moment looking back at his mother and then to Qui-Gon before rushing towards Shmai, giving her a warm hug. No dialogue is exchanged between the two as Anakin is secure in his decision, while Shmai is also sure that he is needed elsewhere. Shmai whispers, Be brave Ani. Don't look back and go. Why is she making this exit so dramatic? It is not like I won't be able to see her again. I am not stupid enough to just stay with the GD, I have my entire life ahead of me. Anakin thinks to distract himself from getting trapped in the fields. I knew this was my decision, but man, it still sucks when it comes down to it. Even if the circumstances are different between myself and the original, I think this moment still heads the same. Anakin continues before saying, Mum, I will never forget you, and you could always visit me or I will visit you. All I know is that this is not the last time we will see each other. Anakin smiles at his mother as she also smiled back at him with watery eyes, before letting go of their embrace. Anakin turns towards Qui-Gon and walks away as Qui-Gon also turns around uncomfortable with disturbing the touching moment between the two. With nothing more left to say the two head off into the streets of Mos Espa, and while doing so Anakin and Qui-Gon come across the same old lady that Anakin had come to think of as a grandmother. Wait a minute, Jira could stay with my mother. The two know of each other and are friends as well. It is not a replacement for myself, but it is better than having no one. Moving over towards Jira, Anakin begins to speak. Jira I am leaving Tatooine. Ani. Really. Let me give you a hug. Sure, and one more thing. I would ask of you to help keep my mother some company. I would greatly appreciate it. Oh, I will miss you Ani. You are the kindest boy in the galaxy, I know Jira, I know. Anakin finishes off for her. Smiling Jira continues. You take care now, don't worry about your mother. She will be just fine especially with everything she has now. Thanks Jira. You also take care, maybe I will see you again sometime. I am not too sure about that. He he he, not with my old bones. As Anakin is conversing with Jira, the floating droid used by the apprentice Darth Maul makes its appearance again and notices Qui-Gon Jinn. One of his targets. Anakin goes back towards Qui-Gon as the droid also trails along just behind them. Anakin and Qui-Gon are walking alongside each other before Qui-Gon very quickly pulls out his lightsaber and destroys the droid. Slicing it in half Anakin decides to ask the same question the original did. What is it? But then decides to add his own input as well. I thought I had sensed something following us Qui-Gon kneels down to get a better look at the thing. It is a probe droid. Very unusual. Pausing and looking around himself Qui-Gon continues. Not like anything I have seen before. Qui-Gon gestures Anakin to run. Come on. Back with the apprentice Darth Maul a probe comes forwards towards him, seemingly giving him information about something. Maul's face turns stoic with some anger brewing behind his eyes, turns around, walks straight towards a bike and hops on. Maul ignites the engines and is off into Mo's Espa, with the probe droid left behind at his ship. Back in the outskirts nearing the ship Anakin and Qui-Gon have nearly made it, but before reaching the ship Qui-Gon and secretly along with Anakin, sense the approach of another individual. Anakin thinks to himself. That must be Maul. What a timely appearance he has made. Dodging the bike speeder by ducking down and rolling away before Qui-Gon says anything Maul zooms right past him. Anakin go. Tell them to take off. Qui-Gon explains to Anakin. Deciding to listen to Qui-Gon, Anakin gets up off of the sand and rushes towards the ship as the two force-sensitive individuals engage in a show of lightsaber combat. Qui-Gon is on the defensive, while Darth Maul is aggressively pursuing Qui-Gon, having his anger duel his attacks. Qui-Gon's in trouble. The guard Captain Panaka says entering the room where Obi-Wan is with Anakin following them in. Obi-Wan goes forward and says. Take off. Anakin just decides to sit back and wait, but if anything were to go wrong, he would try using some of his telekinetic abilities to make sure Qui-Gon doesn't die. That is the least I could do for the guy, because even though he didn't free me this time, he would have done so for the original which is enough for me to decide to assist in him. Obi-Wan points in another direction just close enough to the two doing battle. Over there, fly low. The ship powers up with the landing gear still out with the pilot moving the ship over to the location directed towards. Seeing the ship coming next to them Qui-Gon disengages from Maul and jumps onto the still open docking ramp. The ship moves up into the atmosphere of Tatooine, leaving behind the Sith apprentice Darth Maul. Within the ship exhausted, Qui-Gon falls backwards towards the ground as he turns off his lightsaber. Obi-Wan along with Anakin rush into the area with both of them not saying a word, but rushing towards Qui-Gon to check if he's injured. I think so. Qui-Gon says catching his breath. What was it? Obi-Wan curiously asks and kneels down to eye level with his master. I am not sure. Still trying to catch his breath he continues. But it was well trained in the GD arts. Anakin silently thinks. I am not so sure you can call everything force related a GD thing, but whatever floats your boat. My guess is, it was after the Queen. Qui-Gon finishes. Anakin decides to ask a question at the forefront of his mind. So what are we going to do about it? Qui-Gon responds. We should be patient. 
Qui-Gon then motions to Anakin and Obi-Wan. Anakin Skywalker, meet Obi-Wan Kenobi. Qui-Gon introduces the two each other. Hello. You must be a Jedi as well, right? Anakin says. Obi-Wan is a bit confused asking. Wait you are the 9 year old kid my master was talking about. You look like you're around 12 years of age. Obi-Wan exclaims in slight surprise not thinking the child would look like this. I get that a lot. It is a pleasure to meet you. Anakin Riley smiles while thinking. I know that people will continuously be surprised, but I can't help but think it is funny to see the looks on people's faces when I tell them I am actually only 9 or any of the other ages in the last 5 years. The ship has successfully left the atmosphere, is repaired and fully prepared to reach its target. Day cycle, Coruscant. Within the GD High Council's conference room the GD Masters are having a meeting with Qui-Gon and his Padawan Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon was speaking about his encounter on Tatooine. He was trained in the GD Arts. My only conclusion can be that it was a Sith Lord. The Jedi Master Kai Adi Mani speaks first in response to Qui-Gon's declaration. Impossible the Sith have been extinct for a millennium. Mace Windu interjects drawing out his eye, I do not believe the Sith could have returned without us knowing. Said with confidence. Ah. Hard to see the dark side is. Grandmaster Yuvis says. We will use all of our resources to unravel this mystery. We will discover the identity of your attacker. Mace Windu continues. May the force be with you. With those finishing words meant as a way for the man to shoot the two Jedi away, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan leave, but not before giving the council the obligatory bow. As Obi-Wan begins to walk away, Qui-Gon stays behind because he has more to say. Made a Qui-Gon. More to say have you? Yoda asks the Qui-Gon with curiosity. With your permission my master. I have encountered a virgins in the force. A virgins you say. Yoda seems interested, because it had been not too long ago there were two such occurrences that had piqued their interest, but were never able to locate it. Mace Windu also gains an intense look in his eyes, because he was the one sent to investigate both cases, only to turn up with nothing. Located around a person. A boy. The cells of the highest concentration of midi-chlorians I have ever seen in a life form. It was possible he was conceived by the midi-chlorians. As Qui-Gon says his bold statement the Jedi Masters within the room look around to each other to see their fellow members' expressions. Most still have a compassed and stoic face, but their body language gives away their disbelief. When you decided to ask me about what he thinks Qui-Gon is referring to. You refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the Force. You believe it is this boy. When you has this look about him when asking about Qui-Gon's statement. I don't presume to Qui-Gon says before being cut off by Yoda. But you do. Revealed your opinion is. I request the boy be tested master. Qui-Gon asks. Oh, trained as a Jedi, you request for him. Hm. Yoda says. Finding him was the will of the Force. I have no doubt of that. Qui-Gon says confidently whilst the masters yet again look around to each other before Yoda looks towards Windu signaling something. Windu sighs before speaking in a lazy tone. Bring him before us then. Done with what he had come there to do, Qui-Gon now begins to leave the room with Obi-Wan rejoining right beside him. At dusk, standing before the GD High Council, Anakin is talking out loud while being watched intensely by those surrounding him. Got to love the very disconcerting stares I am getting. It wouldn't make an ordinary child feel uncomfortable at all. Anakin thinks to himself. The GD are currently testing Anakin's abilities related to the Force. The task is quite easy, my extrasensory perception has only gotten stronger over the years. It is not that hard to identify what is on an electronic device, especially since my specialty is technology and mind-based force abilities. Windu holds the device, and Anakin has to guess what the device is displaying. A ship. The device switches every so often to see how well a person's ability to perceive the unseen. A cup. Windu is staring at the boy intensely even more so than the original considering he doesn't even look like a 9 year old kid. A ship. Anakin's voice says again. A speeder. And again. Windu puts lowers the device before looking towards Yoda as Yoda does the same. Contemplative Yoda stares at Anakin with an intense look. Man training the mind certainly does help me control the feelings I am having right now. What I am unsure of is how they are going to react to being unable to feel any emotion from me. Humming to himself Yoda directs his gaze towards Anakin while saying. How feel you? Anakin responds. I feel fine. Anakin's thoughts. The general way to say you are not fine, but I am only really feeling fine right now. Maybe a little nervous but for different reasons than what the masters here may think. Anakin decides to start creating some minor feelings around himself that he and others would associate with warrior concern and nervousness. I think I should uno reverse card my emotion sensing ability to help projects and fake emotions. As of picking up on the emotions Anakin decides to let out Yoda continues. Afraid, are you? No sir. Instead of Yoda saying they could see through him, Yoda decides to approach from another angle and outright says some of his suspicions. Are you trying to hide your feelings? Anakin's surprised, but it does not show on his face thinks. I should have given the Jedi Masters here some more credit, at least Yoda. He does have experience after all if not in the techniques that I have created, but in many other things. Deciding to be truthful in this situation is lying would only increase their suspicions Anakin says. Yes, I am a bit uncomfortable with the GD Masters here evaluating me so intensely. I also am thinking of other things, and I know that those who are force sensitive, are capable of reading the emotions and thoughts of others whose minds remains open for all to see. Anakin continues. Others, you are afraid of seeing what you think, I think. Yoda says. I do not deny your claim. I wish to pose a question, what does my fears of complete strangers have to do with anything? Anakin replies while thinking. 
I don't really fear these people, more like have caution because of the way the GDR, and how they act, when I'm inclined to believe that shielding myself is a much better option. I have felt the presences of all of these four sensitivity people within the room, unintentionally probe me. Everything. Yoda exclaims with some somber passion. Fear is a path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Anakin looks towards Windu to see him stare at himself with a contemplative look. Sense much not, from you. I question your control. Tell me, tell us, your real emotions, young empath. Yoda continues. Well at least they didn't outright reject me like they had to the original. That is one step in the right direction. I do hate I have to restrain my presence within the force though, knowing full well the reaction they would have. I leak some dark side energies, and they most certainly would interrogate me about that as well. Deciding to lie about his answer, Anakin says. I have always been able to do so. Even from when I was young I could hide myself away from others or sense to a greater extent in others' thoughts, and predict their actions. Yoda hums to himself again as Windu continues. Interesting, boy can you tell us why you have also grown so fast compared to others of your species? Do you have any ideas? Anakin replies lying through his teeth. Not that I know of, no. Night cycle, Coruscant. Within the council's conference room, the GE masters can all be seen yet again surrounding Anakin, but this time he is not alone, and is accompanied by Kugan and Obi-Wan. Coyote Mendy speaks first acknowledging Anakin's capabilities. The force is strong with him. He is to be trained then. Qui-Gon questions. Windu with no hesitation answers the question in a laid-back manner. No. He will not be trained. No. Qui-Gon asks in a strange tone. The reasoning. He's too old. Windu explained why with a not-so-simple answer because it was obviously much more than just his age taken into account. He is the chosen one. Qui-Gon replies, his voice resounded with a sure tone. Thanks for the vote of confidence, buddy. If I didn't want to save you before, I would want to save you now. Anakin thinks to himself. Obviously that is the very same reason, but I think it is much more than just age. It also probably doesn't help I actually look and have matured faster than what my actual age should be. I can't say I was surprised by their decision. It would be too much of a risk to have me enter the GD because they can't fully indoctrinate me, separate me from familial love, the list goes on and beat down my sense of individualism. There are obviously more reason, just like the original they feared my power could be turned on them. I don't intend to go against them anyway, I am just here to get what I want, meet a few people and make connections. Then Ima bounce. You must see that. Qui-Gon continues. Humming while also delving into the force once again, Yoda tries to see the general direction of Anakin's future, but he see nothing. It is undecided, or the force itself cannot give a direction the boy would walk on. Clouded this boy's future is. Yoda says. Qui-Gon frustrated with the council states. I will train him then. Obi-Wan looks at his master when he said that. I will take Anakin as my Padawan learner. Qui-Gon says looking proud in his decision. An apprentice you have, Qui-Gon. Impossible to take on a second. Yoda states to Qui-Gon's sudden decision. The code forbids it. When you interjects. Obi-Wan is ready. Qui-Gon says having confidence in his apprentice. Obi-Wan quick to step up and prove himself. I am ready to face the trials. Our own counsel on who we will keep on who is ready. Yoda says to the eager Obi-Wan. He is headstrong and he has much to learn of the living force, but he is capable. There is little more he can learn from me. Qui-Gon states. Yoda decides to put off the topic until a later date. Young Skywalker's fate will be decided later. Now is not the time for this. The Senate is voting for a new Supreme Chancellor, and Queen Amidala is returning home which would put pressure on the Federation, and could widen the confrontation. Windu redirects the conversation. And draw out the Queen's attacker. Coyote Mundi adds to the new topic of conversation. Go with the Queen to Naboo and discover the identity of this Stark warrior. This is the clue we need to unravel the mystery of the Sith. Windu finishes off with his own thoughts coming through. He has after all gone on a wild goose chase across the galaxy not once, but two times because of some virgins they had all felt. He had been annoyed, but that was just his duties as a GD to discover and locate if there are any problems that would arise and destabilize the peace. May the force be with you. Yuta says in a tone that is final. The three standing at the center then leave the room heading elsewhere. Being back on the platform where they had parked the Nubian ship, GD Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon are there to meet back up with the Queen and go with her back to Naboo. It is not disrespect master, it's the truth. Obi-Wan is currently debating about Anakin with Qui-Gon. From your point of view. Qui-Gon shuts down Obi-Wan's argument. The boy is dangerous, they all sense it. Why can't you? Obi-Wan says. His fate is uncertain. He is not dangerous. The council will decide Anakin's future, and that should be enough for you. Now get on board. Qui-Gon says in a final tone. Anakin just so happens to overhear them, but waits until Qui-Gon approaches him. GD Qui-Gon, I thank you for your help getting me here and the things you have done for me. Like standing up for me against what I could only assume are your superiors. I don't want to cause you any more trouble than I already have. Anakin finishes. Ani, you're in trouble and have not caused trouble yourself. At least not directly. Qui-Gon continues. I am not allowed to train you, so for now you will have to be mindful and watch me. Always remember, your focus determines your reality. Those are some wise words, thankfully I have already sort of been living that way. It isn't totally useless advice though. Anakin thinks. Stay close to me and you will be safe. Qui-Gon finishes, but Anakin decides to get a clarification about midi-chlorians from Ajiti, because even though he has collected all the information he could, it is nearly always better to get it directly from his source. 
Sir, I heard Yoda talking about midi chlorians, and I have become curious about what they are. Heading straight to the point Anakin asks. Midi chlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. Qui-Gon then continues seeing Anakin has nothing to add. And we are symbionts with them. Life forms living together for mutual advantage. Without the midi chlorians, life would not exist, and there would be no knowledge of the Force. They continually speak to us telling us the will of the Force. When you learn to quiet your mind, wait you already have a natural predisposition to that, well when you do a little bit of training, I am sure you would hear them speaking to you. Qui-Gon finishes before turning around to await the Queen. Bang, Qui-Gon says. Your Majesty, it is my pleasure to continue to serve and protect you. I welcome your help. Senator Palpatine fears that the Federation will destroy me. The Queen says. I assure you I will not allow that to happen. Qui-Gon responds. The last aboard the ship was Anakin finishing with some last thoughts. I'll be back. She is more foolish than I thought. The holographic figure of Sith Lord Sidious states as he communicates with his pawns. We are sending all troops to meet this army assembling near the swamp. It appears to be made up of primitives. The Viceroy reports. This will work to our advantage. Darth Sidious says. I have your approval to proceed then, my lord. Wipe them out. The Sith Lord pauses for dramatic effect. All of them. Nabu. Sneaking their way through the area and split off into different directions, Padm, Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Anakin all stay hidden just behind some cover. Padm signals to Panaka that they are in position. Qui-Gon turns to Anakin and starts to speak to him. Once we get inside, I want you to find a safe place to hide and stay there. Anakin doesn't reply and only nods. Well, I plan to get on a ship and get some of the action. I don't plan to sit around and do nothing, let alone how the original did. The closer I get to the flagship which controls the droids, the faster I will be able to take control. I have already made progress and I am close to finishing. All I need to do is to speed up the progress, and that would require going towards the control ship. Anakin thinks. The ambush is set and the groups, both Padms and Panakas is ready. Aimed and ready to go, they fire blowing up one of the tank-like vehicles parked outside the palace, by using their own specialized vehicle procured from the Naboo resistance. This draws the attention of the droids guarding the area, and it draws them in. Captain Panaka loops back around and meets up just behind Pad, Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Anakin, following them inside. The distraction doesn't fully work as some droids also spot the group trying to enter the palace and start blasting. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan activate their lightsabers deflecting the shots fired in their direction, while taking care of the few droids left standing guard outside the palace entrance. The group is successful and make it inside without the rest of the droids noticing them. A few other volunteer guardsmen enter alongside the group. The supposed droids that the Gungan army was to face was not there and a lot of the reinforcements for the Viceroy to rely on. All thanks to my doing. No lives lost simply because I was well prepared to handle the situation. Within the droid control ship, all units had been recalled or at least all units directly connected to the vessel was recalled. Mostly the ones that were inactivated, thus saving many lives. The night before Anakin had left with the group back on Tatooine, he had some ideas on delaying Maul by taking his ship while distracted. This would possibly delay Maul just enough so Qui-Gon and Maul do not get into a fight as he was his ticket into the GD. Without Qui-Gon's insistence that he must be trained as a GD, he would not have the chance to be allowed to enter. The group has made their way back inside conveniently where many ships are docked and are fully resupplied with necessary repairs and full fuel tanks. Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Padm are the first to make an entrance, and the two GD protect Padm from the blaster shots from the droids within the bay. Padm along with the guardsmen have their own blaster weapons using it against the droids. Ani, go find cover. Qui-Gon tells Anakin. Quick. Well, 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 I guess this is where the fun begins. Anakin thinks to himself moving to the side whilst easily dodging the blaster shots. Which ship will I commandeer for myself? The guardsmen that had come along were actually pilots as Padm exclaims to them. Get to your ships. Everyone spreads out and heads further into the hangar bay. Deciding to do a little more than just sit behind some cover before whisking himself away in a ship, Anakin uses telekinesis subtly to guide one of the fallen droids blasters in his direction. The pilots hop into their ships as they are being fired at. I think I should save a few lives. Anakin now has the blaster and with precision aiming is able to take care of a few of the droids that would have managed to take a life. I do dislike unnecessary death. Anakin thinks to himself while getting in a position close to one of the ships. R2-D2 hops into one of the ships while communicating to Anakin to hop in. I did manage to learn what an astromech is saying. From Mekuderu I was able to pick up a few things in terms of the language of droids. I am sorry to one of those pilots, but I am going to have to commandeer your ship. The original Anakin would get on the ship because it was safe, but also because the pilot that was meant to get on had been killed. This time the pilot might have been safe, but that doesn't mean he would stop his plan. More and more of the pilots are able to get into their ships, and then fly from the outside of the hangar bay. They are going towards the starship fleet orbiting the planet. I do not have to go on an epic flight and put my life on the line to save everyone, preparedness is key to survival. All the pilots getting into their ships do not know about the current situation with Anakin taking control of the droid control ship, and they all believe that it is their mission to destroy it. Near all of the droids had been recalled back to the flagship while Anakin was in control. In fact the flagship is just about prepared to leave the Naboo system, and travel all the way to Dathomir for a reconstruction and connection establishment of his droid army. I thought that me stealing his ship would delay Maul from getting here, but I guess I should have expected he would have have options in an event he is stranded. 
Anakin sensed Maul was close, and that what he had done had probably empowered Maul's abilities. I have just made him more angry, great. Well, now it is time for the grand entrance that would introduce Maul fully. Everyone walks to one of the doors, and just as everyone is about to get there it opens revealing the Sith Apprentice, Darth Maul. Maul has his head bowed, but he slowly raises his head showing his corrupted burning yellow eyes. An indication of dark side allegiance. I can hear the music now. Duel of the Fates. Anakin decides to use his force technique now to hide his presence within the force, while everyone is distracted and takes control of the ship through Mechadare. I can handle splitting my consciousness in two directions. At least for now, any more than this would be a pain and start to cause minor headaches. I will focus entirely while keeping a small part of my consciousness here to make sure and alert me when I am needed. Anakin hops off the ship without making a sound and stays clear out of sight. Everyone is too scared to approach any further. We will handle this. Qui-Gon steps forward indicating to everyone the problem in front of him is something they would be unable to handle. We will take the long way. Padden decides in a split second with everyone else but Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Anakin following her. I will try to manipulate events so Maul doesn't die. I wouldn't want my ally to complain to me about the death of her favorite son, not that she would know it was me who had caused the death. It is best she is kept in her sane mind for as long as I can. Maul drops his dark hood, exposing more of his Zabrak features. That's right, there are also Tradikas. Tradikas come from behind and roll into the scene and start to impede Padm and the rest. Maul ignites his double-sided saber, revealing the bleeding red color of its light. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan also ignite their sabers in response. They engage in combat finally, starting with the intense use of their lightsabers. It does really show just how powerful Maul is or at least shows the results of his training, that he is able to combat two GD at the same time. I know in general the dark side provide more oomph, but that doesn't mean the light side of the force is anything to scoff at either. Deciding to act before any lives could be taken, Anakin starts and manipulates the ship in the direction of the Dradikas. Destroying the Dradikas, now Anakin is free to put most of his attention on the fight between the three force sensitives. The ship will be fine by itself, at least for now. I have made a rudimentary artificial intelligence program for the ship, so it can do the basic things, while I can control the more finer parts, freeing up my attention from having to help destroy the flagship. Let's go. Padm exclaims as they start to exit the hangar and go into the area they want. The intense duel is still ongoing as the fight for their lives, both of the GD and the Sith Apprentice. Maul leads the two into another area. I just have to focus and concentrate. As long as Qui-Gon is not outright killed and Maul is also not killed, I would have achieved my goal. Obi-Wan is pushed away with a force enhanced kick by Maul to create some room for himself. Qui-Gon engages with the Apprentice, their goal is not to kill Maul, but capture him to interrogate him, as it was requested by the GD Council to find out about this attacker. It is harder to incapacitate than kill after all. I do have experience myself. Obi-Wan rejoins the fight as Anakin quietly follows behind the three. Entering another room that has a large drop the three continue to engage in this long duel that would decide the fate of those in the room. The lightsaber duel between the four sensitive individuals is still going on, and at this point it is slowly turning into a battle of attrition. Their hidden watcher keeps a close eye on their battle, mentally recording their patterns, forms, movements and everything else he could make to his advantage. Telepathic abilities, at least my version of telepathy sure is great. Anakin thoughts on his mental capabilities. The lighting is intense though, and it doesn't help they have chosen to fight in this area in particular. As a precaution I will just use Mekudera to control those laser doors that turn on and off. Maul gives Obi-Wan a well-placed kick, forcing him off of the ledge, but landing and hanging on to another ledge of the platform pathways below. Qui-Gon overpowers Maul and hits Maul off of the edge as well, but Maul has an easier time landing with risk of falling off another edge. Qui-Gon follows him down which leaves him exposed allowing Maul to kick Qui-Gon away before he could do anything else. The two then continue with Maul on the defensive and Qui-Gon aggressively pursuing. The two exchange blows of their lightsabers as they toe the line of being able to be pushed down at any second. Obi-Wan finally gets up and tries to follow after the two, but has lost some ground, so he will have to catch up. Here it is, the fate of Qui-Gon will be decided. Anakin delving deep into the force, starts to send out small ripples beginning to concentrate on the moment that is to come. Qui-Gon and Maul enter the laser doors, but before they could continue or cut off from each other. The calm before the storm. Qui-Gon sits down for a rest as he waits while Maul walks back and forth impatiently. With the Gungans they had not experienced any attack, so they did not have to provide a distraction anymore, the Viceroy is practically near defenseless. He still has access to some droids that were not directly controlled by the droid control ship, but that was only able to protect him for a little bit, as he had been swiftly captured by Padme and her group that went after him. Maul continuously paces back and forth with impatience and a cold look on his face, staring directly at his prey, Qui-Gon. Qui-Gon, as if at peace with his surroundings, has his eyes closed distancing himself to keep his head clear for the following fight, but is also trying to rest his body if only for a minute. On instant Qui-Gon jumps up and re-engages Maul in combat within the final lair. The final room. Obi-Wan rushes in from behind, trying to make it in time to help and reinforce his master. Going around the room Maul and Qui-Gon continue to exchange blows at a quick pace, keeping themselves steady, so as to not lose balance and fall off of the ledge into the hole. The laser doors close once again leaving Obi-Wan behind. Going back and forth the two continuously beat on each other, trying to gain the upper hand, but Maul could tell that Qui-Gon was starting to lose his energy. This leaves Qui-Gon to go on the defensive. 
The moment is coming. Silently Anakin has built up to this moment, and within the force it is resounding to his call. Mul pushes Qui-Gon back now going on the offensive, aggressively attacking Qui-Gon with that much hate, anger, and whatever other emotion Mul has panned up to draw from. Obi-Wan can only watch on in concern as he too can tell his master is losing, and it would not be long before he makes a mistake. A silence is built up within the force, and the only thing that could be heard was the clash of sabers between Qui-Gon and Mul. Something is different though. The two stare each other down knowing full well that this moment would decide who wins and who dies. They continue to clash, up, down, left, right in all directions, as both try to outmaneuver each other, both looking for openings. Qui-Gon messes up he goes for an overarching swing, but does not have the power or energy to swiftly evade the next attack. A change, a reckoning, a shift. Maul seeing an opening disorients Qui-Gon by hitting his face. The next moment would have originally had Qui-Gon be stabbed by Maul's saber through his abdomen. Maul goes in for the kill, but just as he is about to pierce the stun GD, a storm is felled through the force and negates Maul's saber, just long enough for Qui-Gon to regain his bearings. What was that? Qui-Gon doesn't think too deeply about the occurrence and retreats a bit, so he can reassess his situation. I shall preserve my energy for now and await for Obi-Wan. Then we can finish him together. Mole's thoughts on the other hand were not so pleasant as this angers him even further, knowing he had been interrupted by someone or something. He may not get the chance to kill the GD again. Obi-Wan outside is relieved that nothing bad had happened, and also does not think too deeply about it, and buries his curiosity for another time. Qui-Gon and Mole are still going at it, but it is clearly seen that Qui-Gon is still tired, even if he had gotten a reprise from whatever miraculous event that had happened. Obi-Wan is still waiting behind the laser screen door, as the two are both getting tired of the continuous battle at this point. If Maul is not careful, this could be the end of him. Luckily he has someone ready to save him from certain death, just as Qui-Gon had been, but this time it would have to be more so. All I need to do is push him down the shaft and make sure he doesn't die. Maul and his mother, Talzin can do the rest after that. Anakin waits patiently for the next set of events to take place, but now instead of relying on his foreknowledge, he has to rely heavily on his precognitive abilities. The doors deactivate and Obi-Wan jumps into action nearly catching Maul of guard, but he manages to re-establish his positioning. Now being attacked from both sides, Maul has to find a way out of this situation, and obviously he will attack the current weakest link, that being Qui-Gon. Turning around and force pushing Obi-Wan a bit to put some distance between the two of them, Maul ruthlessly attacks Qui-Gon with everything he has. Qui-Gon defensively evades and blocks trying to further conserve his energy, but not so much that it would cost him. Unfortunately Maul's attempts are successful and he manages to harm Qui-Gon. With a kick he makes Qui-Gon go out of breath and slashes towards his hand holding his lightsaber. Arg. Qui-Gon makes a subdued sound of pain, as his hand had now just been chopped off making him currently unable to defend himself. Just as Maul is about to go in for the kill, Obi-Wan jumps over to stop Maul's attack. Qui-Gon now with one remaining hand, uses telekinesis to get his saber towards his other free hand, while Obi-Wan keeps Maul distracted. I am sorry, but I can't block you from all harm. I guess you will take my place, or more like the original's place in being handless for a while. Anakin thinks morosely. Obi-Wan and Maul continue their back and forth before Obi-Wan manages to break away half of Maul's double-sided lightsaber. Now with only one saber available to him, Maul must change up his saber combat. Qui-Gon is quietly regathering himself and trying to ease the pain he is currently feeling due to the saber burns. At least it is not bleeding. Qui-Gon takes the situation in an upbeat manner. Maul is kicked and drops to the ground as Obi-Wan continues to pursue him, but Maul gets up in time to fend off Obi-Wan. But one saber Maul is granted a greater capacity to move, but he is not as familiar in the use of one saber, as he is in what he has trained with. Maul kicks Obi-Wan, where Obi-Wan does a backflip and lands himself back on the ground, barely dodging the swing from Maul. Maul taking his opportunity granted to him force pushes Obi-Wan backwards where he is nearly gone off of the edge. Qui-Gon cannot do anything in this moment as he is trying to rein in the pain. Obi-Wan loses his lightsaber and drops down off the ledge, but is hanging by a small bump integrated into the walls. Events are going the way I wanted to even without my influence. Anakin observes. Maul decides to rather rashly deal with Obi-Wan first not taking into account Qui-Gon, who is steadily regaining his bearings. Maul kicks Obi-Wan's saber off of the edge with him being unable to do anything about it. Back with Obi-Wan and to now pass out Qui-Gon due to his declining age and the intensity of the battle, Maul starts to play with his prey, by using his saber to create sparks that fly into Obi-Wan's face. Obi-Wan noticing his master that is full and unconscious and that his saber is there to be used starts to plan quickly within his head. Using the force, Obi-Wan uses telekinesis to pull the saber towards him, as he gets ready to explode into a jump. Obi-Wan then jumps up as the saber flies through the air right into his hand, he flips and lands behind Maul. Maul turns around to face his opponent momentarily stunned with his guard let down which will cost him dearly. Obi-Wan slices Maul's midsection near completely in half. Near completely because something pushed back giving resistance to Obi-Wan's strike. Maul has a mixture of disbelief and pain appear on his face, as his expression clearly shows his surprise he falls backwards into the long drop. His body near split in two, Maul falls down all the way as he hits himself several times against the metal walls, and watches his other half of his body fall alongside him. Fortunately he had not been fully cut in half, and the damage could be repaired, that is if he survives the fall. Obi-Wan after taking care of the threat rushes towards his master. Qui-Gon is unconscious, but because of the pain he lets out some ramblings in a delusional state of mind. 
Obi-Wan is obviously relieved that his master had not been killed, and that he had just been injured instead. Unfortunately his injury was to his main primary hand. The ship lands onto an open street of Naboo's capital of Thede. The delegation of resistance fighters, volunteer guards and policemen are lined up in wait of the ship. Padma along with the rest of the crew are facing the captured leader of the invasion, Viceroy Montgomery. Now Viceroy, you are going to have to go back to the Senate and explain all this. Padm says as the ship behind him opens up its entrance ramp. Panaka goes up to the two Nimwadians and continues with a line meant to release some of his anger. I think you can kiss your trade franchise goodbye. They are escorted onto the ship uncuffed. The rest of the group moves on to the side meeting with the visitors that had come to Naboo from out of the ship. Senator Palpatine along with his own guards come along and meets up his the now one-handed Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Anakin. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon bow, but Anakin uses his age to his advantage again does not bow towards Palpatine. We are indebted to your bravery Qui-Gon Jinn, and of course yours as well Obi-Wan Kenobi. Palpatine says then turns his head to the abnormally tall Anakin. And you young Skywalker, we will watch your career with great interest. My career. Even if I did not have foreknowledge from my previous life, I would still be off put by Palpatine. Palpatine moves past the two GD and Anakin over towards Pat with a brisk light step to his jaunt. Congratulations on your election Chancellor. The boldness to save their people your majesty, it is you who should be congratulated. Together we should bring peace and prosperity to the Republic. Palpatine says with a smiling face. After the battle has been done and over Qui-Gon along with Obi-Wan are now within another part of the Naboo Palace, talking to the holographic figure, Yoda. Confer on you, level of GD Knight, the council does. Yoda communicates to Obi-Wan as after the report had been given from Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. Both of their accounts taken in. Obi-Wan has been evaluated, and everyone within the GD High Council agreed to promote Obi-Wan solely based on his merits. GD Knight Qui-Gon Jinn, the council disagrees, your decision to take the boy as a Padawan learner. Yoda continues announcing the Anakin being allowed to join. If you wish to do so, I do not agree. Surely Master Yoda, you agree with my assessment that the boy is the chosen one. Qui-Gon insists his decision is the correct choice. The chosen one he may be. Nevertheless, grave danger I fear in his training. Yoda states his warning. Master Yoda, I will train Anakin. Without the approval of the council if I must. Qui-Gon states. GD Knight Qui-Gon, your defiance is not needed. There is another solution, if I may offer. Yoda is proposing another solution towards how they would deal with Anakin. Agree with you, the council will. The new apprentice, Skywalker will be, but on one condition. Condition. What may that be? Qui-Gon asks. The council and I sense greater potential, young Skywalker has, but Skywalker is too old, and has emotions that could lead to the dark side. Yoda explains. Temper we must, Skywalker's abilities. Natural gifts, he has and we think it would be prudent, that he be trained by more than one master. Yoda continues. Two masters. You mean to say Anakin will not only have me as his master, but also another? Qui-Gon questions. Unorthodox, I admit, but the council will not change this decision. Yoda says in response. Obi-Wan decides to ask the question on on both his own and his master's mind. Master Yoda, who does the council suggest to co-teach the boy? Humming to himself, Yoda answers the question. Mace Windu will be the boy's master as well. The reasoning behind this decision was because of characteristics that Anakin had shown. Windu would be the perfect master to pass down his form of lightsaber combat, which focuses in on the dark side, and uses it to empower the user. Of course, a great amount of control is needed. The GD knows at least a little bit about Anakin's mental capabilities, allowing him greater control of his emotions, which is something the GD liked. Even more so would he be suited for Windu. Qui-Gon would still teach Anakin and have him as his student as well just now he had to teach him other things. Another reason to make Anakin have two masters is to try and guide Anakin to become more ingrained into their order. Windu would be a good choice, so the council had decided an exception could be made in this instance. No mass funeral to mourn the dead had taken place as practically no one had died. The invasion had so little losses that the Republic was stirring at the wake of the incident. Anakin was standing next to Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon had gotten a replacement hand, a mechanical one not too unlike the one the original Anakin and Luke Skywalker had to get when these two lost their hands. Thankfully the prosthetics of the ear they are in are capable enough in giving people replacement limbs. It may not be as great as the original, but it was better than nothing. Qui-Gon would need some training of his own to get used to his new hand. Anakin decides to question Qui-Gon about what would happen to him if the Jedi had made their decision. So, what happens next? Specifically for me, am I allowed to join the Order? Obi-Wan speaks instead of Qui-Gon. Well, since I have been promoted myself, Qui-Gon can now take on a new apprentice of his own. Obi-Wan seems quite proud of his achievement. Yes, Obi-Wan is correct, you will now become my new apprentice. It is just you will have to have more than just myself as your master. Qui-Gon continues. Anakin says confused. More than just you. Anakin thinks at the same time. Is this how the GD work? I didn't know a Padawan could have multiple masters. I know there are multiple teachers and all that, but multiple masters. Yes, GD Master Mace Windu will also take on your training as his apprentice as well. Qui-Gon says. The Jedi had no reason to come to Naboo, as Qui-Gon had not died, and they were having a discussion back on Coruscant over the mysterious warrior Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan had encountered. There is no doubt the mysterious warrior was a Sith. Windu speaks to Yoda. Yoda hums in agreement. Always two there are, no more, no less. Yoda takes a breath and then continues. A master and an apprentice. But which was destroyed. 
the master of the apprentice. When do further questions? Dathomir. Grievous had finally gotten his first real mission. The expansion of the droid army would happen as he had reached through communication that his new leader had acquired a somewhat new but damaged droid control ship. Great for him as it would allow him greater control over the droids himself, to coordinate any plans of attacks or invasion, any defensive measures to be taken. Grievous was also aware of the allies his leader had here on Dathomir, known as the Night Sisters, and they were especially annoying, at least to him. Pestering him every now and then, no doubt trying to get a rise out of him so they could benefit if he were to do anything negative against them. His leader would not like that as he considers them important at least for now. He could tell that Anakin was also getting fed up with the constant indirect methods in which they would antagonize him, so he would make a mistake. When questioned why they do this, Anakin answered. The Dark Sisters here are heavily influenced by their culture and religion that has been built up over the course of time. This culture relies heavily on the dark side of the Force, which in on itself is not evil in nature. Anakin continued. But it can influence them subconsciously, making them do things that act in accordance to their emotions. Make them more manipulative, more driven to fulfill their goals, and to combine that with the dark side of the Force with their culture, has made them be like that. Grievous upon learning more about the Force and the powers one could wield was interested if he too could do so. Anakin also answered it was a possibility that he was working on. Maybe he would gain their powers, but it wouldn't be to the same scale. Grievous believed his claims because of the evidence of his experiments with these living droids, capable of using the very same powers, albeit limited in capacity, that Anakin and the Dark Sisters used. Grievous thought, if they could do it, why can't I? So that became one of his goals, to grow in strength as he had also wanted to strike back at the Republic for stopping him in his tracks. Anakin had said the Republic was dying on its own, and it would be of no use fighting against them, but that did not mean Grievous would be out of action. Far from it. With the new droid control ship coming into their hands, they would be able to finally fully control Dathomir, no doubt in a co-rulership with the Dark Sisters just as promised. They would fully become their planet with basically no resistance. That would be able to cut off any and all communication, have the military might to fully control and have a native natural people to this planet speak in favor of their occupation. Dathomir would become Anakin's new base of operations for his developing army, and Grievous would make sure his tasks and goals are completed. Coruscant. A lot had happened to the GD as the invasion of Naboo continued, and after it had finished. Two key factors in particular were of the most importance. The incoming entrance of the supposed chosen one from a prophecy only told to the Jedi, Anakin Skywalker joining their order and one of the well-respected of the Jedi had left. Disappeared this Jedi had. Deku who had left the Jedi order disappeared, nowhere to be found. Born into a noble family on the planet Sereno, he was the heir to vast wealth and the noble title of Count. Deku was taken by the Jedi order as a child, an apprentice to Thame Cerulean. As a Jedi Knight, he took Kwai Ganjin as his Padawan, and later trained Kamari Vosa. Deku was a respected instructor in the Jedi Temple, and one of the most renowned swordsmen in the galaxy, surpassed only by Grand Master Yoda, and equal to Master Mace Windu. Deku had been steadfast in his loyalty to the Order for the entirety of his long-lived life. He was 70 years of age after all, and had spent nearly 70 years as a Jedi, but a disastrous battle on Galadrin shook his faith in the Order and the Galactic Republic. He fell under the influence of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine of Naboo, and left the Jedi Order. After learning that Palpatine was secretly the Sith Lord Darth Sidious, Deku turned to the dark side, and became the Dark Lord of the Sith himself, replacing Darth Maul as Sidious' second apprentice. His new master bestowed upon him the Sith title of Darth Tyrannus. Only having recently left, Deku had gone into consideration about his future, and what he would do now he had joined Sidious. By claiming his birthright as Count of Sereno and his vast fortune, Deku would conspire with Sidious to force the galaxy into a war that would bring the Sith to power. Even though I knew that the Senate was corrupt, the Council was fallible, and GD training methods far from perfect, I remained with the GD order for 12 years after Galadrin. Deku had once said. Why? Because I still believed that I could accomplish some good as a GD. I thought I could bring about some positive changes, right certain wrongs, and do better than maintain the status quo. In short, I was another fool. People had noticed within the order that Deku had been more withdrawn after the incident on Galadrin and the battle on Baltasar. He refused to accept any more missions from the Jedi Council, and became concerned about prophecies he felt were coming true about dark times unfolding across the galaxy. While he discussed his concerns with many of the Order's most prominent Jedi Masters. Deku's growing disenchantment with the Jedi Way was sensed by Senator Palpatine, who had been watching Deku for some time, and had plans that required someone with Deku's reputation, skills, and financial resources. Palpatine, even before the Battle of Naboo that had recently come to an end, had held several meetings with Deku to feel out his opinions and cultivate him as an ally. Deku's behavior and beliefs as a Jedi had previously been within the scope of Jedi orthodoxy. However, Deku flirted with the belief that the dark side of the Force could be called upon without personal corruption, as his discontent with the Jedi order grew. Deku had a close relationship with his own master, Master Yoda, along with his Padawans, and had heard of what Qui-Gon had suggested. The Sith were back. He had condemned the Republic Senate publicly, but not to the extent that it was so widely known, because his Padawan learner he had ages ago had lost a hand. This upset him, but at least Qui-Gon Jinn was alive. Shortly thereafter, Deku resigned from the Jedi Order, retired to Sereno, and claimed his family title of Count, left vacant by the death of his brother, while his nephew, Adan, and his sister-in-law went into self-exile on Alderaan. 
He neither gave a reason for his decision to leave the GD in his public announcement, nor did he provide one when summoned before the GD Council to explain his actions. Why would he? He has seen the corruption, and there was nothing stopping its spread. Nothing he could do as his words fell on deaf ears and no eyes to see as the GD was blinded. Because abrupt departure surprised and disturbed the GD order. As a GD master who had voluntarily resigned his commission, Deku became part of the group later known as the Lost Twenty. In over 2000 years, only 19 other GD masters had walked away from the order, and among those Deku was considered the most bitter loss. The GD commissioned a bronze bust of Deku as it was created to join the other sculptures of the Lost Twenty in the GD archives. Coruscant. Supreme Chancellor. Palpatine had been extremely happy, gleeful in fact that he had finally gotten one step closer to achieving his goals. Manipulating those fools in the Senate was easy. So very easy, and the Queen, the Queen was oh so easy to manipulate as well. Sidious stews in his thoughts. Padme had been directed carefully by Sidious so he could become the Supreme Chancellor. He had orchestrated the Naboo blockade, but what he did not expect was for the Queen to be so bold. To be so against what he wanted, even if he has what he needed. He had spent the last six months cultivating the Queen's trust, knowing she would heed him better than Ars Veruna would have. It was all for this moment, when, in a crisis, she had no other choice than to rely on him. Quite insidious just as his Sith name would imply. He had also come across a new apprentice to make up for the one he had unfortunately lost. How very sad he was to lose someone so close to him. Not. Mole was a good apprentice for the time, but was lacking in what I wanted. What I needed and his usefulness came to an end. His new apprentice, Darth Tyrannus, is quite a powerful force user. He basically has little to do and train him with, he has all the basics already. What Sidious would need to do however is further corrupt his mind, as he remembers a conversation he had with the Count. I declined to be a member of the Council in order to devote myself to diplomacy, and look how that has turned out. The Republic is sliding deeper into chaos. Darth Tyrannus had told him. You one man against a galaxy full of scoundrels. Sidious had replied with honeyed words. One man should be able to make a difference if he is powerful enough. Then Tyrannus said something that had piqued his interest, and Sidious had used to his full advantage to slowly turn Deku away from the GD. It is unfortunate that he could already see some signs that Deku is not an appropriate student for him. In fact it was not himself that had discovered the potential in Darth Tyrannus, it was his very own previous master, Darth Plagueis. Sidious's master had once rambled on and on about his own failures, due to the meddling of Darth Tyrannus. Plagueis envisioned and had wanted to create inter-system descent to the expansion region. Though Plagueis had no plans to replace Palpatine as his apprentice, Palpatine's reckless assassination of Senator Vider Kim had brought to Plagueis' attention the possibility of Palpatine getting himself killed or exposed. As such, he viewed Deku as a potential apprentice, should Palpatine succumb to such a fate. This trait was something Sidious took on himself and further expanded upon it, by leaving behind his former apprentice Maul to the metaphorical wolves. Both Plagueis and Sidious have also toyed with the idea of indirectly turning Deku to the dark side, and using him to create a schism within the Jedi Order. However, when Plagueis introduced him to Sidious, it was that relationship that would eventually become pivotal to the progression of the Sith's grand plan. Shortly after the victory of the Naboo and Gungans from the Trade Federation's invasion, Palpatine took GD Master Deku to a diner in the works to discuss personal business over a meal. The two of them had been introduced by Ron Harkin, shortly after Palpatine had become a senator, and had formed a friendship based on Deku's admiration of Palpatine's policies. To Deku, it appeared as though Palpatine championed the underrepresented and underprivileged peoples of the Outer Rim, and in fact believed that Palpatine was largely responsible for the Outer Rim worlds, receiving any representation in the Senate at all. Having previously agreed with Palpatine that the Republic had to be torn down before the galaxy could be saved, and immediately recognizing the political capital that the Naboo Crisis had provided Palpatine, Deku voiced his suspicion that Palpatine had been complicit in the invasion of his own homeworld. Deku expressed his approval of Palpatine taking full political advantage of the situation, regardless of how it had come to be. When the topic of Deku's impending resignation from the Jedi Order was broached by Palpatine, Deku told his friend that he was now more resolved to leave than ever, but not for the reasons that Palpatine suspected. His interest had been raised however, as he had come to discover a rather unique boy, Anakin Skywalker. For, though he had taken little issue with the Jedi Council's decision to interfere in the Naboo Crisis, he informed Palpatine that a young boy, Anakin Skywalker, had been brought by Qui-Gon from Tatooine, and was suspected of being the prophecy Jedi Chosen One. Palpatine was completely shocked at this revelation, he had personally encountered the boy in Amidala's retinue, and had even given him a spare bedroom to sleep in during Amidala's stay at his senatorial suite. Yet despite Anakin's one-of-a-kind potential in the Force, Palpatine had sensed nothing. While Palpatine's interest in Anakin was fairly academic for the time being, Plagueis nearly panicked when Palpatine informed him of Anakin's existence. Years before, Plagueis had attempted to coerce the Force via midi-chlorians to spontaneously create life, and he had ultimately failed to do so. More than that, however, Plagueis believed that not only had he failed, but that his actions had caused the Force to react in such a way as to counter the Sith's tampering with it. If the boy, who had been born at around the same time as Plagueis' failed experiment, was indeed the chosen one, he could be the embodiment of the Force's opposition to the Sith. As such, while Palpatine did not particularly care that Anakin had come to the attention of the Jedi, Plagueis was adamantly opposed to the Jedi training him. He immediately ordered Palpatine to instruct Maul that killing Qui-Gon Jinn was now of paramount importance, as Jinn was essentially acting as Anakin's sponsor within the Jedi Order. 
Without Jin backing the boy, Plague Ace hoped the GD Council would simply send him back to Tatooine. Unfortunately this did not come to pass, and would not have succeeded originally as well. Another thing to take of note was the death of his master. Sidious had been planning for a long time now already that Plague Ace had to die, one way or another for him to truly take the reins as the one and only true Sith Lord. The night before the election, Damisk made his first public appearance in years, attending the premiere of an experimental Mon Calamari piece at the Galaxy's Opera House with Palpatine. After the performance and late dinner at the Manorai, the two Sith Lords retired to Damisk's penthouse in the Kaldani Spires building, to celebrate Palpatine's imminent triumph. There, Palpatine plied Plague Ace with wine while rehearsing his Chancery acceptance speech, slated to be delivered the following day before the Senate. Plague Ace soon fell into an alcohol-induced sleep, and Palpatine saw his chance. With his master's guard completely down, Palpatine blasted Plague Ace's transpirator mask with force lightning, shoring it out and waking him, being inebriated and half asleep, however, the Mewing could do nothing to stop his apprentice. Palpatine took this opportunity to thoroughly deride, mock, and otherwise disparage Plague Ace, telling him that for the whole of their relationship the apprentice had ever manipulated the master, playing him like a pawn. And throughout the relentless derision, Sidious sent forth additional blasts of lightning, causing the Mew an immense pain as he slowly suffocated. Adding insult to injury, Sidious lambasted Plague Ace for his role in Palpatine's own warped conversion, hatefully accusing him of manipulating a confused boy into murdering his family. Strangely, but perhaps merely reflecting that early psycho-emotional conflict and trauma, Palpatine then expressed to the senior Sith, his genuine gratitude for the teachings that Plague Ace had, over the years of their association, passed on to him. At the moment that the stricken Yuin finally succumbed to death, Sidious having only just proclaimed himself the embodiment of the long-prophesied Sithari, felt a monumental shift in the Force, which he interpreted as the dark side anointing him as the tool it would use to take over the universe. The exultant Sith Lord, however, then felt another tremor. A vague awareness of a power greater than himself that was shading his sense of triumph. He suspected that it was perhaps Plague Ace reaching out from death to Vexen, or simply the aftershocks of his own rise. Sidious reasoned that neither was the case, though he would not discover what exactly the foreboding feeling was until later. Although I had accomplished a lot, there is still a lot to go before I can truly succeed in all my endeavors. Coruscant. The code of the GD, and respectively by extension a part of every member was passed on throughout the entirety of their existence. There is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no chaos, there is harmony. There is no death, there is a force. With the code usually practiced by the younglings trained by the GD. Emotion, yet peace. Ignorance, yet knowledge. Passion, yet serenity. Chaos, yet harmony. Death, yet the Force. Strangely enough this code above is a much better alternative version of the GD's code, but the one mainly used is not this one. This code was usually recited by GD younglings during their initiate trials. It is quite unfortunate that it is not used more often, as I consider it a much more complete version of the GD code, or at least it is better than the one currently used. Anakin thinks as he is being transported back to Coruscant along with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon had requested a transport back to Coruscant to Padden, as they were ready to leave, with everything that had been accomplished, it was time for Anakin's training to begin. Anakin, as you know, you are to have two masters to teach you instead of one. Considering this a plan was devised so as to make sure you have time to train under each of us, myself and then Master Windu. Qui-Gon says walking towards Anakin who is currently within his own thoughts. Yes master. Are you to tell me my training schedule, or has it not been decided yet? Anakin said in a questioning tone. Anakin had to change his way of addressing Qui-Gon, as he did accept him as his new master. He would be, hopefully learning a lot from Qui-Gon as he was trained by the infamous duelist expert Dooku, who was in turn trained by Yoda. Qui-Gon replies. The details are still yet to be worked out between myself and Master Windu, but I am sure we can come to a swift conclusion. Is your hand alright? Do you like your replacement? Anakin gestures towards Qui-Gon's now mechanical hand. Well yes. Before I forget, I would like to thank you for your ability to make me a new hand. It feels quite good where I have no discomfort at all. Qui-Gon says while smiling. I am glad to be of help. Anakin then thinks. I did this as a sorry for not being able to fully save you from the encounter with Mo, but hey. It must be better than nothing at all. I did especially craft that new hand for you. I see you are quite skilled in the areas concerning technology, in fact all I have seen from you were your various talents in many areas. I wonder what else you could tell me about your abilities. Qui-Gon questions trying to see what else Anakin is capable of. Well, for the longest time I could sense I have some innate connection to the mind, my mind in particular. I have great control over my memories, my thoughts and emotions. I can also sense the emotions and thoughts of others quite easily as well. It has been quite useful to me. Anakin continues. Yes, yes. I have been informed of this rather special ability you have been born with. Those who are force sensitive have some type of talent in regards to the force and other things. Qui-Gon explains. Yours could very well be force abilities related to the mind. Qui-Gon states. It is not just my mind, I also have great control of and understanding of technology. As I am sure you have noticed. Anakin leaves out. I also have a special talent related to anything to the body, particularly reinforced by the dark magics working on me, but I don't think I want to inform anyone of this. At least for now. Yes, your affinity for technology is certainly interesting, but I am unsure as to what force abilities there are to that. Qui-Gon continues. 
Enough of that, I think you will need to come to terms with and focus on the basics of your training. First, I think I will start with a lesson in history, and the basics of the GD way. The training of students of the GD order changed and evolved over its many millennia of existence. Throughout its history though, the idea of a master and an apprentice was consistent, though at times more than one apprentice could be taken by a single master. Training was harsh and difficult, consisting of nearly two decades of tutelage before an apprentice became a full-fledged knight. That is why Anakin's case was pretty unique as a student usually would have no more than one master, but the current GD had to take into account the potential of Anakin and future of him, even if they don't all fully believe to be the chosen one. At least not yet as they have yet to know the full capabilities and talents of the boy, other than the preliminary test done when he was on Coruscant. Following the end's supposed extinction of the Sith and the passage of the Rusin Reformation, the GD Order completely reformed its academy under the leadership of Grand Master Fay Coven and the Council of First Knowledge. Closing many of the ancient praxioms of the early order in favor of a more centralized academy on Coruscant, those that remained open were overseen by a council of masters, as opposed to a single administrator. The formation of the acquisition division was a necessity with the newly implemented age restriction. All initiates in the order were restricted to infants and very young children. In order to help, the Galactic Republic passed a law requiring all member worlds to check for force sensitivity, upon delivering each child. The council also took the time to codify a formal battery of five tests of knighthood, in addition to restricting apprenticeship to one master and one apprentice. As the academy flourished, so did the order. Initiates were placed in clans and learned together for over a decade, along the strict, structured regimen of academics and combat. The GD Academy on Coruscant structured an initiate's day, and the lessons progressed in difficulty as a student moved through the academy system. Lessons were taught by GD masters and unranked GD from the education core, and designed to give the initiates the skills they would need in the field. What Qui Gon was going to teach Anakin at least what he could officially teach him now that he could not back on Naboo, was the basics of the basics when it comes to their training. He is an intelligent boy, in fact he may very well be a genius, so it shouldn't be too hard for him to advance quickly. Qui Gon thought. The GD order and by extension the GD take on very strict vows, Anakin. These vows are mantras and chants of words the GD live by, of course I disagree a lot of the time with how it is done, but that is just the way things are. GD and the code, their need and desire were reinforced through indoctrination to follow the code is partially why they had become complacent in their seats of power. Even if there are lessons to be learned, their inability to evolve for the better cripples them and cripples those around them. At the forefront being the Galactic Republic that had become corrupt, but many who are in the know would say it was the fault of the GD. No, the GD only enabled those with less than clean backgrounds to prosper. In on itself the Republic was failing, but that didn't mean some intervention could have saved it. For some in-depth analysis on the GD code and the way they follow it, Anakin had come up with why they follow it and how. When it came to the dark side, or more specifically anything to do with negative emotions, which were completely natural to most living sentient creatures above a certain sapience level would have, the GD would shun it. GD were taught to accept the inherent dark side within themselves and conquer it, and not let it conquer them. Fear of loss, anger, hate, jealousy, greed, and aggression, all of the dark side had to be stripped from its influence over a GD through patience and training. Even when it came to emotions such as love it was enforced that no such feelings be present. While the GD code forbade possession and attachments, the GD were encouraged and trained to love in terms of compassion. Attachment was the inability to accept change as the fundamental characteristic of life, to accept death as the natural part of life, the inability to let go. Feeding into fear of loss and greed, leading to jealousy, attachment was selfish, a shadow of greed, and thus a path of the dark side of the force. Therefore, attachment was forbidden for a GD, who had to train themselves to let go of everything they were afraid to lose, to renounce all attachments. Thus, they could be compassionate and loving and caring, but not be possessive and grabbing and holding on to things, trying to keep them frozen in time, accepting the transitional nature of life. This allowed them to love the totality of life unconditionally without selectively choosing individual life forms to become selfishly attached to. At one point Qui-Gon had been told something ridiculous, which he held back from telling Anakin, but Qui-Gon projected his thoughts as such from that memory, that Anakin could perceive it clear as day. Falling in love, that's what the GD code forbids. Getting laid. Not so much. Not if it's casual, like me and Selby. Rail of Aris defends casual sexual relationships to Koi Ganjin. And it is true that the GD do not like romantic relationships of any kind, strictly forbidding it. What most GD seem to not understand is that sexual relations are not forbidden, as long as romantic feelings do not develop. Members of the GD order considered each other their family, and sometimes were truly related by blood. GD masters developed strong, trusting and loving bonds with their apprentices whom there is, being like a parent to them. However, they were not supposed to form attachment for the greater good, they had to be able to let go of them, to not to lose a thousand lives just to save one. A GD considered romantic feelings natural, and as such, they did not prohibit them, but for a GD knight, it was essential to make the right choice for the order, and not neglect their GD duties in the favor of their beloved. Even if that would mean the end of the relationship GD knight Trail of Aris, believed that the GD code permitted casual sexual relationships, as long as the GD did not form attachments. Averis had such a relationship with Selby, an innkeeper on Pigil, when he served as Lord Regent of that planet. The GD were encouraged to rely on their instincts over their mind, which is truly weird considering a lot of the being's instincts are tied to a lot of emotions. 
an example being fear, where fear can help a person decide and react to something that is dangerous, hazardous or can cause harm. Evolutionary reasons are behind things like this. They held their emotions valuable, but were also warned to be mindful of them, for they could cloud their judgment. A genie had to maintain a serene quiet mind, in order to stand on the light side instead of the dark, thus they were able to keep the force within them in balance. The genie knew that the universe is far from static, and the way of the force is that all living eventually must die. They had a strong faith in the force and found comfort in knowing that upon dying, they, just like all things that ever lived, will be transformed into the cosmic force, the wellspring from which the living force emanated, becoming one with it. Therefore, they saw death as the natural part of life, despite they were saddened by it, they were advised to remember, one day they will all pass on, and rejoice and celebrate those around them who passed away and become one with the force, instead of grieving and missing them. The fear of losing the living to inevitable death was attachment, the shadow of greed. Well it is certainly true, Anakin couldn't help but also disagree with this statement when clearly there are beings that are already immortal, such they do not die due to the passage of time. An example of this would be the special force wield race. Another example of immortality is the Genie Force technique that allows for the ghost or spirit of a force sensitive that had died to live on without a body. Truly there are many instances of things like this, but it is true that sometimes you cannot save everyone. Sometimes it is what it is. Night Cycle, Coruscant. Having just arrived as the giant city spanning across the planet slumbers or at least tries to sleep as there are still multiple vehicles and sounds produced throughout, the ship transporting Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Anakin arrives. Coruscant sure is mesmerizing to look at sometimes don't you think? Anakin says out loud. It is a sight to see for sure, but instead of looking around we should head for the Jedi Temple. There you will get your very own quarters to live and sleep in, and the next day someone will escort you to the area you need to go. Qui-Gon tells Anakin. Okay. Anakin responds with a short reply. They had to take a transport vehicle to take them towards the GD temple. As the three of them enter said vehicle Obi-Wan speaks towards the driver. Take us to the GD temple. The driver responds. Righto. Driving through the high-rise buildings and the air lane traffic that is congested, they take their time getting back to the temple tired mentally from the long journey and the events that had happened through the past few days. Obi-Wan decides to question Anakin about a few things. Anakin, I heard that you quite the good empath and telepathic person. From what I know that is true. Tell me how you do it, I would like to learn how you hide yourself within the force. It is quite powerful and would be useful, no doubt in any future mission I partake in. It is not something that can be instantly recreated from my understanding. It would take a lot of time and patience with a high degree of talent and psychic abilities related to the mind. Anakin replies as Qui-Gon just listens to the conversation between the two with mild interest. Is that right? I guess that is too bad. Obi-Wan finishes because despite his patient nature he is not that talented with psychic abilities. His talents lay within dueling, and even then he still has much to learn. The Jedi basically do what I do already anyway, from what I have been recently informed on by Master Qui-Gon, was that the Jedi meditate a lot, and this is not too much different from my methods. Anakin continues. It is just the way my powers have progressed are different from what would be considered normal. That is fine. I was just curious as to your abilities and if there was a way to replicate its effects. We are nearly there. Qui-Gon speaks up after Obi-Wan finishes. Looking out towards the Jedi Temple, Anakin can say that the Grandeur will probably not be lost to him. I know I would probably not be able to reform the Jedi in any capacity really, but that doesn't mean they should be left to die. Well, at least the children should live the massacre. In fact I could probably stop Sidious's plan for the clones. What's more is that I could bring over the clones to my side, and have them respect me just as they did the original. I wouldn't mind a few extra comrades. The transport vehicle stops at the dock, the two Jedi Knights and one Padawan exit the vehicle. Where is my pay? The driver asks a little brashly. Qui-Gon gives the man some credits before he zooms away leaving the Jedi behind. Right this way then. Qui-Gon directs as Anakin and Obi-Wan follow along. Walking towards the Jedi Order's entrance Anakin starts to mentally communicate with HK-47. HK did you do what I requested of you? Yes master, I have successfully transported the deactivated droids left on Naboo. HK responds immediately. Good, very good. You have done well, you can go back to your primary directive and await for further instructions. Yes master. HK responds as Anakin cuts off the connection. What were the Naboo going to do with all those droids except recycle them all into scrap and maybe sell them off? Which they did sell the droids, but instead of making a huge scale sale to some corporation publicly, Anakin had convinced Patton to give him the droids. Specifically he had said his mother, Shmaya would pay for the droids through an official request. This would allow Patton to make some economic recovery to help aid the rebuilding efforts, and would help Anakin further increase his droid army. It makes it all the easier that the droid army left on Naboo is directly connected to the control ship he has stolen. Something interesting had also happened with the droids, specifically the droids on Dathomir he has stashed. The lead droids he had created had started to worship him in a weird way, proclaiming him as their god and creator. Which technically he is, but they had started developing their own culture truly turning them into a society ready to emerge. Anakin's not complaining as he saw no problems with this, the lead droids he created, at least to him were now full living beings, and it seems they have appreciated his efforts to help them develop on their own. To have their own freedoms and liberties. Fortunately they do not see Anakin in a negative light, considering he controls them, and the unliving droids, but in fact encourage what they had started to call being blessed. 
He has seen this himself, and reports were coming in from his new minion, Grievous. Right, Obi-Wan you can go. I have to take Anakin here to his new accommodation. Yes, master. You do not need to refer to me that way anymore Obi-Wan, you have rightfully earned yourself the title of GD Knight. Qui-Gon says proudly. Thank you, but I do not think I will ever see you as anything less. Right, go on then. Qui-Gon exasperatedly replies. Okay, I will be heading off now, and Anakin why don't you come see me sometime. I am sure I could also help you in your studies if you would like, maybe explain a few things. Obi-Wan starts to walk off in the direction of his own accommodation with a hop in his step. I would like that, thank you. Anakin politely replies. After Obi-Wan leaves the two Qui-Gon directs Anakin. Come on, this way then. After a brisk walk over to the room assigned to Anakin Qui-Gon speaks. Here you are then. For now this is your room here at the GD temple. Thank you master. Smiling, Qui-Gon replies. You should get some rest now, you have had a long past few days, and your troubles will not stop there. You still have much to learn. Okay, I will head in now. Goodbye. Anakin enters his new housing for the foreseeable future, as Qui-Gon heads off to his own room, no doubt wanting to catch up on some much needed sleep. This is quite Spartan, but what did I expect from the GD? At least I can decorate this place however I want. The walls, ceiling and floor were a standard white color. There were no decorations and very limited space, but enough for a bed, various drawers a closet and some leftover room for himself. I think I will head to bed for now. I think it is about time I have some normal dreams for now. Anakin hops on the Spartan-like bed and falls asleep, not bothering to enter a meditative state seeking some normal sleep. Day cycle, Coruscant. Opening his eyes, Anakin gets up off of the bed. I feel pretty well rested. I guess it is time I make my debut. Looking towards his own internal clock he would say it is about early sunrise. The reason Anakin needs less sleep than the average human was his telepathic abilities reinforcing his mind, and in fact he could completely go without sleep if he just meditates 2 hours every day. Deciding that waiting around was quite boring, he decides to connect with HK through the mental link he has and starts to get a report of the daily building slave uprising on Tatooine. The slaves turned workers that remain on the planet were those most invested in the free the slaves movement. It was quite underground, at least for now, but they knew someone was sponsoring them. I can't possibly buy every slave as there are some very disturbed individuals and would not release them. Not all slavers were kind or generous enough to bargain away their slaves, and not all of the slaves that were owned by the same person were for sale, so they needed some other way out of their situation. One such situation had occurred when he was younger that had to do with a special race of a human-like species known as goslings. In fact he had rescued a young princess, the very same young princess of that gosling species, along with other captives. It was easy enough, and thankfully he had built up enough resources and power to safely secure the children, otherwise it would have been harder to help them out. He would still do it of course, but with much more caution. Anyway, I think I had gained an admirer. I believe it was the very same princess I had indirectly rescued, and from what I knew I had decided to capitalize on this hero worship. Getting another ally is all the more good for me, but I doubt her childish affection still holds after all these years. Maybe the feelings of gratitude but puppy love won't be there to blind her. Meditating some more, Anakin reflected on his progress with the mental arts he had developed, or more like redeveloped for the Force. The levels indicated by him were a very vague standard, and was not a perfect classification of the developed powers he would gain and continuously grow in strength. The mind arts were a very hard thing to practice, and after his initial momentum, it had slowed down quite a bit. His mastery through his mind had thankfully gone as far to the master grade, but his mental intrusion force technique had stagnated, simply because he felt it wrong to just willy-nilly invade a person's mind with a technique that could make them brain dead. It was a dangerous technique he had developed and could be deployed in combative situations to put others into a sort of trance. An illusioner can straight up rip the mind of another apart, so he was not without a means to protect himself. His mental capacity had expanded to allow him parallels thoughts where there are technically two of him that is active at the same time. His mind has been accelerated beyond belief just through telepathy alone, not including the benefits of the ritual. And even though the passive emotion sensing ability is rather annoying with him having limited control over his emotion sensing capabilities, it could overwhelm him if he is not careful. At least it was how it was at the start. Now he would be safe from the emotions given off by anyone really. Mikudaru had come a long way as well, what with the massive amount of droids, ships and other technologies he has connected himself to, he is certainly in a good position with it. Other branches he has started developing to this technique was what he referred to as a virus. Instead of having to be near something to take it over, he would implant a virus based off of his force signature, capture and reprogram a device or computer-based systems. This essentially allows him to bypass a lot of systems put in place to protect against attacks of this nature, except his was through the force, and normal technology has no chance of resisting his control. If another person through the force has control of a droid he would be unable to control it unless he is stronger, has time and the necessary skill, or the original user is killed or disconnects from said thing. That about settles everything, but this is only the beginning. Well, technically I began nearly as soon as I was born, but that is besides the point. I can now finally expand my knowledge of the force and learn properly. I have grand plans, and don't plan to stop with just the force itself. There is a glaring flaw with most force sensitives, and that is despite being pretty overpowered compared to the average being, their bodies lack great strength and endurance. 
this is something I will have to change, at least for myself, and this would require some force abilities that I would need to experiment with, or I will have to look into advanced technologies. An example being something like nanites introduced into my system reinforcing, healing and making my body stronger. For something like this, it would probably not take too long to develop, because I do have something similar in the works. As Anakin is still meditating, going over his progress a knock at the door could be heard disrupting his thought process. Oh well, I guess it is time to get busy again. Day cycle, Coruscant. As Anakin is still meditating, going over his progress a knock at the door could be heard disrupting his thought process. Oh well, I guess it is time to get busy again. Anakin stops his meditation and approaches the door while thinking at the same time. From what I sense the person behind the door is not quite gone, and I have become quite familiar with his force signature. Opening the door Anakin sees who has come to see him. Young Padawan Skywalker. I have come to explain to you your schedule throughout your training. The person who spoke was Mace Windu, Anakin's other new master. Master Windu, you have come to be my guide. Yes, that is true. I will introduce to you the areas that matter when you stay here. Usually, a person would have a clan they would join here, but due to your special circumstances, you would just be joining in classes suitable to both my own and Qui-Gon's time schedule. Mace starts to walk and Anakin follows from behind. First I will be showing you the area where communal meals are held. This is where you will be able to have some sustenance. I am quite hungry. Anakin says while thinking. It is good I don't have to worry about food and can while eating with everyone, try to gain some connections. Yes, you will be seated within a hall with all the other younglings. They both continue before stopping at an entrance that is the communal eating area. Right for now I will stop my guiding here, as you should eat before we continue. You will wait here after the time to eat is finished and I will come back. Okay, master. Thank you. Anakin bows slightly. While Mace leaves Anakin enters the hall where he can see many people, many children sitting in groups, but because it is very early in the morning there are not many students. Right time to get some food. From what I see there are not that many, what I would consider important people, so there is no point in staying here too long. Hey, you. Someone calls out to Anakin, a small female child that looks around his actual age. Is this fair Sophie? The friend of Ahsoka, or at least would be friend. It seems that the age of the current one is of the Legends version, as in the Clone Wars she was the age to fit in more with the show. Yes hello. Anakin greets the girl. You must be new around here, did you perhaps only recently join the Order? I did not think that was allowed. Usually only people way younger than you are allowed to join. That is right. I am new here, I have only recently become part of the Order. That's cool and a bit weird from the norm, but welcome. Force studies take place in the morning, students were taught the ways of the Force and its three applications. Control, Sense, and Alter. Midday studies focused on traditional classroom instruction, where non-GD instructors taught an assortment of lessons including political strategy, galactic law, the sciences, and language. The afternoons were dedicated to physical activities, including lightsaber training. Taught forms I through form by of lightsaber combat by highly qualified instructors, initiates practice with training lightsabers, until they crafted their own in the caves of Ion. Five mandatory mediation sessions were mixed into the day, as well as communal meals. At least this was the standard schedule given to me. Mace Windu had guided him around throughout the day, and introduced him to the classes he would be taking, who he would be participating in trainings with and some such nonsense. Most of what is on the list, or schedule for him was the standard list given to younglings, while more like younglings are guided in this direction, slowly getting used to their new style of life. Anakin has to do the same, but it is better this way as there is still some time left over for him to continue his own plans, so he is not completely at the will of this academic course. He also takes some days off to further advance and be trained by Qui-Gon or Mace. From what he understands, at least in terms of the first things he has to learn control, sense and alter, are the basic applications that a force sensitive can do. Control is internal. It is the genie's ability to recognize the force in himself, and to use it to his benefit. Qui-Gon has said to Anakin. The Jedi Order's teaching method began with the aspect of control, taught to Jedi initiates, as a way to open their minds to the force, and establish a base point for further development. The theme of control was centered on the ability to control one's own body, as self-control was the starting point for all Jedi teachings. Development of these skills would continue throughout a Jedi's life, as the basics of all other disciplines of force use began here. One of the most well-known side effects of mastering the discipline of control was prolonged life and the avoidance of decay. Three main abilities were centered around control. Tataminus, Kirado Salva, and Alta Soper. These three umbrella abilities incorporated many of the abilities GD used throughout their service to the Republic. Tataminus was an umbrella title used by the GD Order to classify force abilities related to energy absorption. Anakin had used a version of this to subdue Maul's attacks against Qui-Gon on Naboo, and he had also applied it for Maul as well, just so he could keep his body intact. Girado Salva was an umbrella skill used by the GD Order to classify force abilities related to self-healing and a lot of the time this ability is used passively or subconsciously, without a someone being aware that they are healing themselves at an accelerated rate. Anakin has a version of this in the form of the Dark Side Magic Ritual, and his own subconscious activation of said technique. There are not many GD who even know of how to use medic-based or healing-based force techniques, so this is an area Anakin would be most interested in. The last of the control domain is Alta Soper, the traditional term for the ability to increase a user's focus on the force. Sense involves the next step, in which the GD recognizes the force in the universe outside herself. 
classified as sensibilities by the Jedi Order. These techniques were taught to Padawans to broaden the scope of their control abilities. Dipping into a deeper understanding of the living force, sensibilities allowed force wielders to immerse themselves in the environment. By the end of their apprenticeship, Padawans were expected to use the force as an additional sense, constantly attuned to the undulation of the force. The Jedi Order saw the sensibilities divided into four main groups. Prima Vidi, Tactosodium, Tai Vordrak Psychometry, and Projected Telepathy. While there were many other styles to the sense family, these were considered the most vital to Jedi teachings. Anakin in particular would be extremely powerful in regards to the sense skill tree, and its abilities being considered as the most important, certainly puts Anakin at an advantage. Life Detection, also known in traditional high galactic as Prima Vidi, was a basic sense-based force power that allowed a force sensitive to feel the presence of living things or beings, and detect their positions at long range. Anakin's senses were primarily tuned and would only grow with the passage of time. He could slightly thank his telepathy for that. Sense Force, also known as Sea Force or in traditional high galactic as Tactosodium, was a sense-based force power. It allowed an individual to sense the ambient force in a given area. It could not be used to detect sentient beings, but allowed an individual to sense the magnitude of force in an area or object, and even if that force was aligned with the dark side of the force, or the light. This ability Anakin also has as he was able to tell the distinction between the dark side alignment of force energy on Tatooine and Dathomir. Even here on Korskin there is the presence of a lingering darkness that the absolute light of the Jedi hide. They do this unknowingly of course, but even still, if Anakin could sense it wouldn't that mean the Jedi should be able to as well. Psychometry, also known as postcognition, Tai Vordrax or Telemetry, was a force power that was a mental technique of picking up impressions, and traces of information about the objects touched, and the events that are surrounded. This ability even though sounds quite basic it could come in handy within a lot of circumstances, but Anakin did not bother to develop this when he was younger as there was no need. It would have been pointless to do so as there was nothing of particular interest that could be found. He doesn't even know where to begin when trying to practice such an ability. The last ability that Anakin has become most familiar with, Telepathy. The very basic ability to read and interact with other minds, mentally communicate and project the user's thoughts over smaller vast distances with other individuals. Alter is the third and most difficult area to master, for it involves the student's ability to modify the force and redistribute its energies. An advanced form of force use, many non-trained force sensitives stumbled upon this group of powers accidentally, usually resulting in disastrous events. Untamed, these force powers can cause mass chaos, as the art of manipulating other objects must be perfected and honed. Within the GD order, these abilities were considered to be alter abilities, and were taught to GD knights, who had mastered the art of control and sense. Capable of affecting the environment, these abilities were vital to a successful knight, as without them, individuals could see the force, but were incapable of manipulating it. In the order of the GD, the Grey Masters considered the techniques of telekinesis, affect mind, and alter environment to make up this family of abilities. So, the more cool telekinetic based abilities or the creation of shooting electricity through my fingertips, might be off the table for now. Anakin thought to himself. I could work on other abilities, but I have another project to take care of in my free time, so it would be prudent I finish that first. Anakin. A voice calls out, but Anakin is currently distracted. It would be cool though, being able to do these things so for now I will put of the development of alter based abilities, because there must be a reason I need to master both sense and control first. Anakin. Anakin continuously was inside this thoughts, clearly distracted not paying attention to his surroundings. Even though he has a lot of mental power, he currently has one of his thoughts processes meditating, whilst the other is now distracted. From what I remember there are a lot of abilities that would be considered alter, and from among them, I am only really interested in some that would make me more powerful. The art of the small comes to my mind, and if I am able to recreate this technique, I would be able to modify my physical self. Padawan Skywalker. Being woken up from his distracted state of mind, Anakin is reminded that he is actually currently within a lesson. The person who has spoken to him at this moment was his current teacher, a GD instructor from the education division. Well, I think I should start to try and increase the amount of thoughts I can have at the same time, or should have at least left some awareness for my surroundings. The person who had been saying his name was one of the GD younglings he had become acquainted with, Bears. He was put into a class that was of a similar age group as himself, while not being too hard to catch up in regards to teachings. At least that was what Mace had told him when he was put with a bunch of children, but he is not going to complain as he well knows there is a lot for him to learn. Now that I have everyone's attention, shall we continue with the lesson? The instructor glares a bit at Anakin. Deciding to stop meditation which he is doing at the same time, he gets his other though process to connect with HK-47. Hey HK, do you think you could go somewhere for me? Yes master, anything and anywhere. I am always available. Dathomir. It was fun at first, but now it has gotten boring. At least it was what Grievous thought as he had been engaging in minimal combat, as soon as they decided to take over the planet of Dathomir. Grievous did not have much to do after the small skirmishes that had taken place, and in fact he would not have even been able to do anything given the elite droids or even the massive amount of machines there are at Anakin's disposal. You can use as much as you want. It doesn't matter but from what I understand about the conditions of the planet, it would make a good starting point to help build my very own empire. Grievous had been told as such through a communication device. Please, tell me there is more for me to do. Why, of course. Grievous asks in a disbelieving tone. Really. 
I thought there was nothing to do for the next coming few years. A few things here and there, sure but nothing else. Did you forget one of your goals, your desires that you gained after joining up with me? Go. Cool. You wanted something, but I guess if you can't even remember that then you don't want it Anakin trailed off. Grievous getting a bit frustrated and impatient says. Well won't don't you tell me already. Calm down, no need to get your wires tangled. Anakin said to calm him down, then continued. You wanted to use the force, right? Grievous's eyes lit up with recognition. Yes. Do you know how to be able to make me force sensitive? You finally figured it out. Yes and no. I gave give you some pretty basic force sensitivity, but it would not be to the extent of most force sensitives, and would only go so far as the droid's capabilities. When can you give me these abilities? I will have to recreate your mechanical body parts with a new material. I have an idea to not only give you force powers, but while I am at it, upgrade your suit. Upgrade. Yes, I will remake you with a much better material I have synthesized myself, that allows for a greater amount non-organic midichlorians. This will increase your capabilities and make it easier for you to access the force. Another thing I will have to do is operate on what is left of your fleshy self, and implant a special device capable of making you and the metal I am remaking you out of fully compatible materials, with no room for errors to occur. This new body in operation will allow me to have the ability to use the force. As simple as that. As simple as that. Finally, finally what he had been looking for, a way to increase his power. Unlike the original Grievous, this one has not been taught lightsaber combat, so there would be no skills related to that. Anakin had decided to try and make sure he reclaims or gain those skills, but he himself had no proper instructor until he started in the GD, and even then he had been trying to learn other things as well, slowing down progress that would be made. Grievous and his desires are far from over though, as he wants to see the Republic crash and burn for the perceived wrongs they had done against him. Anakin had agreed that the Republic was being set up to fail, and his course was set with no one to help steer the ship to safety. So the Republic would burn, but Grievous had calmed down over the few years spent working for Anakin, and has learned to understand that not everyone is responsible for the Senate's failings. Don't worry, you just focus on what we want to accomplish here on Dathomir. Build it up to become capable of defending itself, the residents who live here and establishing my rule. What about the Night Sisters? Oh, right. I guess our core rule over the planet. The sisters know not to overstep their bounds as they had not had much to do with the takeover, and can now share the benefits. At least they helped in controlling the settlements. Grievous stands up for the sisters here as he had grown to respect their power. That is true, but I don't want them getting any ideas about trying to take over themselves, and that is why you have to be careful with them. Now that I will make you capable in using the force, it would be much easier dealing with them. I hope. Grievous says knowing their prowess has only grown with the time and resources Anakin supplies for them. Talzin had taken to slightly reforming her people to make them more tolerate of others, specifically more tolerant for others related to Anakin and Anakin himself. This was because of the huge favor he had done for her. Talzin had seen her son's near-death experience, and had known Anakin had somehow come in to save Maul from death, at least that is what she thinks. Grievous had also been involved in an event that included the Night Sisters and a GD called Quinlan Vos. Anakin had told him to get involved and make sure that the Night Sisters do not try and enslave the man. It would be disastrous to their cause. Three months into his retraining, Quinlan Vos was sent to Dathomir to investigate the local witches, following reports that they had something to do with the planet Ova mysteriously vanishing. Anakin had further supplied the Night Sisters, as but there were always people who were against change, so Grievous was meant to be Anakin's eyes and ears in this situation, even though all of the droids given to the sisters were also controlled by Anakin, he still wanted a living being to keep him informed. Grievous had told his master that they would bring him trouble. Whatever the issue is, they had avoided the GD with some expertise and well-timed interactions. Grievous had made sure to shield the GD from any potential harm, given the sisters' disdain for them. Quinlan Vos had been sent on his way after his timely rescue with him none the wiser of his potential encounter. Grievous had been given some words of thanks from the man, and while Grievous did not care for it much, especially since he also had some anger towards the GD, he had managed to abstain from lashing out. That was not the most important part though because the sisters had another plan that Anakin also had an interest in. The Star Temples. I am aware that the now united Knight Sisters of Dathomir are looking for ancient massive pyramid-shaped buildings constructed by the Qua. Do you wish for me to also keep an eye on them for this as well? No, I already have some of the elite guard looking into it quietly. I have trained them well enough to hide their presence from most force sensitives. Anakin then continued. They will report to you which then you will report back to me. Right. A line of command has to be maintained, and even though they are capable enough, they still have much to learn. Anakin explained his reasoning of making sure the droids he made alive were well adapted to many of the structures of normal society. If the gate was ever activated, and thus subjecting infinity to the physical world, the planet housing the equipment would collapse into the infinity gate, along with the surrounding planets, moons, and even suns. The Night Sisters succeeded in capturing the prime gate on Dathomir along with the Star Temple, and nearly slaughtered many Kwai, the native species and creators of the gates. Again through the timely intervention by Anakin via his elite droids and Grievous, they had managed to end that quickly. They were quite powerful at one point, so why not induct them into Anakin's Grand Empire plans? The Night Sisters had intended to access the secrets of the Infinity Gate, and use its abilities to project a wave containing Infinity's power to destroy Coruscant, as well as surrounding planets and stars. 
Originally the Jedi, Quinlan Vos had taken care of this issue, but Anakin decided to usurp from the sisters this extremely powerful technology for his own use. Grievous was a bit nervous he had gained even more power, but that was par for the course. Anakin did not intend to use such a destructive device because it would be a waste. Coruscant. Science is quite the weird subject, especially within the universe he currently resides in. Anakin had gone in-depth with his studies, and intended to make sure he was not limited to the teachings of the Jedi. He wanted knowledge, both theoretical and practical and most if not all the sciences, so he could make a complete picture for what he intended to create. He had ideas and started to implement these ideas by seeing if he could perform or get some medical droids he has control over to test out his plan, his test subject being Grievous. Anakin did not lie about granting Grievous the opportunity to use the Force, but what Anakin did not tell him was the risks of what he wanted to do, nor did he tell him he was to be his first test subject. What Anakin wanted to focus on were nanomachines, or more specifically he had designed an implant and suit made specifically out of nanites. The idea is they would be connected to him, as if it were another armor leg he could control at will. It would work in a similar way to the Space Marine's armor from the 40k universe, and the Krynet nanosuit. It would in every sense of the word be living, but it would be living through him as in the suit would become part of him, and this is why he required an implant, so he would be able to fully make a connection. Mechadera would not be enough, and implanting the suit with the non-organic midi-chlorians is also not enough. The design of the suit would be extremely similar to the Krynet nanosuit with a lot of its capabilities, but would be much thinner, and could retract in a similar way to the Blue Beetle. There would be a point that the nanomachines are kept within a storage area preferable made out of a strong material like Besker. I would very much like to make the suit out of Besker as well, but I simply at this moment of time, don't have the necessary materials. The nanosuit would be able to switch between one of four modes. Armor, Strength, Speed and Cloak. Armor mode diverts the energy supply of the nanosuit into absorbing the kinetic energy of incoming projectiles and other damaging forces, such as hazardous levels of heat, radiation and energy blasts, effectively making the user temporarily invulnerable to true physiological damage, and thus withstanding impacts which would normally be lethal. Strength mode enhances the user's physical strength to superhuman levels. Speed mode enhances the user's movement speed, allowing for a faster jogging speed or superhuman sprint. When cloak mode is activated, the nanosuit would alter its outer surface through the use of a crystalline generation, capable of fully absorbing or bending incoming wave spectrums, such as visible light, radio waves, infrared, and possibly microwaves or others, to render itself completely invisible to the human eye in most surveillance equipment. Quite the list of modes he wishes to include so he would get another increase to his power. There are also secondary functions that are meant to make it easier for Anakin in a lot of situations where his normal human capabilities wouldn't allow, and if he was cut off from the Force. There are ways to dampen a force sensitive's abilities and senses after all. While Anakin was thinking to himself, he had received a call that went straight to his communication device. Answering the call, Anakin says. Yes. The revolt on Geonosis has been unsuccessful. It seems Apoggle the Lesser has not been able to succeed Haddis as Archduke. Grievous is the one who had called him. Right, I knew this was coming, but what call me about it? Did something different happen? We were successful in gaining and setting up a trade agreement between us and them. We have also put a stop to Sidious and his plans to take over and continuously use them. Once Poggle the Lesser was in power for two years now, Darth Sidious's intentions became clear. He wanted control of the droid factories to supply B-1 series battle droids to the Trade Federation for an invasion of Naboo. Poggle, grateful for Sidious's help, gladly struck a deal with the Trade Federation. The fact that Poggle and Trade Federation Viceroy Newt Gunray hated each other, but still worked together, was a great testament to the influence of the Sith Lord. Despite Poggle being unsuccessful in his succession, he had managed to gain enough control of the droid facilities on their planet. This would make Deku going to Poggle the same, but the amount of droids that could be supplied, has been cut in half. So the two, both Poggle and Haddis had become co-rulers, co-archdukes over the droid factories. This limits Palpatine a lot more, and is much better for Anakin and most of the galaxy for the long run. Shortly after the Trade Federation was defeated at the Battle of Naboo, Poggle was approached by the rogue Jedi Count Deku, revealing himself as Darth Tyrannus, a new apprentice of Darth Sidious. Deku formed a partnership with Poggle, the co-archduke would ensure that Geonosis was among the founding worlds of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, and would supply a large amount of the Separatist droid army. In return, Poggle would be paid large sums of money for his trouble, and Geonosis would earn a place on the high order of the new Confederacy. This partnership was lucrative, Poggle even took the liberty to create a new B2 super battle droid for the Confederacy. Sapping City's power is greater for more in the long run. Right now it may not stop him all too much, but it would allow me to further build up, and may even delay his takeover. Secondary functions that Anakin would apply to the nanosuit were things that he himself would be incapable of accessing normally with his human physiology. The nanosuit incorporates its own communications equipment, allowing for hands-free voice and a video communications over a wide range of frequencies. The visor of the nanosuit is capable of heightening received light, acting as night vision goggles. The suit possesses a binoculars function integrated into the visor, allowing the operator of the suit to tag enemy units, ammunition, and vehicles for future reference and engagement. This information can also be relayed onto allied units. The binoculars also magnify distant sound, enabling the user able to hear the lightest of sounds from far away. 
The suit features an onboard supercomputer which allows it to remotely interface with and hack most electronic devices, either military and civilian, even alien. The suit incorporates a small internal oxygen supply for underwater activity. It automatically recharges when the user re-enters a breathable atmosphere. It also incorporates an array of hydro thrusters that allow increased speed during speed mode sprinting, as well as high maneuverability when submerged. This functionality also permits the nano suit to move in a zero-gravity environment by utilizing atmospheric gases as reaction mass. Several magnetic holsters will be put on the suit for weapons storage and management. It incorporates data connectivity to a network of Anakin's choosing, allowing the suit to display critical information on its side. Computers can interface with the nano suit in order to access this network. Additionally, information about the nano suit as well as the wearer's vital signs can be accessed from the network by those he trusts to rescue him in a pinch. Capable of recording audiovisual and environmental data, allowing the user to document whatever circumstances they encounter. It will also maintain body temperature if it detects critically suboptimal temperatures in the surrounding environment, and can keep the user alive, even at minus 130 degrees centigrade, minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. A special defrosting function is also introduced. If the suit does somehow get frozen, the user of the suit can initiate the defrosting device, and the nano suit will be fully capable of movement again. The suit's transfer can be used to broadcast a signal that can disable communications, and allows a person to send the signal through a wireless connection via the nano suit. It is capable of deactivating the shields of a lot of things. The last secondary feature that Anakin intends to put most of his focus on is symbiosis, considering he wants the suit to be a part of him, an extension of his arm if you will. Over time, the suit would also directly interface with the wearer's brain. This allows the wearer to use the suit's processors as like a part of their own brain, essentially making most of their thought processes happen outside of their own brain. The wearer's personality and memories would also be copied and stored in the suit's deep layers. Once fully merged, the wearer no longer appears to wear the suit, but has access to all the suit's functions. I will hold off on making the suit for now, as I want to make sure it is perfect because of the function, symbiosis. After learning as much as he could as a youngling, and their training he had already successfully completed everything, and the only reason he hasn't officially become a Padawan yet is again because of his age. Thankfully even though the GD Order has seemingly refused to let him go on missions, he is still able to advance his studies within the GD. Qui-Gon and Windu had been dutiful masters, and had spared no efforts in helping him develop. It seems though that Windu had been very reluctant in giving Anakin the opportunity to learn his lightsaber form. Only recently had Anakin started to ask more about it, and Windu was obviously against it, but he could tell his initial resistance to teaching him has decreased. Slowly but surely I will learn this form of lightsaber technique. Anakin's appeal for this style links back to the idea it draws from the dark side of the Force, and it would be a step in the right direction to increase his understanding of it. The dark side of the Force has what some would consider unnatural abilities. Like was said by Sidious, and it is true that a lot of the powers and abilities a lot would consider it as such. The Jedi certainly condemn powers like that. There would be no room for Anakin to learn of the dark side, and its abilities then from another user of the dark side of the Force, which are not exactly in short supply, but is much less than the Jedi. The Knight Sisters would not teach him, he knows this, and it would be too dangerous to risk the chance from learning under Palpatine, as Anakin could not ensure his own safety. What I can do though, is look for holocrons based off of the Sith, which would help me learn some techniques and delve into their powers. Form Vi, known by its two primary disciplines of Jio and Vapid, and also known as the Ferocity Form, was the seventh form of lightsaber combat. It was considered the most aggressive and unpredictable form. Both Mace Windu and Deepa Balaba were the only known masters of the Vapid variant in the Jedi Order, that hadn't fallen to the dark side of the Force. The sole form by a variant to have gained recognition by the GD Council, Vapid, was only created in the final decades of the GD Order. The key architect of Vapid was GD Master Mace Windu, who developed the form to address his weakness by controlling his inner darkness, and channeling it into worthy ends. For this purpose, he refined advances from the preceding centuries and, in the minds of some, finally perfected form Vai as a true lightsaber form, in line with the tenets of the GD Code. Windu had liked to remind Anakin of the fact that his form that he created was extremely dangerous to those of the untrained mind, with enough willpower to overcome the dark side. It was true in a sense that giving into the nature of the dark side was dangerous with a lot of examples to show for it, but Anakin believed that there had to be some form of balance one could achieve. Form Vai would be part of his path to achieve this balance. Windu himself was wary of allowing others to study the form outside of his own Padawan pupil, well aware of the danger it posed. Practitioners of Vapid drew on their anger and passion, but never gave in to them. Compared with the other lightsaber forms, which directed warriors to master their emotions, Vapid's approach was dangerous. I have mastered the core powers of the Jedi. Within control, sense and alter and it was surprisingly easy, or should I not be surprised with the ease in which I had basically learned everything I would need within a year. Force speed and force stealth from the control area. Force sight, force seeing, force empathy and telepathy, but Anakin had already really developed these abilities, so he did not benefit much from this. Telekinesis is last, and it is an ability that Anakin had also developed already, but had not been able to properly master himself. There were also multiple ways one could use telekinesis, whether that apply oneself or onto others. Force jump or leap and force push and pull. Dathomir. Grievous did not have to go to any top-of-the-line medical facility or anything like that to start his procedure, as all the droids needed were capable of performing the task. 
Anakin had made sure they were. Grievous would be lying if he said he was not excited. These powers he would be able to access would help him in the future when in service to his master and his own goals. The first operation to take place would be the one that I dub as the implant. This will connect to the mechanical parts that has turned you into a cyber. Anakin had told him. These parts will be reapplied after your recovery from the operation, and you will have to go through standard medical checkups within the next month. Within a month's time if everything is okay, then you should be able to finally equip your parts. Anakin continued explaining. Are there any risks to this procedure? Obviously even if he has a certain level of trust and loyalty, Grievous still wants to live, and he would want to know of some side effects, if any. Anakin responded. There are no known side effects, but what you will be going through mentally will be something else as your mind will try to establish a proper connection to the implant, where you would claim control of. This implant will act as the main interface and programming for the new body you are to be granted. A many number of things will be made available to you. If you have any more questions, please ask them now. Anakin was presiding over the operation through a screen, and has directly taken control of one of the droids present. No, I have no more. Right, I will start now. Fortunately you can be and will be put to sleep with a tranquilizer. And with Anakin's final words, Grievous had blacked out. The next few days Grievous had been in and out of consciousness because he was trying to establish his control over the chip implanted into him. The chip was created by Anakin to act as interference, and to help establish the initial connection needed for someone to become one with the machinery to be connected to him. After the month had come to an end Anakin had then explained to Grievous his current state of being. I feel weird. Grievous had said. Of course, you mind now that it is fully acclimated to its new capabilities, allows for you some very minor force-related abilities. Anakin said. Your senses even though not as advanced as they could be have now opened up your mind. Specifically you now have a special talent when it comes to machines, similar to my talent, but you have more interface while my developed abilities are more instinctual. Anakin voices through the droid he habitually controlled to monitor Grievous's progress. So, I can get my parts now. I can have a full functioning body along with abilities related to the force. Yes. It will take some time as you will feel new sensations with your mechanic body parts than what you originally were able to feel. Like what? It is the process your body and mind will be fully connecting to each other, and like my lead droids, where their parts have become alive in a sense. You too will also have this. The synthesized voice of the droid said. You won't feel pain in the traditional sense, it will be more of a mental backlash of losing a part of your new self. I will be able to feel again. Not in the traditional sense. Again, a lot of what you are now and what you will become will be similar to the elite droids. Well what are we waiting for? Let's reapply my parts. What happened next was a sequence of events that it nearly drove Grievous to tears as he was able to sense, but not physically sense with his newfound force sensitivity. What I would classify as force sensitive enough to perform feats at a similar level of normal GD or Sith, is to have a midi chlorian count as high as around 7500. Anakin thought to himself. When conducting various tests, Anakin had to make sure the non-organic midi chlorian count would try to dip to the original levels Grievous had before integration, otherwise it would have been all for naught. Thank you. I can't thank you enough, I did not know I would be able to really sense anything. Well, nearly anything for my subordinates. No, you don't understand, I have been deprived of my senses, and now through the force, I can properly feel things again. Truly, I thank you. I accept your gratitude, but this is no time for this. I believe you should get used to your new self as it will take a while to readjust. Back with Anakin he had just cemented his own resolve to go through with his own operation. Finally with everything in place I can integrate myself with my own special plan. The results from Grievous was within my own considerations. And I have finally collected all of the materials from the nanomachines, to the metals required and the chemicals. I have also synthesized the fibers required to go through with my suit. Now I just need to go through with the creation and operation. Tatooine. It had been a year since she had seen her child, and every day she had missed him. Sure she could call him through a communication device and seen him grow day by day, but it wasn't enough at least for her it wasn't. Shmai had been keeping herself busy as to not feel lonely without Anakin. She did have some company in the kindly old lady that had become a grandmotherly figure to Anakin known as Jir. Jira practically visited her every day. She had taken a liking to the woman as she was the only real living presence around her. Sure her son's construct, C-3PO was good at helping her manage things with the business, and on occasion kept her company. But it isn't the same. The only other people she had regular contact with were her subordinates living with her on Tatooine. The freed slaves that had been offered jobs were quite protective of her own, simply because she was Anakin's mother. She had done things that they appreciated as well, but most of the impact done to slaves on Tatooine was heavily done by her son. She couldn't be any more proud of the fact that his same acts of kindness and major ones as well, had helped shape a better future and lifestyle for those they had saved. Years ago she did not have much hope in being freed from slavery, and now that she is and is helping free slaves herself, it felt surreal. Hello Shmai, it is a nice day we are having isn't it? The person had walked into the store that her son and herself had started in. Welcome, what can we do for you? Well the business they had built together was still progressing, she still liked doing such a simple task as keeping an eye out on the store. Obviously she wouldn't do this if she were not protected, but many types of protection were put in place in case of any danger to her life. I am here to pick up a droid commission. Okay, name please and I will get it for you right away. 
After Anakin left she had become worried especially since she found out he had somehow had a hand in helping the people of Naboo free themselves for the Trade Federation. News doesn't usually travel too fast from the Republic all the way out to the Outer Rims, but she had been making sure to keep up with current events. Even if she didn't she would still be informed of anything important that could affect their business operations. Thank you for your patronage. Shmai said while the person had gotten his droid he had ordered promptly leaving the store. Even more surprised was she that her son had offered to buy up all of the droids left on Abu from the Trade Federation. She didn't know what she would do with all of those droids, as she certainly had no way to stockpile and sell them all within a short period of time. Her son had it all handled though, and simply reassured her that it was for himself. Now while she has grown throughout the years herself and her mentality that doesn't mean she lost her intelligence. Shmai trusted her son that what he had in mind for the droids was for the right purposes, and even if it wasn't she would only scold him. She couldn't possibly see her son be in trouble, and would outright deny that he is even if she knows he is in the wrong. She is first, a mother before anything else. C-3PO can you bring me those parts from over there, that would be much appreciated. Sure, madam. She had to send her time doing something than just reminiscing about her son, and worriedly thinking about him and missing him. Much of her life she had sent with him after all, and she believed he had a calling that was meant for more than to just stay on Tatooine. Shmai was currently working on a small project of her one in relation to the many company properties she had brought and distributed across the Outer Rims and Republic. Spywalker Industries at this point had become a big name and was officially a part of the big leagues. In fact her training and development of her very own products had been selling nicely as well. It wasn't just Anakin that had an act for technology, he had to get it from somewhere. Anakin got it from her. She was currently working on an idea she had of her own for a while now. The grand design that would hopefully reshape the moisture farming on the planet of Tatooine, because she had seen that water was a big problem here. If the population continued to grow the more the planet's economy would suffer because of an increase in demand for water. So she had taken it in for herself that she would help out. She was making a special core reactor meant to be used to form the ambient water within the atmosphere at a more efficient rate. This would both make her more money to expand, and more money to, but more slaves to free them, whilst expanding the land she owns to increase the housing available to those freed slaves. I am nearly done with this thing. Hopefully I will be able to get this thing working. It was only one of the many components needed for her design to work. She had some help from some people whom she had helped educate within the company here on Tatooine in the process, but everything was mainly done by her. This would be officially her biggest project to truly mark her own stuff done within, instead of the things Anakin had designed or remodeled himself. Maybe I should start to get out more often. It might help me if I socialize with others, it probably won't fix my missing Anakin, but at least I would not feel alone. If Anakin were to hear her thoughts he would probably tell her he doesn't plan to stay with the GD forever. They are dying cause after all, and they will sink with the Republic. Shmai would continue throughout the rest of her day, continuing with her normal routine, with the completion of her final phases and design of her project. Coruscant. After the month of non-stop surveillance and monitoring of Grievous, Anakin had everything ready, prepared for the next few days that it would take to go through with his options. Fortunately he doesn't have to participate within any of the classes anymore, due to his very rapid progression, but that doesn't mean he would be able to disappear from the Order for a few days. Thankfully what he has to go through is different from Grievous, as he had a far more severe bodily condition. Another thing to take into account is that Anakin's physical prowess and healing capabilities have been influenced by his own training and the advanced healing factor granted to him through the ritual. What he needs to do now is wait for a day where he is completely free from having to train with either Qui-Gon or Winder. Walking through the hallways, Anakin had decided to go for a simple walk to unwind, so he is not mentally stressed before the surgery. Anakin. Beerus had become a friend of Anakin's despite her childish nature she was a somewhat good companion. Hey. I know you can hear me. Ha. Huh? Oh, it's just you, Beerus. I was just out for a stroll before I have my lesson with Windu, maybe I can convince him to finally teach me form Vi. Beerus had practically been the only person he had properly befriended, while he had kept everyone else as acquaintances because they were still children mentally. The only person he had found tolerable enough was Beerus. There were a few other younglings that Anakin would have liked to befriend as well, but most were way younger than him. Well, someone is better than no one I guess. By the way, why are you out of class? You trying to skip it or something? Beerus with a little embarrassment on her face answers. Something like that. Well, that's your decision then. What were you originally going to do before you coincidentally came across me? Anakin says before continuing. Anyway you're welcome to join me as I was just going to a training room that's empty to practice some lightsaber forms. Sounds good to me. Beerus replies. Anakin to help advance himself at a quicker pace, decided he need to create another droid, but almost specifically geared towards combat to do with close range saber styles. The programming he put into was simple, and he didn't want to create a droid that was alive, simply because he thinks it would get a beating from him. And it is true. It did get beat down more often than not as Anakin adapted very well and very fast to mistakes made in his various forms. He made sure to update the droid settings as much as he could so he would be challenged, and he certainly was, but it was not enough to keep up with Anakin's pace. Here let's get to it. You can go first. Anakin tells Beerus to fight the droid. Okay. Moving towards the droid it activates bringing itself back to droid consciousness, and prepares itself to battle Beerus. Beerus had gone with him a few times to practice, and after the very few first lessons Anakin had surpassed her, and then had started to help her advance in her lightsaber forms as well. 
The practice sabers blare to life from both the droid and bears. The droid doesn't wait for bears to attack first and goes in for the metaphorical kill. Clashing sabers against each other, it is clear to see that the droid is obviously overpowering bears, as she has not enough physical strength to overcome the droid. It is not a forte after all. Bears practice the Suresu fighting style, but where her true talents lie in with the healing arts that are derived from the Force. Halfway through the battle between the two, Bears matches to catch the droid off guard and disarms it. Well done, but you took a little longer than I would like. Anakin spoke up. I need to get to my training with Master Windu now. Do you? I am sorry for taking up your time. It's alright but you should really practice a bit more with your form it could become better and would allow you to finish faster. The quicker your opponent is incapacitated the more energy you preserve in future situations. Thanks. I got to go now, see you later. Sure some other time then. Anakin leaves first heading towards where he would find Windu. Hey master, what are we to learn today? Anakin asks is now master of one year. Today Padawan Skywalker I have only come to prepare you and inform you of some new training you are to take part in. New training? Yes. I have decided that you are ready to learn the saber form by... Really? Wait you said only inform and prepare, so I won't be starting today. No, you will be given some theoretical material so you would have to study a bit first. Study, really? Have I not already proven I can easy breeze through most of everything? No, in fact I can breeze through everything. Well that may be true, it would be prudent that you tone that you're overconfidence, Yung Padwin. Windu says with his signature raising of his eyebrows. Here's everything you will need and your practice will start next week after I make sure you know everything. Windu passes over a few books and even a journal that Windu himself had created to document his experiences with the form by. The rest of the day is up to you. Windu then without waiting for a reply or goodbye leaves. I guess I have finally broken his resolve to not teach me his style. Or has he realized all along I had not been as dangerous as he had at first thought when I was allowed into the order. Either way this works for me, and now I have some free time to go through with the operation. I wouldn't be able to gully heal or recover within a day's time, but a day should be enough that any scaring from the surgery is healed over. If not I can just simply apply some basic bandaging to cover the scar. Sneaking away from the GD temple Anakin moves towards the shopfront his company had bought on Coruscant, despite the large sum of money he had to pay for it, it is coming in handy right now. A medical facility was made inside separate from the rest of the shop, as Anakin wanted, now needed it for himself. Unlike Grievous his nanosuit will not be as complicated to introduce into himself. It is time to go under the knife. And with those closing thoughts, Anakin drifts off into a semi-unconscious state as he works on his surgery through a droid. Coruscant. A humanoid figure is seen standing face to face with a droid. The droid has a saber ignited ready to strike his opponent who is covered head to toe in a suit made out of weird materials and fibers with black coloring. The being's face is masked behind a helmet that is also colored black. Any other color of the suit glows with a purple light. Purple is cool after all, the actor Samuel L. Jackson sure had it right. Anakin dodges as the droid goes in for the kill, and with extreme ease and skill smashes down with full force. Anakin suited within his armor, has it currently set to armor mode as its default not needing any other module. Igniting his own training saber, Anakin launches into an attack drawing from the negative emotions to empower his lightsaber form. Practice makes perfect, and having a training partner helps me evolve beyond simple theoretical study, and untested with no experience with the form. Anakin had more plans than to just create his very own Nanosu, he had also wanted to create his very own Vader-based suit as well, but instead a direct copy, he would take inspiration from what made the outfit so intimidating. At first the Nanosuit he had created was made so he had to keep it on all the times, while he did everything. It took a while before the Nanosuit achieved symbiosis, meaning it is now merged into his very physical being. He not only infused the suit with the non-organic form of midi-chlorians like he had done to the living droids and Grievous, he had also combined it with the blue stone that allows people a limited amount of access to force abilities. The reason this was done was to further increase his connection to the suit where it was fully spiritually connected, so when symbiosis was fully achieved, it would be connected to him at not only a physical and mental level, but also to his soul. This would make it possible for him to use force abilities that would require him to take of the suit, if he wasn't connected to it. The combat droid continuously swings at Anakin who is within his nano suit, but keeps on dodging and weaving through the very fast strikes. Sometimes Anakin would deflect well in a defensive posture to refine his control of his body. He usually restricted his force abilities when fighting against the straining droid he created as he would win too fast. Purely refining his physical state of being and the skills of lightsaber dueling, makes sure he would never be dull in combat situations. In fact, the droid had been upgrading throughout the year to adjust the settings to make it capable of keeping up with him. Especially when he had merged with the Nanosuit. Why don't we kick this up a notch? Anakin says out loud as more droids enter the training room from out of nowhere. Some have training sabers of their own, while others have been programmed to fire some training blasters at him, while he takes on the entire group of droids. Still, even this is not enough for the droids to even manage to land a hit on him. No saber or blaster shot can hit him, most of the swings of sabers being reflected, while the shots being narrowly dodged or avoided altogether. The training he has been put through was definitely of higher standards, and if his masters, Qui-Gon and Mace did not push him hard, then he would have done so himself. He knows for sure that if he did not have someone who had experience help him learn the force, without them it would take a long time to get to the level he is currently at. After a while within the training room, Anakin had defeated all droids by disabling them. That was good a good workout. 
During the same year the invasion of Naboo took place a species that was very peculiar had arrived in the galaxy. The Yuzinvong. Yuzinvong, children of Yun Yuzin. Also called the Chosen Race, known to the Chists and Farins as the Far Outsiders, and sometimes incorrectly abbreviated to Vong were nomadic extragalactic sentient species. A typical Yuzinvong resembled a human in form, though they were taller and heavier than the average human, and had less hair on their heads. The Yuzinvong were religious zealots, who viewed mechanical technology as blasphemy. Their technological innovations were genetically engineered and purely organic. Anakin had decided that he may want to stay away from this species at least for in the short term, knowing that they would in the future cause great death throughout the galaxy. What was even more special about them was their unique distinct lack of a presence within the Force. Considering they had come from outside the galaxy, it does make some sense as to why they would be like that. Master Skywalker, why have you called me? Grievous had answered the call he had sent to him. There is a very weird race of beings that have recently entered our part of the galaxy. Anakin says then continues. Well, more like a species that could be taken as an enemy of our future and the future of the droids. They have a distinct hate for technological advancements, and their technology is focused around biological and genetic materials. That is interesting, some of the elite medical droids would be interested in studying this species. Grievous says. I would like to as well. Is there something specific you would like to be done? Yes and no, I want to see if there is a way I could possibly communicate with this species. That probably won't happen considering I have basically become, if only partially a cyber -like yourself. Yes you have done something similar to myself. The other mission you had sent me on was a success, and I appreciate that I get to do things other than help manage the droids. Grievous says with sincerity. It does get boring sometimes. Grievous has spent most of his time on Dathomir dealing with the droids and with the Night Sisters. Even though he had now become somewhat capable with utilizing his new abilities, that didn't mean he was completely able to face off against them by himself. I have gotten those bracers you wanted. There was this human woman that had come into the plant searching for the same thing you were going for. Yes, I know that others would go after it. She is a professor of sorts. Grievous begins to report. Known as Profex Renala, a female human dark side adept, archaeologist and scholar, affiliated to the University of Sandbar. An interesting person indeed, you have sensed she is capable of using the force. Yes. I have also captured her as she was about to start an entire war over that bracer artifact. Renala was an expert in galactic history, archaeology, and the lore of several traditions of force users, including the GD Order, the Sith, in addition to bygone organizations. Secretly, Renala researched the Sith and traditions of the dark side to increase her own powers of the force. While researching in the university records, Renala discovered that a missing Sith treasure, the Bracers of Nagus, had been lost in a Sith starship, which had crash-landed on the planet of Larader. The Bracers could be used to increase the power of the dark side, and she coveted the relic. The Bracers' capabilities are entirely useless to me, the reason I had sent you out on that mission was for you to use those Bracers for yourself. Really. It will help you considering you have become much more affiliated with the dark side of the Force, so you can draw some power out of it. Anakin states. I suggest you don't use it for now though as it will make you weaker against other dark side users. The Bracers of Nagus were Sith artifacts created by a Sith artisan known as Nagus. In a quest for revenge and a personal feud against the Jedi Order, Nagus desired an item that would interact with the dark side of the Force, increasing the power of the dark side or wielding it. This led him to create the elaborately adorned Bracers of Nagus, which increased the wielder's dark side power, whenever such power was used against an adherent of the light side. However, if the target of an attack resorted to the dark side of the Force, the Bracers would benefit the target, rather than the wielder. Anakin continued. Can you help me fix this flaw? Yes. It won't be much effort to recreate another set of bracers with only the benefits. You do have to deal with the Night Sisters a lot. Great. Is there anything more you want to discuss, or you just want me to keep an eye out on those Yuzin Vong? The Yuzin Vong are dangerous especially to Force-sensitive people who are overly reliant on the Force. I suggest that the droids be careful as well. Anakin continues. They would be absolutely hated and despised even if they're what could be considered living beings. Okay. Grievous signs off from the communication device after Anakin had given his leave. Within the grand city of Coruscant, a large figure could be seen stalking through some of the lower rungs of the glorious capital of the Republic. Clad in a deep black suit, armored with a black cape draped behind the figure it moves through the shadier areas of Coruscant. The helmet is the signature helmet of the infamous Darth Vader, but in this current time frame the person within the suit was simply known as Vader. Anakin had been getting more and more free time, and he used this free time to his advantage. He had rebuilt Vader's original suit, but without the flaws and much more powerful. Much more connected to him. While well, his nano suit had achieved full symbiosis, meaning you cannot see the suit in on itself anymore, and had become part of his being, that did not mean he was going to stop there in empowering or protecting himself. There were also many other things he could do here on Coruscant, and that would be to start cleaning up the streets behind the mask, and become some sort of mafia boss controlling everything from behind the scenes. Much like Palpatine, but he would be changing things for the better. A lot of shady stuff stuff happened on Coruscant despite his clean look. It wasn't as perfect as it would like to display itself. In his more darker persona of Vader, he had built himself up as if he were Mandalorian, and made sure to not use any abilities related to the Force. It helps that he had also started helping out the Mandalorians as well, at least unofficially, he had been accepted into their culture as Vader. It was not that hard to fold them into believing he had some descent from that group, and had wanted to be trained and reintroduced to their culture. 
Lester is attached to his hips as to help along any negotiations that take place. When Anakin means negotiations, he doesn't mean the same way Qui-Gon goes with his. Slowly taking over the criminals of Coruscant and reforming them into better people was a slow process, but he had a few years to work with before things got very busy again. Anakin's breathing could be heard from behind the mask. You will surrender to me or suffer the consequences. Albeit it is not the same heavy breathing as the original, but just as intimidating nonetheless, as the local criminals had come to fear the synthesized force. Yes, sir. I will transfer everything to you. The criminal sum replied. Good, now let me see into your eyes. I will judge you for your sins, and if deemed unworthy of the living you shall die. Anakin moves towards the man and plunges right into the man's mind with some regard to his mental safety. R. The man chokes as if he was being gripped around his neck being brought closer to Anakin. I can erase some memories now, but it would be pretty hard doing it on proper force-sensitive people. Anakin thinks browsing the mind of the criminal. Nothing too outrageous in his actions though cannot be justified at least has a reason to resort to petty crimes. A lot of the criminals were simply normal people forced into situations that were very unlucky. The man Anakin is holding was also another victim of the many failings of the Republic. I may be delaying the inevitable, but this gives me time to build up the outer rims and make them stable planets for people to live on. Good. You have been judged and the weight of your sins will be multiplied, just so you remember the pain of those you tormented. What Anakin was doing was increasing the emotions of the man's guilt. The man slumps over unconscious. Looking towards the other who had gotten on his knees started to scream at the top of his lungs. No. Forgive me. Please, spare me my life. Vader walks towards him. This one seems like a person deserving of death. Let's look into his mind first. Anakin sees many things he dislikes and unlike the other, this man took pleasure in very sick acts that Anakin finds disturbing. Not to be too put off he looks no further before seeing. So many victims. Feel their pain. The sharp pain is felt as Vader tears apart the other man's mind, before making him relive the moments his victims had suffered. That should do it. I will come back to finish him off later if he manages to have enough willpower to survive the mental attack. He won't be doing anything else. Qui-Gon had been living a rather relaxed life after the events that happened on Naboo. With a brand new mechanical hand, he had to practice some more to get used to the new part of his body. He would be lying if he did not feel a little sorrowful about the loss, but he understands and has learned with the GD code in mind. This helped him calm his emotions, and when he thought about it the prosthetic was actually quite well constructed. His second apprentice, Anakin was quite talented after all when it came to anything to do with technology. Overall he made quick progress within the GD, and it would not be long before either himself or Mace would take Anakin on his first mission. Today we will be learning about the differences between what is the living force compared to the cosmic force. Qui-Gon was currently conducting a lesson with Anakin passing on his knowledge to his talented student. The living force was one of two complementary aspects of the force, an all-encompassing and all-transcending energy field present in and generated by all living beings, connecting all of life which fed into the cosmic force and death. Thus, the life created the force, as the force created life. Sentience, consciousness and thought could be added onto life. The acceptance of the concept of the living force was only taught by a very small minority, and only accepted by a few within the order. Qui-Gon had taught Obi-Wan the same things in ways, just as he is teaching Anakin now. The sentient mindful of the living force, let go of their conscious self and relied on their instincts, living in the present and feeling instead of thinking, thus becoming attuned to life around them, and enacting the will of the cosmic force. You should be aware of the midi chlorians I have told you about before, right my young Padawan? Qui-Gon questions. Yes, master. Midichlorians are intelligent microscopic life forms that live symbiotically inside the cells of all living things. Anakin answers. Correct but there is more to them. Qui-Gon then continues. When present in sufficient numbers, they could allow their host to detect the pervasive energy field known as the Force. Midichlorian counts were linked to potential in the Force, ranging from normal human levels of 2500 per cell, to the much higher levels of GD. At least this is as much as modern day science can tell. The GD order does use scouting equipment to test people. This is the very same test I had done to you on Tatooine long ago. Life is sustained by the midichlorians, which served as the biological vector between living beings and the will of the Force, and the greater quantity of which allowed a life form to have a greater connection to the Force, to the extent of actively using the energy as a power. The living Force contained the duality of the light and the dark sides of the Force, the latter of which tempted Force users, who must reject it by being mindful of their emotions. This concept is not widely accepted within the Order if at all, so what I am teaching you is of my own opinion that I have cultivated over the years. Master, I have a question. If this is not taught across the GD, then why do you think this is the correct way of thinking when it comes to the Force? Well that is from one of the journeys I had gone on to the supposed birthplace of midichlorians. This was about the time I was discovering the secrets to manifesting one's consciousness after death. Interesting, would you tell me this story? Sure. Qui-Gon traveled to a planet strong with the Force, a world that legend said was the birthplace of life and the origin of midichlorians. He learned from five Force priestesses who had retained their consciousness after death. He learned that, when a living thing died, its life passed through the living force and into the cosmic force to become one with the force. As the living force and cosmic force existed in tandem, it became possible for one to retain consciousness and physically manifest themselves after death. Jin was considered worthy of the knowledge of eternal life, and secretly began his training to unlock his mysteries fully. 
He also learned from a shaman of the wills that achieving eternal consciousness required absolute selflessness. So the only way to achieve life after death is to maintain that you become selfless to a fault. Yes and no. The meaning of selflessness itself is that a being would be more concerned with the needs and wishes of others than with one's own. That is nice and all but how are you to help others if you are unwilling to help yourself first? You couldn't possibly everywhere at once or be able to give yourself for safety and peace of every other being. Well that may be true, I believe that all one needs to do is make sure you do more for others than what you do for yourself, as this is truly the way to spiritual immortality. Qui-Gon then continues with another story of something he had experienced when it comes to the Force. I had once told Master Yoda that being called a coward was not of great concern to me, but that being called a great warrior was. After a mission, I had been given a vision through the Force, and it had communicated to me many great things. Qui-Gon then begins to share his experience. In his vision, his skin and GD robes covered in marks and was surrounded by red humanoid beings who grew out of dark tendrils. Though at least one of these beings tried to attack him as he fought, Jin quickly ignited his lightsaber and cut the beings down, only for the red coloration to vanish from those he had killed. Jin saw he had murdered Jidi, and the same darkness that he had seen on their bodies began to consume him. By choosing violence, the dark side had gained power over him. As the darkness wrapped across his face, Jin awoke from his vision horrified, only to see the light side had entered into the monument. He realized the force had taught him he could find balance that could be achieved without conflict, as unchecked violence would make the Jidi turn into what they sought to confront. In fact, he found that some of the planet's dark corruption had instead formed into flowers, existing in harmony with the light. And that my young apprentice is why I believe that undue violence is unnecessary in a lot of situations. That is why being called a great warrior disturbs me so much. Captured by a bunch of droids. How stupid. Professor Renala, sometimes known as Profex Renala, was the current captive of Anakin and Grievous, and had basically been kept for a few weeks now. The only reason they had done so was to see the reaction if anyone would come looking for her. Let me out of here you cyborg scum. Renala called out towards the dimly lit hallways. Laughing the voice of Grievous could be heard as he approaches. Why, look what you have here. Grievous continues before she can speak some more. Unfortunately for you, no one has even come to look for you. It seems that you are not that well known, or there are not a lot of people that care for you. To their surprise it seems that not a lot of people cared for her, but that is what someone to deep in the dark side of the force can do. Practicing the dark arts without due diligence can lead to a lot of negative consequences, and sometimes those who are in too deep can neglect others around them. One could push those closest to them away from themselves unintentionally. You are quite lucky that the master has plans in store for you. Master. So you're not even the leader of the faction this is. If you are trying to get under my skin, it is not working. See where your ambition has gotten you, you should be humbled that the master has deemed you of any worth at all. Grievous has started to accept that Anakin may very well be much more than a mere human. Even more so his capabilities to be able to control all of these droids and to even create life to such an extent was amazing. Once Grievous had gotten used to his new form, he had practiced a lot to increase his power within the Force, and, though limited he could tell the vast difference between himself and Anakin. He will be arriving soon to discuss with you the direction of your future. Grievous turned and left after speaking to the professor. Hey. Wait. Come back here. Her shouts could be heard echoing within the facility she had been trapped in with the cold on living droids patrolling and guarding her from escape. Renella was a very vicious woman, quite cruel as well in her disregard for life. Her ambitions would have originally put a lot of lives at danger. She hired two dozen Clydeonian soldiers and went to Lairder in her bulk freighter, with her two PTR-3 vedette snub fighters in tow. On arrival, Renala found the Sith starship half buried in the local mountain range known as the Bleaks. She quickly organized a dig site using prefabricated buildings. Noticing two main groups in the planet, the human settlers who farmed the inland prairies and the native Savaks living the coast, she decided to capture strong individuals from each group and use them as slave miners to uncover the ship. Their plans were thwarted before they could even truly begin. The entire droid army that was extremely powerful above the standards of what she knew, had invaded and knocked out and disabled everyone and everything she had brought with her. Defenseless with only the limited force knowledge and abilities at her disposal, she did not stand a chance. In a small twist of fate, if you would have it, her own Clydeonian soldiers she hired had easily betrayed her when the chance was given. I knew I shouldn't have trusted those lowly beings. Renella saw those below her weaker than her, but she did not torture people for fun. She would have created slave camps though, and had them against their will die for her in her search for the Sith artifact and treasure, the Bracers of Nages. She had records of the immense power and potential it held when it came to users of the dark side of the Force. Even with her limited knowledge she knew it would be immensely valuable to others, and not just herself. Heavy footsteps were heard coming from down the hallway, a presence within the Force that seemingly distorted the energy field present on Dathomir. Anakin had come in the guise of Vader to talk with Renella. WH who are you? Renella said while starting to rapidly breath in and out at the being's very presence. What the hell is this monster? Their very instincts both physical and within the Force told her that her current opponent in front of her was much more powerful than her. The gap so large that she wouldn't stand a chance of survival if she were to try and go against him. Vader then speaks through the mask, keeping his face hidden standing at 1.8 meters tall. Hello, Professor. Keeping it short and drawing out his words, Vader decides to intimidate the girl first, so she is susceptible to his will. Ominously Vader stands at a mighty 1.8 meters tall in height. This was a combination of his own physical growth and the suit he is wearing. 
I have come here to judge you. If your crimes are those that cannot be forgiven, you best say your prayers. Rinella gulps at that. If you have not done anything too serious then you may be released. Vader states. Re-release. Rinella is confused. Playing some mind games, Vader decides to try and build some trust to lower her defenses. Yes, I have no more use for you after I have gotten what I wanted. You're simply too weak with abilities within the Force. Weak Rinella doesn't want to be told of her insecurities. Yes, with little to no training from anyone, how did you think you were doing? Vader continued. Did you think you were all-powerful? All-knowing, better than others around you? Yes. No. You are just like everyone else. A mortal who does not understand the nature of the dark side and its true potential. I have studied for years. I most certainly know a thing or two, especially about the history of Force-sensitive groups. Rinella lets something slip not knowing this is what Vader is looking for. You have information then. On the locations of potential places with Sith and Jedi temples abandoned. Of course I do. I am not a genius for nothing. How moronic, I have come to understand that stupid is not having a low level of intelligence. No it is behavior that shows a lack of good sense or judgment. Vader then continues. Your intelligence may help you out in the college you are associated with, but here it means nothing. Vanella being brought back to the reality of her situation is once again reminded on the presence that towers over her, both physically and within the Force. I am willing to make a deal with you for your release. I want you to work for me and in exchange I can give you much more of what you desire. Desire. You are ambitious and when your ambition was left unchecked it has gotten you into trouble, but I believe we can temper your behavior to be more suitable for society at large. Tell me what you can do for me. Rinella says thinking she may be able to escape the clutches of Vader. Very well. Vader then thinks. Does this girl never learn? Mace Windu was originally from the planet Harun Kal, where he was born into the Gosh Windu 42 years prior. GD anthropologists, who were studying the fact that all the Karunai could touch the Force, asked the Windu clan if they might take a child back to the GD order to regain the Karunai's connection to the Force. Padwin Skywalker, today we will start the lesson with your progress with Form Vi. Yes, Master. Anakin replied. Begin. Since his parents have already died in the jungles, Windu was given to the GD when he was six standard months old. Having not been old enough for his naming day within the tribe, the Order bestowed upon him a name as he entered the academy. Like all in the Order, the young Korin boy was taught by Grandmaster Yoda when he was a learner, and eventually went on to become a Padawan to another Jedi. At one point during his apprenticeship, Windu trained under Master Trasa. What truly surprised Windu when he had started to teach the boy known as Anakin, was that his talent was extremely potent. So much so it surpassed all others he had seen and at first that it scared him. With time he had settled down, but that did not mean it did not amaze him any less. Skywalker had gone so far as to even recreate his unusual ability to see Shatterpoints in the Force, and how they would affect all of his future actions, as well as the vulnerabilities of his opponents. With these unique abilities, he had glimpses of parts of his future, such as the lightsaber he would eventually build. No doubt Skywalker had been using these powers as well, probably to an even greater extent. What was truly weird about his new apprentice was that he could not properly see the boy's future, like he had none at all. But, you are just about ready to move on to the next stage on your training, and may in fact receive your first mission. I do not know who you would go on this mission with so you should be prepared. Thank you master. The two continue to clash their training sabers against each other. Even though we both are using the same form, and he has only had a small amount of time compared to me to learn the form, it is amazing how fast he has progressed. As they continue to exchange blows when you start to lose some of his breath. This kid has got a lot of energy. I created Vapid to answer my weakness, it channels my own darkness into a weapon of the light. Mace then continues. And it seems that I have successfully taught you how to use this form. But be careful, Skywalker I sense that you feel very strongly. It would be best if you didn't so easily become emboldened by your passion. Mace continues. It would be best if you tempered that passionate nature of yours. I have seen you have grown quite attached to things. Anakin then questions in a joking manner as he knows Windu is quite no nonsense. But master, without possessions of anything how am I to survive? No clothing to give me warmth. No shelter to house me from the elements. What am I supposed to do? I think that is enough of that for today. Okay. There wasn't much more for Anakin to learn from Mace, and he is ready for a lot of things, and is in fact much more powerful than most Jedi Knights and sometimes Mace can't help but feel that he may be more powerful than some of the Masters. But Master, Don Dozum are Masters on the Council have a specialized precious hilt made out of Electrum. Still deciding to be cheeky Anakin continues where he left off. Yes, young Skywalker there are many things that the Council gains, the Electrum Grip attachment being one of them. Mace sighs knowing that Anakin wouldn't change his ways. He has been quite the amusing student over the years, and had even the courage to ask him for his allowance to learn Form Vi. Mace started to respect Anakin as he had the true makings of a Jedi, if not a little unorthodox. Mace sighs within his head. He has been influenced by Qui-Gon in his stubbornness, but his playfulness should slowly start to recede once he experiences a real mission. Just remember young Skywalker that with great power comes great responsibility. A lot within the temple sees you in a prodigious light, and would like to see your eyes to a position even greater than Master Yoda. People have seen Anakin's potential, and rumors have been starting to fly around as one of the teachers in the know about Anakin's midichlorian records, let it slip he had great potential. Even more so problems were created from this incident leading to Anakin's would-be connection to the Jedi prophecy as the supposed chosen one. Before you head off why don't you also inform me of your progress with the Shatterpoints. 
Sure, I can do that. For now I have learned how to see the shatter points in situations, beings and circumstances. Good, you have come a long way. Remember these shatter points reveal points upon which other things were aligned. Shatter points could form links between beings, creatures, planets, or other vessels, and if destroyed or utilized, these shatter points could hold the key to averting disaster, sealing fate, winning battles, and fulfilling the very will of the force itself. I will see you in another two days. Mace left with those finishing words, but whilst turning around and leaving the room he could hear Anakin call back to him. Master. Don't forget your promise. Mace just shakes his head as he leaves with a small amused tug of his lips, pointing upwards while sighing within his mind. What have I gotten myself into? Coruscant. A midi core encounter used by the GD, at least Anakin is outdated and is incapable of fully testing his true potential. The only readings on record was that his midi core count is above 20,000, but the approximate amount is still unknown. He knows the ritual should have enhanced it from what it was originally, and he would be able to use mathematics to reverse calculate his original count per soul. Getting his hands on the technology and the theory behind midi chlorians was not that hard, especially after coming to the temple. There was a veritable treasure trove of knowledge in regards to the force, of course skewered onto the light side of the force. That is beside the point, the point is he had access to everything he needed to create his very own counter. To create one for himself simply because nothing could possibly detect his no matter their equipment. But Anakin didn't only want to create something for himself he was curious about other things as well. He had captured one of the Yuz in Gong, and it was true when trying to sense them within the force they are not present at all. Anakin was extremely powerful, especially when it came to mind and sense based powers related to the force. He had ideas to get around this disadvantage of only being human with powerful force abilities, but what was truly fascinating was he wanted to test the Yuz in Vong he had captured. He wanted to discover whether or not they had any midi chlorians of all. From what Anakin remembered about the history of the species, little was known about their early history, but the Yuz in Vong had apparently once lived as symbiotes with their homeworld, and were force sensitive. Their technology was also largely organic. At some point in their history, the Yuz in Vong were caught in the midst of a devastating galactic conflict between two droid civilizations, believed to be the Silentium and the Abominer, which solidified their hatred of mechanical technology and xenophobia towards other sentient life forms. Anakin had transferred the device he had created to Grievous, so he could get a blood test done to confirm whether or not they too also had access to the all-encompassing energy field of the Force. While he waited he was currently tagging along with Bears, but she has yet again come to him for some help. Ani, what do you think? Have I progressed? Anakin looks at her handiwork. It seems good, but I believe you could use less energy and shorten the amount of time it takes to heal someone's wounds. Anakin had created a cut on his finger using a specialized knife, knowing that not a lot of weapons could hurt him anymore. Beerus definitely has talent when it comes to the healing arts. Beerus had become much more proficient in the various ways of the Force. The potential in areas that include medicine are really good, and she has an interest within them as well. All Anakin had to do was point her in the right direction, and most of the time she had gotten to where she needed to be, of course it helps when he has an even greater ability to predict the future. The many futures that is with Mace's special power he recreated for himself. Anakin it would be soon that I get a chance to have a master of my own. Do you think I could do it? Do you believe I can get a master, that one would accept me? Anakin replies with a sure tone. I know for sure that you will become a Padawan. Many GD younglings don't manage to have a master accept them as their students, even more are only capable enough to join the various GD corps. Then you will have a great a great master, I am sure of it. Anakin says with certainty. Well, at least you will have a master if everything goes the same as can. I shouldn't have really changed all too much except accelerator progress ahead of time. Have you been practicing your form and style with lightsaber combat much? Yes, I have. Thank you for letting me borrow your droids. It has really helped me. At this point Barris continuously finds ways to be around me. I do not mind the affections from her, but currently she is still a child, yet to be fully grown, and I have practically accelerated my own growth as well. It is good to know that she seems to be shy around the topic of emotions, as I have been slowly changing her mind about the ways of the GD. I mean who would want to give up on a lot of their emotions, we are beings that practically thrive on our emotions, especially for so sensitive people as our emotions can empower our abilities. Rather silly to just disregard it. I am glad that I was able to help. Anakin smiles at Bears. I think you should get going back to your classes. Again, thank you for the help. No problem. Bears left Anakin alone. I think it is time to meet back up with the Night Sisters and my allied corporation, Senior Technologies current CEO. I should also keep visiting Renala, she seems to be coming along nicely, and I should really get to work on that gift I promised Grievous. I do like keeping my promises. What Anakin had been doing was a lot of research into what force-based artifacts he may be able to start producing on his own. He has a few things that he has already created like the specialized necklace meant to block a force-sensitive person from being able to read your thoughts or emotions. He had given one to Padme as he couldn't trust the people around her to keep his secret safe. At least keep the things he told her safe, as he had gotten into a trade agreement with her. Anakin would not want the Sith Lord Sidious to get his hands on Padmore on her thoughts, as it could let Palpatine in on some interesting information. Even though he had only acted like a genius and that would surely raise some flags, but what was the biggest danger was if Palpatine realizes or connects the dots between himself and the ruining of his plans. He does not have to worry too much about others like Grievous or his droids, whether living or not, as his mental protection extends to them via his connection to them. 
The Kader, or at least his version of it doesn't only confer benefits to the user through control, he was able to confer benefits to the living droids as well. It even works for Grievous as his mind is protected through his Mechadera control, he is after all a cyber. Anakin has other plans as well, with there being no more reason to keep his mother on Tatooine, he could move her to another planet like Alderaan, as it is seemingly very peaceful. He is unsure she would want to go and leave the place she had been living him in. But Tatooine is going nowhere, at least Anakin doesn't believe it is anyway. Employees there can handle the operations well enough, and if they are understaffed which would be underestimation of how many people he had freed alongside his mother, then droids could fill in the blanks. They have been doing so for many years now. I think it is time I should visit her then, and set up a meeting up some leaders from the planet of Alderaan, to be let in on the know that she should be respected greatly. The leaders of Alderaan had been notified of his Mordar persona, Vader. He used this to help him leverage himself into getting his own mafia-like organization on the planet, because he planned for his mother to go there to be safe. I mean why would he want his own mother to be safe? Despite all the precautions he took, Anakin knows that Tatooine is in a very unstable political climate, and strife is going to hit just around the corner. The slaves he had saved, the slaves that were runaways, were all getting impatient and wanted to take over Tatooine. He could trust a few of the people over there as he had also given them mind-blocking necklaces, but he doubts they are still ready. Well, soon. The slave rebellion will happen soon, I do have everything I need, so there is no point wasting time. Tatooine. Pitzer Chanchani Banai used to be a human slave boy on Tatooine, and the supposed best friend of Anakin Skywalker, before he left for Coruscant to become a Jedi. After not seeing his smuggler father, Racker Banai, in many years, Kitsu gave up hopes of being rescued from Tatooine, and instead hoped to one day be a majordomo for a wealthy Mos Espen estate. At least it was at first, but then he grew to admire Anakin greatly, so much so he began to imitate everything he did. From the way he talked to his walk. Everything. Kitsu had of course heard of a slave resistance that was very underground. There were rumors that Skywalker Industries was working with the slaves, it was kind of an infamous thing that they held slaves out. Freeing them at all but those were just rumors, at least on the surface. Kissa can say for sure that Skywalker Industries was helping the freed slaves, runaways and other people break their chains. The person at the head of this group. Anakin himself. At that end, Kissa had joined as young as he could to make sure he could help out, as he has great emotional investment, not only because of his deep admiration of Anakin, but also because this subject hit him hard. He didn't enjoy the life of a slave and was born into it just like Anakin was. Kitster had watched as the slave quarters, the district itself had gone through a total renovation, upgrading the lifestyle of those who had decided to stay. A lot did decide to stay on Tatooine, if only to help the rest of the slaves here on Tatooine. Hey Skywalker's fan. Come over here, your help is needed. Most within the resistance had taken to calling him a fan of Anakin, they weren't wrong, but he was both embarrassed and proud of this fact. That he had been widely regarded enough to be known as such is certainly something. Most people did use his actual name, but sometimes the adults just liked to tease him just like all the other kids his age they had decided they wanted to help. A lot had taken inspiration from Anakin while others were brought into the situation because of their circumstances. But one thing is for sure is that things are starting to heat up, Anakin would be coming back to Tatooine, and he was one of the only ones to know it among the other important high-ups. So, Skywalker's coming here to Tatooine. Don't tell the others anything yet. It could cause a commotion. I think it is great he is coming back, he did say and promised to continuously help us. Of course he would, he is our de facto leader. Many adults were talking about various things, specifically the people who had the largest roles to play in the upcoming uprising. Hey Kidster, you feel ready to see Anakin again? With the rate that he was growing, I wouldn't expect him to come back any less grown. One of Kidster's adult friends asked him. Well, yes. It would be interesting to see the changes he has gone through, but from what I understand is that he is going to come in a disguise. That is true, he said something about keeping his identity secret from the Republic. The woman continues. Remind me again, what was Anakin's codename? Vader. His codename is Vader. I believe he is also bringing over some droids to assist us in our takeover. Me too, but I can't really confirm that. Despite such good communications the people here have only had limited training when it comes to military operations. Hopefully Skywalker is bringing those droids. The woman continues. They would help in the preservation of life. That is true. Looking back over to the table of important people, they start to continue their discussions with the plan. Look, does anyone know when Skywalker is coming? Shmai had informed people that her son was coming, and I don't think the boy would be cruel enough to tell his mother he is coming, and then not show up. Yes, of course it is true, but can we be sure that he is to stay with us till the end? Even though Anakin had done a lot he can't help it if not everyone likes him. He could be for all intents and purposes just taking his mother away from the planet, then he would abandon us all here. Left to die or be recaptured as slaves. That is not true. Kitsu decides to speak up in this moment, he had gone through a growth spurt of his own, and is currently 13 years of age, giving him some height, and having enough common sense to make logical judgments. Kitsu may have been a slave and is now only a simple free child, but that didn't mean he was stupid, but it did mean he had very strong emotions to display to the group of adults, arguing over what is to happen. One had gone so far to disparage his friend and slander his good name. Just thinking about the many things Anakin had done for him Kitster should be mad, very mad in fact. Anakin is a good person. The best person and in fact a much better person than you. The man that disdained the boy and had no respect for Anakin interjects. What's it to you boy? 
What is a kid doing here at the adults table anyway? Bob, calm down, it's just a kid. Calm down. Calm down. We are about to go to war with the huts, and you expect me to be lenient with a kid who has barely gotten off of his mother's milk. The man named Bob went a bit too far as Kidster's mother had died while he was a young boy, and in fact had died because of the slavers they were under at the time. Eyes going red, Kidster was enraged, and in a surprising quick dash, he manages to tackle the man to the ground with a surprising amount of strength. No one had noticed the flash of blue light that was emitted from Kidster's small necklace that hung around his neck. The necklaces that Anakin had gifted to many people did more than just protect their minds, and just like the blue stones that he had crafted them from it could give a non-force sensitive individual the ability to use the force, these basic artifacts could in a moment of passion, empower someone physically. Whoa, there. Calm down kid. No need to get violent with the man, we have all had it rough the past few days. Kisser having claimed down lets out a deep breath before saying, Yeah sorry about that. It was just a lack of disrespect and to even go so far as to taint Anakin's name with his pathetic use, it really got to me. Well I respect your guts kid, you should always take in the situation as there is near always a reason for someone's behavior. I guess. A few people have grown in discontent as they now live lives of luxury, and now that their peaceful times are coming to an end because of the upcoming war people can get upset. The man the pulled kidster off of Bob continued. I know Anakin and his mother, Shmai has done a lot for us as they are were slaves themselves at one point, but sometimes people grow resentment for those who help them. People within the background drag Bob off to get some treatment, as the meeting resumes as normal with no more heated tones, but with cold calculations. Why is it so? Why can people not see that Anakin has given us much? I would go so far to say that he has given us a part of himself just to help us out. Kister argues his point. Not everyone see it that way, in fact the few that complain also look at Anakin as he were another slave master himself. That is ridiculous, Kister exclaims out loud. Quiet down kid. The man says to calm Kister back down. I know, I know your point, but the reason for this is that Anakin and his mother also benefit from our labor by working for them. We are paid well enough and are in fact given many choices to where we can leave the planet, with a small sum of Republic credits to start up somewhere else. Kidster then continues. If not and we choose to stay or go to one of the branches off of Tatooine and we are given good, no great accommodations. That doesn't matter to some, they would still try to find blame with Anakin. Not every slave is a good person themselves, even if people don't deserve to suffer slavery, some slaves still deserve some punishment for what they have done or are willing to do. Well. Kidster hesitates as a topic had been brought up that hits close to home. That is true. My mother had died because another slave within our group had killed her off. No one cared. The life of a slave is hard, near impossible to live in any good conditions, and that is why I get it. You anger over Anakin being called out as if he has done something wrong. After a while, the meeting had finished and everyone had gone in their separate directions getting ready, preparing themselves, their family and friends. Everyone around each other is scared for they do not know what is about to happen. What is about to come and there is no telling if they would be successful. There is one thing on Kidster's mind though at this moment. Ani, where are you? Right everything should be ready and from all reports most of Tatooine has gone on a silent lockdown. Anakin had smuggled some droids onto Tatooine to prepare for his arrival. He doesn't know what situation could happen, and there is no telling if the huts had caught on to what was about to go down. It would be better to get my mother off planet first. Anakin had prepared everything for his mother to live a comfortable life, and in fact knew to include the people closest to her like Jira to come along with her. If she were to go to completely different surroundings with nobody she knew Anakin would fear for her mental state. It's okay, she is a strong woman. She has been through a lot and would go through a whole lot more before I can really give her peace of mind. Grievous, you have gotten everything prepared. Anakin communicates to Grievous through his nano suit that he had hooked up with a special network that allows him to communicate with any and everyone he is also connected. Yes, Master Skywalker. Great, now it is time for the two of us to meet up again in real life. I will be meeting you on Tatooine. I will be on my way, Grievous out. Anakin has some more things to do before he can meet up with everyone on Tatooine, and that includes getting permission from the GD Order to have a little trip off planet. Anakin would have to confront either of his masters, probably both into allowing him off-planet for an extended amount of time. Of course he must try and redirect their attention somewhere else, as to make sure they are distracted and deal with something else. He had set up something specifically for the council to be on alert about, something that would put not only them, but at the same time simultaneously Sidious as well. Even if the Jedi find out why he is going to Tatooine, they would not be able to connect the dots that he is Vader. But if Sidious finds out he would want to investigate in depth what had happened, and this could go badly for him, despite the preparations he had made in the event, something like that was to happen. Anakin had sent not just any type of droid under his control to Tatooine, he had sent his elite droids, the living droids, capable of using the force as a frontline to stall the inevitable, while he makes his way over. If everything is going according to plan he should be able to leave the temple unnoticed, if not he has backup plans and storing this his absence is noted. Day cycle, Coruscant. Anakin had steadily made his way out of the GD temple, and had gotten a ship for himself to take him to Tatooine. Which ship? The one he had originally stole from Mole. I do not know the specifics of what happened to him, all I know is he has survived and didn't have his entire body cut in half. He is still probably mad, and his hate will fuel his power just as the dark side always does. Boarding the ship he now controls before anyone would notice his absence, he takes off into the atmosphere getting ready to use hyperspace. Let's set coordinates for Tatooine. 
Back within the temple the Jidi were none the wiser about what was to happen at commence. Qui-Gon was having a relaxing day so far that he had some free time to catch up with his old apprentice Obi-Wan. Hey, my not so young former apprentice. Master. Obi-Wan exclaimed surprised at the visit from his master, it wasn't often he had gotten to see him. Obi-Wan had missions of his own to go on after the GD High Council had decided he could officially become a knight. I just thought I would check up on you. How you have been, what have you been doing, these types of things. Not much. Obi-Wan says, but Qui-Gon was expecting a different answer. Okay, maybe I have been doing a lot, but now I have the freedom to do things on my own to prove myself. You do not have to prove yourself to anyone, anymore Obi-Wan. I know, I just feel like I had gotten the promotion simply because I did a mission I felt I barely did anything in. That is not true and you know it. You succeeded where I failed. I would go so far as to say, before Qui-Gon could finish a disturbance could be felt throughout the temple. Well, I guess there is some trouble to get to. Set coordinates for Tatooine. Enter hyperspace. Anakin says out loud towards the ship. It activates its hyperdrives and zooms past the lots of other ships entering Coruscant. Anakin speeds towards Tatooine as fast as he can. Let the games begin. Opening up his mental connection to the droids on Coruscant, meant to act as a distraction, he commands them to start the attack on the GD temple. What Anakin is doing is ensuring that the GD are on the lookout for droids that have gone rogue. He wouldn't be doing anything dangerous, but he needed some type of distraction to take away from the fact he had left. He knows Qui-Gon and Mace would not be too worried about him, especially since he had shown the capabilities of the Nanosuit that his achieved symbiosis with is capable of. It is able to resist a full-on blow from a lightsaber, of course the material used to have this effect is Beskar. The very rare material the Mandalorians are obsessed about. I would be too if I needed more of this stuff, but for now there is no need. Anakin had his Vader suit ready within the ship so he could change at any time, but when he arrives on Tatooine, he would come as Anakin Skywalker, visiting his mother before leaving to Alderaan. Supposedly this will be the official story, but he will in actuality stay behind to help the slaves and the droids take over the planet. Grievous would be tagging along as well as he has a desire to spill some blood. Sometimes the loss of life is necessary. I chose the lesser of two evils in this instance. One droid in particular he did not include in the fight against the Huts was his very first living droid, HK-47, because his task was to protect his mother and protect his mother it would. For all intents and purposes, HK-47 had grown attached to the woman and started to see her as his grandmother. A little jarring to Anakin, but he guessed it made sense considering HK thinks itself his child. It isn't really wrong to think like that either, he had created HK so he would take on that mantle, and hope to become a good figure for HK to follow his footsteps in. Anakin hoped to do that with his future biological children as well. Anakin didn't plan for the uprising to be a long siege, he had planned for it to be over rather quickly. That is if everything goes to plan. Opening up his communications device, Anakin calls Grievous. Master. You called. Yes. I was wondering if you had made it to Tatooine yet. Yes, the locals have a bit of an eye problem, but other than that everything has been going to plan. There has been some movement though from the huts. That's not a good sign. Tell me exactly what they are doing. For now they have just bolstered up their forces. It is steadily increasing though, and I fear we may need to bring in more droids to handle the situation. The lead are pretty good, but I don't think they would be capable of making it to Jabba the Hutt. That is a good point. For now we will monitor the situation and if it gets any worse, I will have to call in for some backup when the situation worsens. Has there been any other movements? Not really. I haven't made my way over to the district your mother lives in and gone to the slave rebellion's main headquarters here, so I am unsure on their end other than the sparse communications given the day prior. Right, you best be on your way then, and make sure not to cause too much trouble and draw unnecessary attention to yourself. You got it. Grievous's cyber laughter could be heard before the call was cut. Mentally sighing Anakin thinks to himself. Grievous will get me in trouble one of these days, I just hope it is not today. Exiting hyperspace Anakin within Maul stolen, he means commandeered ship arrives just outside of the Tatooine system. I am surprised that they have not started monitoring space yet if they have caught on or it is that they believe they are safe to stay, thinking I did not come prepared. That could be their downfall. Landing once again on the sandy desolate planet of Tatooine Anakin thinks to himself in this moment. Home sweet home. Then continues. I think it is time to surprise my mother, but before that get someone to transport my Vader suit elsewhere before I leave with my mother to Alderaan. Walking around the streets of Mos Espa Anakin reminisces about his time here on Tatooine, as it had felt so long ago he had come to this planet. Nostalgia. Integrate. Delving into the Force Anakin starts to send out a pulse through the Force to locate where his mother may be. In the store. Of course. Smiling Anakin heads to the direction of the storefront. Skywalker Technologies. Entering he could hear his mother's voice call out from the counter. Anakin looks over to see she has her head done concentrated on something, probably one of her projects meant to help others. Welcome to Skywalker Technologies, how can I sh my pauses as she looks up with surprise clearly seen on her face. Anakin. My Ani, you have come. Excited she drops what she is doing and rushes over to her child, who now towers over her at a staggering 1.8 meters tall, and his physical growth is yet to stop. Anakin opens his arms wide, knowing she is rushing him with the intent to hug him. She wraps her arms around him, and Anakin can't help but get a little emotional. Damn, I have been hit by the feels. Hello, mother. I am back. His mother starts to spitfire question it in one after the other, with no time to consider her own breath. So much to say and talk about, but so little time to do so. 
Yes, yes. Calm down mother, I have something to tell you. What is it Ani? You have to leave Tatooine for a little while, and I have set up a place on Alderaan for you and Jira to move into. Obviously Shmai knows more about the slave rebellion than she lets on. Is that why I have come? To fight with the others. How do you know that? Now look here, I may not be as smart as you, but I can do some investigating on my own. I guess I shouldn't have underestimated the extent to which she knows of my shenanigans. Mother sure are scary. It is true, I am to be the face of the uprising here. To lead them to freedom. It's dangerous, I can't allow it. Within the Republic you are safe but out here anything could happen. And that is why I am insisting that you go with Jira to Alderaan. By now the two are not hugging anymore and simply a few centimeters apart from each other. But Anakin, I am sorry mother for interrupting you, but for your safety I think that I will have to forcefully remove you from Tatooine. Anakin states as Shmai looks confused. C-3PO, come out and escort my mother to the ship and get her to Alderaan. Yes master. I can most certainly help you out with this, and I assume I will be needing to get Lady Jira as well. Correct, I assume you know the way. I am the protocol droid my master has made. C-3PO responds in a snarky tone. Okay, okay. Get on with it then. Before Anakin forgets he also mentally tells HK-47 to be on the ship along with C-3PO and Jira. I am sorry mother, just know that I love you, and that everything will be alright. You just have to trust in me. Shmai stares into her son's eyes looking for something, but in her heart, she knows he will be fine just as he was all those years ago, going off who knows where. She had accepted that her child could make his own decisions at that point, even if she did not like it. Fine. I will go, just promise me you won't get hurt. I promise. Anakin replies. Shmai leaves along with C-3PO with reluctance, and before she goes she also says. I love you as well. Now that everything had been taken care of he needs to make his way to the slave resistance headquarters hidden away within the former slave district, turned Skywalker district. That is right the district that used to be called the slave district, is now called by Anakin's last name in memory of his actions, what he represents, and in the fact he owns the land. Back with the GD on Coruscant they are currently experiencing a disturbance to their day-to-day -day normal lives. A lot of people are rushing back and forth through the hallways of the Grand GD Temple. Younglings, Padawans, Knights and all sorts were moving around going to areas that were either safe or heading in the direction of the trouble. Well, I guess there is some trouble to get to. Obi-Wan says where he left off last. What are we waiting for, let's go. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan start dashing through the hallways infusing themselves with the force to accelerate their approach towards the trouble. Why would anyone be brave enough to attack the temple? Obi-Wan questions out loud. That is not the questions you should be asking, it is how is good enough to get past many of the security measures put in place to cause this trouble in the first place. Qui-Gon says. Coming across several people, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan happen to chance upon a scene where GD Master Mace Windu had cut down a droid. Master Windu, what is going on here? Qui-Gon questions. Well, from what I can tell some droids have started to attack throughout the temple in many different areas. People have been dispatched or been sent to areas that are considered safe. Droids. Oh droids here. Obi-Wan continues. Why would droids attack here? They must have someone commanding them. That is the thing, we can't seem to trace the signal, even though we have the home base advantage here. Windu replies. Have you already tried to establish why the attack is happening? No one would attack the GD without a reason. I don't know, but I fear that this could be connected to the mysterious warrior you two faced on Naboo. We weren't able to uncover the identity of the person who attacked other than it was a Sith. Windu continues. We just didn't know which one, whether that be the master you two had taken care of or the apprentice. They always come in twos. Qui-Gon states. True, now we need to make sure to take care of all the droids. In fact the situation right now cannot be considered dire, as for some reason the droids are not aiming to kill anyone. There has been no deaths. Yes, only minor injuries to adults mostly while the younglings were left alone. That is interesting. Only one says. Yes, but for now we got no time to waste we should get to other areas. Mace leads the group. The now three GD run through the GD temple going to multiple locations, but the droids never end. If they are dispatched to one location and take care of them they are then sent to another. Well this is not a fun experience. Obi-Wan thought to himself. They have no end, surely by now we should have cut down their number for now. Maybe, but whoever is behind this attack doesn't seek to truly hurt anyone, and could very well be a distraction. Mace says. Qui-Gon then questions. A distraction it may be, but for what? Obi-Wan strikes down another droid, and he has started to get annoyed by this point. Everyone is safe, it just seems like these things don't pose a threat at all. That is the thing Obi-Wan, we don't know where the real threat could come from, so taking care of all the droids is our only option at this moment. Within another area of the temple a youngling was thinking of her friend. Ani, where are you? Barris had been evacuated along with the rest of the other younglings separated into their clan areas, being kept safe by Jidi, who had been keeping guard over them. Hello. It was at this moment Barris notices a little girl talk to her. Why, hello. Bending down she gets a closer look at her. My name is Ahsoka Tano, who are you? The inquisitive little Tegrita asks Barris. Deciding to entertain the girl and keep her mind off of things humors her. Well, my name is Barris. Barisofi. Will you be my friend? Friend. Sure I can be your friend. As Barris replies, Ahsoka's face lights up at her declaration. Are you a Padawan? You seem powerful. Not yet, I am not. I have yet to take the trials and gain the recognition of a master. I am hoping to have one though. Really. But you already have a master, do you not? No. What are you talking about? 
That other boy, his name is his name is the name stuck on her tongue Ahsoka tries to remember. Are you talking about Anakin? Yes, doesn't he teach you? Well, that may be true, but he is not my master simply because he helps me out. The mind switching fast, Ahsoka then asks another question. Can Anakin be my friend too? I am sure he wouldn't mind being friends with you. Cool. He's cool. Ahsoka exclaims in childlike excitement while Barris thinks to herself. Great another fan of Anakin's. Grievous had landed on the home planet of his master, and was walking through the streets of Mos Espa, trying to be as low profile as possible. But considering his height, Grievous could also see various species native to Tatooine scurrying around. If I remember correctly those are the Jawas, and the others are referred to as Tusken Raiders. These creatures would come in handy when locking down on the huts, and in fact played a large role in Anakin's information network here on Tatooine. Who would care for unimposing creatures such as them? Especially the Jawa with them having set up shop on some of Anakin's territories, allowing him to the ins and outs of the criminals here. A lot of the time he is able to get pretty benign information, but sometimes it helps. With the rebellion about to start there would be key as he had them infiltrate Jabba's palace. Jabba was immensely satisfied with their jester-like nature. Grievous comes into the now named Skywalker district, as sees the people that were a part of the public company known as Skywalker Industries. Many faces that had once been impoverished, many people whom had a chip implanted inside their body now are removed. Their chains removed, free people. Free beings that could live their lives any way they wanted. Grievous had come to appreciate freedom and liberty himself, as he has seen the atrocities committed, and some he had done himself. Skywalker really does good, spending all that time on Dathomir must have made my perspective on life quite bleak. Grievous spent most of his time on Dathomir around the dark side and its energy. It does slowly warp one's sense of being, but one does not truly lose themselves to the dark side. It is just that another part of them comes out from the embrace, and Grievous was a wiser man than he once was before. Coming to another planet like Tatooine that is seeped in a large amount of dark side energy, because of the residual hate, anger and desperation of the people that lives here, certainly makes itself known. Being force sensitive does have its ups, but Grievous had also come to learn the negatives as well. In general the areas where Skywalker's touch has influenced there is a sort of balance. This balance is something forming a bond between the light and the dark, as if one could not be separated without the other. Anakin had once told him some wise words of his own. The code of the Jedi is flawed, but that does not mean the Sith code is any better as well. Both will lead to the extremes of either side, and I believe there is a balance to be struck between the two. There is both chaos and harmony. Both peace and war because within chaos there is order, and within order there is chaos. Anakin then continued. For every action there is an equal reaction. It is simple laws of physics whether they be applied to the physical world, or otherwise be applied to the mind of the spirit. Everything has some connection despite the total randomness of everything. What Anakin had said to him had struck an accord as many things that had happened and can happen has consequences. His own actions have led him to this point, but so has the actions of others indirectly moved him. Truly I have become enlightened. I may just start calling myself a Jedi now. Grievous has now come across the secret entrance to enter the base, he enters the special code by first knocking on the door. Yes. Someone answers from the other side. With his gruff voice aided by the systems to vocalize his voice, Grievous replies. How much wood could a witcher chuck, if a witcher could chuck wood? As much wood as a witcher could chuck, if a witcher could chuck wood. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. The voice from the other side answers back Grievous' sighs within his mind before continuing with the silly code sequence. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers, a pack of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked, if Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Where's the pack of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked? Good. The voice goes quiet for a bit before the door opens where the person from behind the door reveals themselves. A female Twilak who seemed to be around 15 years of age, started to gesture towards Grievous. What are you waiting for? Hurry up and come in. The name's Trell Barad, by the way. Right, if you would excuse me. Grievous had learned and adapted so he had proper manners. Walking in Grievous was then guided down to the basement of the house, but where they were really going was the true entrance to the underground facilities that has housed the resistance. Trella asks Grievous because he was mostly silent and did not reply to her. So, what is your name? Just call me Grievous. Grievous, uh. Okay, sure, I can do that. So are you here to help out? I haven't seen you around here before. Yes, you could say I have come to Tatooine to help with the rebellion. Trella raises her eyebrows. So you're an outlander then? You could say that. Know anyone around these parts? Not really, I only know of a couple of people, and it is mainly because of them that I'm here. That is fine, as long as you're willing to help out. Trilla smiles before saying. I am needed elsewhere right now, but you can interact with anyone here and see what you could do to help. Grievous pauses before saying in an unsure tone. Sure bye bye, I got to go back and man the door. Wouldn't want anyone else not affiliated with us to get in. Grievous looks around contemplating his situation. What am I to do now? Back with Anakin he had gone back to the Skywalker residence within the Skywalker district going unnoticed because of the invisibility feature that came from his name suit. Looking around the home he had helped to build he becomes nostalgic once again. Truly. I guess I had missed this place. Anakin enters making no sound whatsoever, and begins to move towards the package left behind. A large crate had been placed within Anakin's childhood home. It is time to become Vader. Using the force to open the crate from the outside, what is revealed is the infamous dark black suit of Vader. Anakin connects with his droids on Coruscant, creating a distraction for him, and decides he may want to troll a certain individual. 
It would not pose much risk to try something against Palpatine. Seeing through the visual perception of the droid, Anakin could see that the temple had been evacuated to the innermost safest areas. There were hardly anyone present and through the sound base perceptors on the droid, he could just hear off into the distance the firing of blasters and a hum of a lightsaber. I guess they have started to respond properly to the attack. Maybe this would serve as some sort of wake-up call, but I doubt it, as not even the incident with Geonosis had changed the GD. Simultaneously Anakin puts on his suit as he becomes a spectator of what is happening in the temple. Hopefully I have not caused much distress, I only need a distraction. As Anakin is putting on Vader's mask and helmet, multiple figures rush over from another direction. Are those? Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Mace had come into his view allowing him to see that they had not been roughed up, but were disheveled and heavily breathing due to exhaustion. Master Qui-Gon, Master Winder. There are some droids over there. Obi-Wan calls out. I got this. Mace ignites his saber into action and dashes across the room towards the droid Anakin is in control of. Deciding to test his skills out on the three GD, Anakin controls the droid to move away from the attack. Mace misses in confusion could be seen across his face. What? How did you do that? Getting old now Master Windu. Mace Harems then states. Not that old but this droid in particular is weird, I think we should destroy it to get the night quite gone. Obi-Wan you shall take care of the rest of the droids, then join us. On it. Obi-Wan dashes up towards the other droids within the air. Okay. Qui-Gon and Mace jump into action swinging their sabers in the hopes of destroying the droid Anakin is in control of. This is my chance to distract the Supreme Chancellor as well. Anakin enhances the droid from all the way over on Tatooine to increase its capabilities, but most importantly his speed. Quick, get after it. Qui-Gon yells out and starts to chase along with Mace behind him. The special droid Qui-Gon and Mace chase after starts to gain ground as it is running towards the exit of the GD temple, and the same thought passes through their minds. What the hell is this thing? Anakin, controlling the droid, decides to see if he can make it to where the Chancellor may be to give him a surprise, and take his attention from whatever he is doing to the current predicament. By now he should have noticed or been informed about what is happening within the temple. This should be interesting. Anakin now within his Vader persona, begins to cloud his presence, and to chance the essence of his aura, making it much darker in alignment with the dark side. His pure blue eyes have now turned the deep glowing yellow eyes that give off negative emotions. This is never that fun to do. Anakin has been experimenting with force alignment, and has been switching back and forth between the two. As Anakin here presents the light side of the force, while as Vader, he has the passion of the dark side seeping through his being. Quickly it is moving towards the Senate building. Mace calls out from behind Qui-Gon. Anakin continuously has his mind at two places at once, and can split his consciousness within multiple directions, would be unhindered and can still work at full capacity, as his mind-based force training has paid off the more time passes. With the droid, Anakin moves its mechanical parts as fast as he can, zooming towards where he can somewhat sense Sidious' force presence. Calling Gru 2 of droids on Corskin now is the time to make your way towards Sidious. Anakin mentally calls out and activates the other droids in place. With the mace stops himself from saying more. There is more of them, where do they keep coming from? And why are they headed towards the Senate building? Is it an attempt at causing chaos? Qui-Gon says just out of the droid Anakin is controlling hearing range. I thought we had established the reason already. Mace then continues. It is meant to work as a distraction, but for who or what, I do not know. At least it is what I believe now. Maybe we shouldn't be following this droid around. It sure beats doing nothing as this droid is the only one acting differently. That is true, let's continue. Qui-Gon then says out loud, so the droid's hearing sensors can pick up what he is saying. Whoever is controlling the droids, I suggest you stop what you are doing and peacefully hand yourself over. The droid's mechanical synthesized voice is heard. Peace was never an option. So be it. Mace says as he speeds up trying to get the droid. Back on Tatooine, Anakin has become fully suited within and is now making his way to the uprising hideout. This time he is not invisible, but tries to discreetly exit the Skywalker residence without being seen. Despite the heavy suit weighing him done, Anakin is easily able to maneuver himself within it. After getting to a safe distance to finally reveal himself, he starts to walk the street of Mos Espa, as the sons of Tatooine are finally setting and night time rolls around. His humongous frame causes a lot of people still out and about step away from him. His very presence scaring those closest with an invisible barrier no one wishes to cross into. To overcome evil, sometimes you must become evil yourself. Fortunately the only people out at night time were either children living off of the streets, looking to make a quick buck or criminal scum doing the same, but are willing to do things that are much more worse. Move. A simple statement is set from behind the mask Anakin speaks through, and it scares the person who had been brave enough to approach him. You think you fool me, don't you? All big and tough hiding behind that armor of yours. I bet you can't even take a hit. Deciding to give a last warning before making his way, Anakin states again while increasing the pressure he exerts on the drunken man. Move, or you will be dealt with. The breathing behind Anakin's mask starts to terrify the man as he feels that somehow he is heavier. Before much else can happen though, someone makes their way towards him. What is this? I am sorry sir, but my father has had too much to drink for the night. Please forgive him. The young lad comes out to aid his drunken father. He should lay off the drinks, he could hurt someone. Pausing for dramatic effect Vader then continues. Or he could be hurt himself. The young lad gulps. Yes sir, I will keep that in mind and will make sure my father does too. 
With a flick of his wrist, Anakin decides to make his exit more dramatic by controlling his cape to billow with the wind. Vader had entered Ben's secret underground base with no one to stop his descent, making sure that he keeps his presence subdued and not outright scared the people below. Looking around Vader tries to see if he could find Grievous knowing he had arrived ahead of him. After a few minutes of looking around while no one really questioned his being here as they were all busy doing something else, Vader managed to find Grievous. Funnily enough he had been entertaining some small children whose parents had left them stay within the safest area of the base. Stop that. Grievous declares while being dogpiled by the children who were laughing and having a good time whilst their surroundings were chaotic. Let's see here. Delving into the force Anakin starts to locate the more important people to his plan, if they are present or not within the underground base. Most of everyone is here, that is good. Now it is time to make my grand appearance. Anakin had become the founder of the resistance all those years ago, and helped keep the funding for them alive with all sorts of other things to help them passively and defensively, while he built up an attack force capable of taking on the entirety of the huts. Today he had come as Vader, the supposed mysterious co-creator of the slave rebellion. All those years ago he had created a plan to further disguise himself, so that the GD would not investigate this rebellion much. They may question his involvement, but he could play it off as him being compassionate for his fellow slaves, and former slaves. With Vader he would just say this persona was the person whom had helped his mother and himself to free themselves from slavery. A quote-unquote mysterious figure who was very powerful. The GD may want to investigate this person, given he would have an entire force, an entire army of droids at his disposal, but anything they investigate would lead to dead ends. The same would happen if Palpatine tried to investigate as well. Grievous. Vader says. Startled, Grievous jumps from his annoyed state to battle ready within an instant, which also startles the children. Who? Calm down, Grievous. It is I, Vader. On cue, Grievous looks at the disguised Anakin and lowers his guard. Right, right. Sorry about that, you have startled me. Now that I am here, I have something to tell everyone about what is to happen. How we are to free the slaves here on Tatooine, and how we are to get Jabba to hand over his rights as ruler of this planet to us. Vader's modulated voice doesn't outright terrify the children, but they do seem intimidated. I believe we should take this conversation elsewhere. Vader looks around at the small children. Come Grievous, we start tonight. Everyone had been gathered around, the most important to the least within the upcoming battle. Vader stood at the forefront with Grievous by his side. Here, as you can see is the special device that was created for the sole purpose of disabling any and all enslavement-based equipment throughout Tatooine. Vader presents on nerves quite a few individuals. Specifically it would target everyone within every settlement here on Tatooine. All slaves with an implanted ship will not have to worry about their escape, as they would live and not be blown to bits and pieces. Vader continues. Sir, I have a question. Someone speaks up from the crowd. You may ask. Where is Anakin? Did he not say he was to come? There was a mistake in the communications, Anakin Skywalker was only to come here to pick up his mother, and do a few more other things before leaving for Alderaan. Some are confused but accept the answer while someone stands up in rage. No. I refuse to believe that. It was none other than Bob, the man that had been beaten down by Kitster earlier. Injured, angry and frustrated due to a factor of situations, but the man in a bad place, and he acts out on his anger. Skywalker said he would help us. Be here with us when we went to war. Bob then continues. Where is our savior now? Deciding to further cover his own tracks, Vader redirects the man's outrage by stating something that would blow their minds, even if it was a half-truth. I am the one who saved Anakin and Shmai Skywalker all those years ago. The room goes silent at that declaration. That is right, all those years ago it was me that had decided to intervene, believing that enough was enough. Vader then continues. For a long, long time the people had suffered here on Tatooine and I saw to it that I should make a change. For too long had I sit back and did nothing when I had the power to change something. The day has come, and that day is today. The crowd resonates with his statements and begin to nod their heads along with him. Vader continues his speech. Anakin Skywalker is an intelligent boy capable of many things, but he was just a child and still is. For many of you here to put the burden of a resistance, the burden of hundreds of thousands, no millions to billions of people on him is wrong. You all now must stand up and reclaim your freedom. Even Grievous had been affected by Vader's words, not knowing the power of persuasion Anakin had cultivated over the years. Tonight, I will go in with my droids to confront the huts, and in doing so will declare that this criminal empire will be no more, and another shall rise in its place. Far greater than any other, allowing all people, all races protection, a stable economy, and above all also freedom. This will be a day long remembered. It will see the end of slavery here on Tatooine. It will soon see the end to the restriction of your freedom and those all over the galaxy. At the epitome of his speech Vader finishes. If you do not see the benefits to regaining your freedom and only see yourselves helpless in the situation to come, I will be here. The crowd erupts into a chant of his name, and within the chaos Grievous manages to say something to Vader. Are you sure everything is going to go alright? Vader using one of his signature catchphrases replies. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Out on the dune seas of Tatooine. At the gates of Jabba's palace, a figure clad in deep and dark black armor within the dark night, makes its way towards the palace. Beside this figure many droids could be seen walking around it surrounding it like a shield, as the group advances to the palace. The black figure within its suit approaches the gates where there are no guards outside. With a wave of the figure's hand the doors automatically open. It is best that I keep my force abilities hidden throughout the entirety of the takeover. 
Anakin thought within his head as he slowly walked down the hallways leading deeper inside to Jabba's throne room. Along the way some droids behind the entrance wall within his Vader suit, Anakin travels down the long corridors, but is interrupted by the guards stationed all throughout. Gamorreans were ever after finishing off all of the Gamorreans were of course he had only stunned them not outright killing them, as he deemed it unnecessary because they were just employed guards. Grievous comes from behind Vader, and sees the many unconscious bodies just laying on the floor piled up. I guess they did not want to talk then. When I got to them, we got into aggressive negotiations. Aggressive negotiations. I am guessing it is not peaceful. Sure it is, I just negotiate through some physical force as peacefully as possible. Grievous falls a step behind Vader as they both enter the metaphorical tiger's den, while leaving the droids outside to deal with any other intrusions. Some other droids went throughout Jabba's palace to look for imprisoned slaves or others who might be in need of some rescuing. Within Jabba's throne room there was a variety of people and things on display. Jabba would entertain guests in his throne room, which also had a live band led by the infamous Max Rebo. The style of the music currently being played was done by a band, called the Max Rebo Band, which was currently displaying their skills in the arts, performing jizz-style music. Quite a strange name for a music genre, but maybe that is just me. Vader thought to himself. Most of the people within didn't even notice Vader walk in and continued with whatever they were doing. Most of the people present within the throne room were criminal scum, some with the worst of the worst records, but Jabba doesn't care for that. Gamorreans surround the exits and entrances, but don't do anything much except identify threats and try to subdue them. Unfortunately they aren't the best in keeping a force sensitive who has the ability to alter their minds through a mind trick and allow passage. The GD mind trick may be a bit dangerous, but I cannot deny its usefulness. A huge subterranean complex existed under the palace. The complex included Jabba's throne room, workshops, animal pens, Jabba's sail barge, and spice farms. While Lanakin and Grievous were making themselves at home the droids sent below were exploring and discovering the various things Jabba likes to collect. His animals, spice farms and most important at least Anakin were the workshops. Slaves were probably sent down to these areas to work laboriously. Jabba's palace was a monastery that belonged to the Bomber Order, a religious community who believed in isolating themselves from all physical stimuli to enhance their mental powers. The earliest parts of the monastery were underground, and included a mine. Anakin could tell from the left of pieces of the past, that this place used to not be as ugly as it was now. After taking over the monastery, Jabba had it further fortified by master armors. After presenting the hut with the bill for their services, the set armors became the first prisoners of the crime lord. Despite having designed them all, they were never able to escape the thick walls and cruel traps of the palace. Anakin had deemed that these master armors were to be made to atone for their sins, by becoming free with some restrictions, specifically by helping the people here have enough homes constructed. After that had been done, they were free to leave. He would obviously pay them for their services, time and effort, but if they didn't work then they should be held accountable for working with the criminal empire, specifically run by Jabba. From what he understood they had done everything of their own free will, and by that standard their actions should have consequences, which is why the punishment was not as severe as it could have been. In fact now that I think about it, they have basically already suffered and been punished for whatever had happened when they chose to help Jabba. Karma to the force in this instance seems to work in mysterious ways. Anakin changes his mind and would just let the workers get off scot-free, as they had already no doubt paid the time for their crimes. I would like to request an audience with the great Jabba the Hutt. Vader's modulated voice echoes throughout the room as he makes himself known. Grievous stays in the back watching on to intervene in case anything happens. I most humbly wish for an audience with one so great such as yourself. I have come to you with a proposition you must not refuse. A few Gamorians here and there start to encircle Vader, as the crowd watches in anticipation about what is to happen. It would be most wise of you to heed my words. Vader starts to increase the feel of his presence within the Force mech and everyone within the room feel uneasy. Acho Penki. Who are you? Jabba speaks in his native tongue. The master has asked you a question. Who are you? Jabba's servant, Bib Fortuna, helps translate for Vader. Vader breaths in and out which creates a resonating sound throughout the room. I am Vader, and I have come here with a humble request. Jabba starts to laugh in a deep gruff tone. Chupa will keep bargain. Some kind of bargain. The master asks what is this deal you have come here for? I want you to free all the slaves you own, to change the laws under your rule to better the society and people who come under you. Jabba starts to laugh again, this time in amusement. But panic he won't be resistance. You are a part of the resistance. Jabba points to Vader. Sunto and Kel P. Capture and kill him. The Gamorians that were surrounding him started to move in as the crowd now starts to go wild at the entertainment. That didn't last very long. At least Jabba doesn't have his special pit created yet. Grievous behind jumps into action and speaks into a communication device. It's a go. Negotiations have failed, and a hut can now be either chased away, or if his captured can be ransomed. The reason Vader had decided that if he is able to capture Jabba, it would be best to just sell him off back to somewhere else, because the huts will just keep on coming. They are like a hydra, if one were to die, ten more would take his place. We copy. Is everything ready and set for the EMP? Vader joins in on the conversation using his inbuilt nanosuit communications network. Roger, everything is set. We are now only waiting on the go. Vader dodges the Gamorreans knocking most of them out in the process of now leaving the palace. It is go. It is go. And with that allowance a massive shift is felt by everyone as the air feels like static. 
Everyone pauses as the power goes done for a second before it is restored, and with confused expressions, look around to what would have happened. Time to free some slaves. Anakin then says out loud within his Vader persona. Everyone who you had enslaved and had allowed to be enslaved have now been freed. Start broadcast. Anakin had set up not only the special device meant to target the slave implants, but also a grand projector over everywhere possible, so that everyone would be informed of what had just happened. This was done to ensure that the people who were enslaved and those who wanted to help come stand up and escape, because now would be the time. Vader being uninterrupted while running outside of Jabba's palace, started up the broadcast system set in place. Residents of Tatooine, the slaves, the locals, the criminals, the scum and villainy. I have come here today to set a precedent among the Outer Rims. Vader in his modulated voice continues. For a long time many have been plagued by famine, by conflict and economic downturn. Your freedoms and liberties stripped from your being or your being extorted because of the crime allowed here in the Outer Rims. Allowed here on Tatooine are things that should not be allowed. The restriction of your individuality. I say no more. Break your chains and rise up. Rise up and no more have to be ordered, to be used as amusement or entertainment for your masters, because they are no more than the same as you. As every other being that is living. Everyone here shall know freedom and those who were the tormentors, the oppressors shall be exiled from this planet, from this system. Vader cut the transmission after saying one more thing. I have declared that Jabba the Hutt is incompetent so he shall be overthrown. Chaos erupted within the various settlements across Tatooine, with the capital of the planet being this most perilous. People that had slaves were now having to fight them of or trying to calm them down over what was just said. Not all slaves were as brave and obediently followed their master's orders even after the broadcasts were shown. To reassure the more passive of the bunch, Anakin had miniature broadcasts running throughout displaying how and when others were rescued or freed. Grievous and Vader did not have to deal with much attention after everything had begun with Jabba leaving through an escape spaceship that he could have held back but didn't. There were no slaves on board with them abandoning near everything, and everyone after the realization hit that they had no chance. Within the atmosphere, Vader had called on his droid army to create a blockade around the planet, but instead of stopping those who were leaving, he only intends to stop those who would like to enter. I think our time would be best used to help calm down the chaos within Mos Espa. Grievous states. That sounds like a great idea. Vader agrees. The two head off and jump onto their own speeders to make their way back to the capital of Tatooine. Out within the streets of Mos Espa, Vader had made his way there. War, war never changes. A lot of criminals had been starting to band together to start factions to start to gain control within the streets of Mos Espa. Unfortunately for the most if not all of the buildings and land had been owned by either Anakin overtly or secretly. Criminal scum would not be able to hold up in much places, but there was an area everyone, at least those who were in on the action gravitated towards. Droids were seen evacuating people, specifically those considered defenseless and were only recently freed. Confident slaves had made a break for it, but there were some held back, and that was what the droids were there for. To access and eliminate any threat that could harm innocents and thankfully within their programming, they are able to identify who were what would be considered enemies from allies and neutral people. A large amount of records had been kept through Anakin's network, that every droid was able to connect to, allowing them to be efficient in the capture and seizure of individuals that were in the wrong. Vader was not after everyone who had done wrong on this planet, especially since it would take too long to get all of them in one swoop, so he had specifically set his droids on a path to hunt down slavers. They were his primary target after all. A few people are shot down as Vader uses his powers to subdue people creating even more chaos, but that is only natural. He cannot save everyone. It was foolish for the original to think he could. Sufferings happens every minute, every second and people die. Lots of people and what Anakin wants to do is try to create an empire free from the sufferings people experience. But he isn't perfect, and mistakes can happen just as it does for everyone else. Vader notices a small commotion happening a distance away from him. Father no. Don't be stupid, put the gun away or you'll get us killed. Shut it boy, these slaves need helping. I may be a drunkard, but even I know what is right from wrong, and I have had enough. But father. Enough boy. I didn't tell you this but, your mother was a slave. Specifically she was a runaway that was fortunate enough to not have that damnable implant stuck into her, and when she died giving birth to you, I promised to raise you right. The drunken man Vader had encountered the night prior was speaking towards his son. As she was a slave. The lad asks confused. Yes, and I think it is time I avenged her. She was so broken and beat down that it was a miracle she gave you to me. The man tears up and then his expression morphs into anger. I will help these people. For they are like my own, and are in fact a part of my life and yours. You stay at home boy, don't go getting hurt now. Well that was an interesting piece of information, but I should probably get everything settled and round up all of the slavers first. Other criminals will probably go into hiding or leave the planet. Both are good enough for me, for now at least. Anakin thought to himself. Mose Aisley Cantina, Chaman Spaceport Cantina. While all the chaos was going on, a ragtag band of criminal scum had banded together to defeat the rebellious slaves. Not all criminals were stupid enough to group together like that, since they had seen the carnage brought down upon villains would resist resisted arrest. Hanging around a group of rowdy individuals would not do them any good, and most certainly prolong the inevitable. Chaman's Spaceport Cantina, also known as Chaman's, Chaman's Cantina, double CCC by the city militia, the Mos Eisley Cantina or simply the Cantina, was a popular drinking and dining establishment located in the city of Mos Eisley on the desert world of Tatooine. 
Now it had become overrun with slavers with their hired mercenaries, combat droids of the like helping them defend themselves against the incoming slur. The owners of the bar have probably left not wanting to deal with what happens next. Hey, help out over here, there are more droids coming from the front. Coming from the front, what the person was cut off from the sound of an explosion that rocked the building. Great, just great. Stupid lowlife slaves rising up against us, they're betters. I was just in the middle of enjoying myself with one of my own before being interrupted. Shut up, no one cares. Right now we have hell to pay and the devil has come knocking. The rowdy bunch were frightened while the intelligent had tried to leave, but were captured and rounded up elsewhere, while the stupid holdouts were able to hold off for a bit longer. They very well might not live to see another day. After a while things seemed to calm down, hours passed by with not a sound, but the distant echoes of screams and cries from men and a few women. What did you think all slavers were men? Slowly the people within the cantina had held out long enough, had destroyed enough droids that had come after them to take a long needed respite. The wind starts to pick up from the outside, the howls start to become unbearably loud, and a deep breath could be heard. Modulated, synthesized, computerized and unnatural in this sound, did it slowly make its way forward. What is that? Someone shouts. Quiet you idiot. Another snaps at the idiot that made noise. From within everyone slowly starts to see a figure step out of the howling winds that brought up a cloud of dust. Hulk and Black barely able to see anything or make out any features, but as it approaches they start to feel something. Something deep inside themselves telling them to run, to hide. To make sure the devil doesn't see them, doesn't hear them. The wind starts to become much more bearable and quiet, the dust and sand starts to settle. What is that monster? One of the slaver's eyes go wide open, shot at the huge figure just outside their holdout. Electricity or lightning creeps around the being, starting to emit a bright light, illuminating the features of what they would only describe as terrible, horrific, as despite the humanoid cyber made itself known was frightening. Slowly it walks towards him. Fire. Shoot at the fucker. At the slaver's command everyone starts shooting, the slavers and the mercenaries that hired him. But the shots are either absorbed by the figure, deflected or outright miss, as if the shots were guided in another direction. Fuck. Pass me a drink. Most would then have had a long day and had become drunk in the process, but not to the point of being unable to fight back. While everyone was occupied, all but one noticed that their droids were not attacking the person that can be seen. Hey you. Stupid droid, drink for parts can't even listen to simple directives. This person kicks the droid, but what he doesn't expect is for the droid to stop the kick. The droid looks directly into the man's eyes and says something that completely terrifies him. Die. No one was none the wiser as they continued to shoot at the distraction. Why isn't it dying? What kind of monster is it? It is immortal, invulnerable. There is no being that cannot die. Keep firing until we got nothing left, and that should finish him. More and more they fired at the dark figure, and as they do so, a cloud of dust, dirt, grime and sand, obscured their view, and the figure's lightning electric show of lights dimmed. Did we get him? Ha. Huh. See I told you, there was no way someone could survive an onslaught such as that. Everyone starts to get into a cherry mood raising their spirits, but before they could have a mini celebration they noticed the air was clearing. The moons of Tatooine shine brightly and shine a light onto the figure revealing Vader in his full glory standing tall and floating above the air. Oh my. Someone lets out. Vader's voice was projected to the people within the cantina. I am amused by your efforts and praise your resilience, as despite your terrible characters and lack of judgement you at least tried. I can say that is more than what a few had done before they had some terrible accidents. Now feeling the pressure everyone within is unsure of how to continue. And for your efforts I am willing to award you. Award you all, I shall. You will let us go. One asks in a hopeful voice. Vader says nothing but lets a silence befall them all as the moonlight shines upon him and upon them all. Execute Order 69. Comes the chilling reply of Vader. The droids within along beside everything else as if a flick had switched pick up their weapons and pointed towards everyone. They supposed masters, allies of their masters and mercenaries that had decided to stay along with the slavers and worst of the worst criminals still left on Tatooine, unchecked. Blast of shots are fired, and then chaos is once again ensued as from within the droids perfectly dealt with the nuisances inside. The droids from within start a chant that further terrifies those inside. Blood for the master. Over and over the chant continues. Punishment shall be given. None shall go unbent, unbroken, unjudged by the hand of our master. Blood for the master. They continuously chant as they slaughter the survivors of the initial backstab. After the deed had been done the droids one by one got into formation and marched outside from within, creating a resonating sound with their metal appendages, tapping the ground below them. All of them line up in front of their lord, Lord Dater. Saluting they stand tall and straight, which it seems impossible that they wouldn't, but nonetheless this was meant as a show of obedience and absolute loyalty. Lord Dater, the mission has been completed. All inside have been eliminated, exterminated, and the survivors were put out of their misery. But, there's no need for unnecessary suffering, even if they had deserved what had been done to them. Vader had a plan all those years ago when setting up Skywalker Industries, and it wasn't only to make his life and the life of his mother comfortable. It was for other goals and aspirations as well, this one in particular. The infiltration and cultivation of trust these slavers would have for their droids, was meant to be used as a way that if need be, would execute them when ordered. Vader had not needed them for a while now, as it had practically become useless up till this point. At least my miniature plan came to fruition, I guess. Dabba the Hutt had impressively escaped from the situation happening on Tatooine, or at least he thought he did. 
His swift retreat had not gone unnoticed by a lot of people given his stature and the stature of his people. How could he possibly be camouflaged or even get around the flaws of his form? What Jabba doesn't realize about his situation is what some would call, fucked. Dabba is forced to leave what has amounted to the total accumulation of his life, the riches he had obtained whether that be legal or otherwise. The palace he had built for himself to enjoy the rest of his life until the end of his days. The planet he had come into possession of, all of it was his, and he had people under him. Under what he would say is his mighty and benevolent rule. He had basically lived the entirety of his life here on Tatooine, and had enjoyed the benefits of being such a prominent crime overlord, with a criminal empire of his own. Everyone asking him for favors, many, slaves, all sorts of things that he had in droves. Gone. Gone like the wind and dissolved into the sandy dunes of Tatooine. No. My things have not been thrown away by me, they have been taken. Stolen. I will get my revenge. The Bomber Order built a monastery on the planet in 670 years prior, which the bandit Alcar, who worked for the Bureau of Ethnicity and Socialization, used as a hideout in 520 years prior to current times. Shortly thereafter, 34 years after the bandit had been here or 486 years prior, the notorious Jab of the Hut, Chaz Alcar out of his citadel of operations, and claimed the Bomber Monastery for his personal palace, and made it the center of his empire. 400 years I have spent here building my empire, I cannot simply give up on it. I will come back. Dabba's then stood some more in his thoughts about the situation. The audacity of these stupid slaves of which I own, for them to go against me. Blaming the slaves for the rebellion, he is not wrong, but the main cause for concern or the person who had started the soul, did not seem to be the target of Jabba's building hatred. No, Jabba could only fear the monstrous being that had come before him. Once made known that he was special in some way Jabba had decided that he would just put a bounty out on the monster's head. Of course after he had dealt with his current anger. Jabba moved over to a device within his personal bedroom on board his escape ship. This shall teach those lowlife slaves a lesson. Pressing the button Jabba laughs in glee, not realizing that what he had done had amounted to nothing. It was completely useless, but how would he know? Vader having changed his mind about Jabba fleeing from the planet, intercepted Jabba before he could leave. My lord, it seems that we are surrounded. Jabba looks towards his attendant that had stuck with him with a disgruntled expression resting on his face. Chisaka. Bozbun kihuha, you bacha cheese be gull and do hai to pee. Just go. Get around them, you don't be stupid and do what I say. Jabba insults the man in his native tongue. But my lord surely you see that our situation is dire, and we must find a way out of this this other than avoiding them altogether. I am afraid it wouldn't work. Jabba then decides that enough is enough, just has his most favored right hand man and servant killed. Kaoso. You betrew catcher. Enough. You die now. Bib Fortuna's face pales even more than what his skin complexion would be able to do because of his alien heritage. No, my lord. Please forgive him before Bib Fortuna could finish off his sentence, he was gunned down by the combat droids Jabba had control over. Dabba does not, in fact laugh at the death of his subordinate, and starts to regret that he had killed one of his supporters. It doesn't matter to me anyway, there will be more in the future. But just like that his guild was absolved. My lord. A droid came over to Jabba. A communication request has come through. Cha badu badu, chi suppose for she won kuda. Don't bother, just get out of here. Right away. The droid walks off while Jabba goes back to playing with the device within his hand, laughing internally at what he thought he had done. While Jabba was occupied, Vader had already taken over the ship, and was now trying to infiltrate the droids on board. Once I have Jabba captured I am sure he could be held for ransom, but if no one is willing to pay up, I guess he will just be executed for his crimes. No more little Rada, or maybe there might be. Who knows Jabba may have had the chance to get laid before everything had begun. Vader had now taken not only Jabba's escape ship, but had also gotten control of the droids on board. All of them. Board them. Yes, sir. Some resistance fighters had joined him knowing he was going after Jabba, practically jumping at the chance of capturing the big bad crime lord. How bloodthirsty. Vader on another ship is the first to approach and enter the connection point between both ships, and while doing so a droid rushes towards him with its weapon drawn. Watch out sir. The droid's going to hurt you. Someone yells out ready to retaliate. Before anyone could shoot the droid down Vader raises his hand signaling them to stop. It is okay, this droid and in fact all the droids are a plan created by me. Someone calls out from behind. Amazing forethought. Vader moves towards the droid. Report. The droid responds. Master, Jabba the Hutt has been confined to his sleeping quarters, and is not aware of his current predicament. Good, I will confront the beast myself. Vader moves past the droid with a few people looking confused behind him joining his march towards the hut's quarters. Everyone else must stay outside while I discuss some things with the hut. Vader turns back to everyone and states his command. The people seem hesitant but still go along with his plan. Entering those from outside cannot see what is going on, but do have a limited ability to hear what could be going on. There was some talking, and then Jabba's loud voice exclaiming from within with a somewhat startled cry before things go silent. Vader walks out of the room completely unharmed. No one can exactly tell what had happened, but know that Jabba should at the very least be beaten up. We are good here. Secure the ship and let us get back down to Tatooine. We will deal with Jabba there. Back down on Tatooine daybreak was happening, and situation was now not as chaotic. With order being restored by the plethora of droids patrolling the streets of the various outpost settlements and towns. Most of the people walking everywhere now were either the commoner folk that had nothing to do with the resistance, and the people whom had fought with or were part of said slave resistance. 
Many families were properly reunited with loved ones, and the only deaths to occur were from criminals or slavers that resisted arrest. Friends were now starting to clean up the mess that had occurred, and many other things were happening to symbolize the start of a new civilization. The slavers that were successfully held captive were thrown into the jail cells specifically constructed on some of the ships from Anakin. Boy, did you see me? I think I did your mother proud. The drunken man that was now sober said to his kid. No father, I did not. You told me to hide remember, so I did. The father had forgotten what he said, and within the heat of the moment at that time did not pay too much attention to himself or most of his surroundings. He was quite drunk himself at the time. The ship Vader was on started to land on the outskirts of Mos Espa, and upon arrival near everyone disembarked to rejoin with everyone else. Now what? Vader had a lot of experience when it came to leadership in militaristic situations, but had little in the areas of politics, and now this would be the time for such a thing to start. The beginning of a new civilization hopefully ruled by him but let's not get ahead of ourselves, he still needs to take care of Jabba. Vader had gone deep into Jabba's mind scouring and devouring every memory of use to him while disregarding the rest. This had inadvertently caused Jabba to shut down making him unconscious. This gave Vader even more of an easier time by setting the mind of a being practically around 600 years of age. It was no easy task or small feat to accomplish considering the many memories that would be benign or totally useless for him. What Vader wanted was the really special people he interacted with, the ones who were high up within whatever place they came from. The people who participated in and traded slaves. These were the people Vader had decided were to be put on his hit list. There were other criminals of minor significance that participated in and did things that were damaging to the lives of others. Of course within every situation there is nuance, but Anakin cannot see any situation in which the depravity of another being's free will being right. Actions have consequences after all. Today we have fought and we have become victorious, but now we must discuss what happens next. What happens to the slavers we have now locked away and what must be done with Jabba the Hutt. There are other things to approach with the situation here on Tatooine, and that is the situation we are in with our economy, the population and the other problems still present. First and most important would be the leaders to help guide everyone in the right direction. So people will be put into office with which their position stands, the culture and religion of our people is quite sparse, but varied because of our upbringings no doubt. I would hereby like to nominate people. Vader starts to list off people, and to which departments of the new government would go to. Some leaders that come from the natives of the planet were chosen. Tuscans and Jawas were not discriminated against and would get at least one seat. They have been rather well behaved. Some people seem to have other things on their minds right now, and would like to just go home and dressed up, but Vader has to force his hand here to make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible. The rest of the meeting goes quite boring, but by the end of it all everyone has come to their supposed positions. Those who were excluded were done so because of a combination of factors. Vader had taken into account people's personalities, characters, skills and background like culture or religion into account when selecting them for the right jobs. He had become the de facto leader of the new empire for now, but there was no true leader. Not one selected or voted into office anyway. There had been talks though that happened right after the confirmation, celebrations that led to some very wild ideas to appear given precedence to a new idea. A sort of royal family that everyone could agree on. The Skywalker royal family to be exact. That was what everyone had started to call it, but Anakin was extremely confused as to how this came about. On one hand it made sense that his mother himself would be rewarded in some fashion, but not to outright become the ruling house of Tatooine. This does work out in his favor though and could be used to his advantage, but he can be here to oversee the entire process. He has other things planned and cannot be ruling over one planet when he would be doing so much more at a grander scale. He wouldn't mind the whole royal thing, but he as Anakin would not be able to keep the title because he is a Jedi, technically in the future he can come back and plans to do so, but for now it would be of little use except to increase his influence. Not that I don't already control the people and beings of Tatooine. Anakin had also decided that he would be moving all of his droids, well nearly all of them from Dathomir over to here, where they could help him make this place utopia. It would not leave Dathomir defenseless, but he would also fulfill the agreement he has with Talzin. To let her gain full control of Dathomir, at least nearly full as he would still be in control of many things over there, but that doesn't matter. What are we going to do with the hut? Grievous asks next to him. We're either going to sell him off or execute him, publicly. Vader says rather cruelly. The people would most likely want the second option, but I don't think you care either way. Not really. What happens next then? Well, Jabba now being deposed, it would only mean that would have to elect a leader, someone who will represent the people and what better person, than you. Grievous cuts off. Not necessarily, someone who can be cultivated into a good leader, but someone who at the same time would be subordinate to me. I have a few candidates, but to really nail this choice of mine down a through screening process is needed. Makes sense, then what about me? You can stay here for now, your militaristic leadership skills will come in handy, depending on who will think Tatooine is now an easy target. Vader says but then continues. But I doubt anyone would want to take Tatooine, unless the other huts want to do so themselves, no one else should come knocking. I have ideas on how to make the planet thrive, but for now I should deal with the aftermath. Anakin thinks to himself. Actions do have consequences. Strange. A strange occurrence had happened, one that could have changed the way the GDC themselves, but it did not. The way they move about in the world, their interactions and their thoughts but this small incursion wouldn't change their ways. Not when many other things that had happened before did not and things in the future won't do so as well. Hadwins occur, come this way. 
Isla Sakura had been brought into the GD order a long time ago, well at least long for her, considering she had been within the order since near the beginning of her life. She was safely progressing and fully coming into her own abilities as a Padawan. Pay attention Padawan, attack has just occurred on our temple, and you have time to be in your thoughts. Hulin Vos, Isla's master then says. Focus. Born 18 years prior to now she had been living quite the strange life as a GD. Many a times had she been arduously pushed to achieve her limits as she was not the most talented or outstanding of the GD, but was very hardworking. She had an empathetic nature combined with intelligence, and as she grew and kept those traits, but it developed a streak for impulsive and mischievous behavior. Confident, though not arrogant, in her abilities, she was becoming a good leader and a skilled tactician, she had also been progressing rather rapidly in becoming a GD knight, and from what she had been told, within a year or two, she would be promoted. We may have some respite, but I would urge you to not be reckless. We don't know when those droids could come again. Yes master, I will pay attention. The day had gone and passed by with no sound or any other interference coming to take place, no more droids relentlessly but sparsely attacking. Isla had been practicing to further improve herself, and had nearly been angered because of the interruption. That same anger had gone away though as she had been tasked with her master to deal with some droids in another area. She did happen to overhear that some droids had also gone to the senate building, which was an interesting fact. Supposedly a special droid had been destroyed in the process after Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan and Master Windu had gone after. Master, I don't believe any more droids are coming. Stay alert, you don't know what could happen. The droids that had attacked the temple had just vanished, up and left, leaving not a clue as to why it had happened, no connection could be traced, nothing. They sporadically appeared all over causing very minimal damage, and no one had been harmed, at least no one had died or been wounded or injured, and would be able to heal within a few days. After a full day and a half everything had stopped. It had been a few hours since and not much had happened which was starting to get boring to her, because despite the training of the GD she was always impulsive. Quinlan Vos spoke over the communicator. Right we have to go now, it seems everything has settled down with no other movements. Some people will be invited to a meeting that will take place, it won't be a grand event, but just to address the situation. Do we have to go as well? Depends, you may go if you like, but it isn't required. Quinlan then continues. I am going to go see what everyone had discovered about this attack, as it is quite the scale and the confidence the person would have would be troublesome. I think I will skip, I am not too interested right now. In spite of her impulsive nature, she had calmed down enough ever since her incident to not get involved in something that she not be involved with. I will go there now, see you some other time when we go on our next mission. Yes, master. As Quinlan walks off Isla decides that she needed some training, and had heard that there were some pretty good training droids, that could be used to polish her lightsaber combat. What was it? That Skywalker kid, what's his name again? While walking she happens upon two individuals who are younger than her. They appear to be younglings. What are you two doing here? It was Barris and her new small friend Ahsoka. We were just heading to a training room. Ahsoka answered. Training huh? Yeah, training. Barris confirmed. Which room, and why are you guys out so suddenly? Aren't all of you younglings meant to be within the bunker area? Yes but that's over now, or so we have been told. Barris replies. Deciding to ask the question on her mind and the off chance these younglings know where the Skywalker kids training droids are at. Do you guys know where I can find Skywalker, or his training droids? Why? Barris responds defensively, but it is hidden by her control over her emotions. Raising an eyebrow Isla then explains. I wish to use his droids as I have heard they are top of the line, and are capable of being used for intense saber training. Barris, lowering her guard because she now knows the very attractive looking Twi'lek, is not looking for Anakin for other reasons. Well we are heading there just now, not many people have the honor of using them. I am of course Anakin's friend, so he allows me to use the droids whenever I want. Barris says in a subdued by prideful tone, thinking she had won up the older girl. Right Isla responds confused, but now knowing that these two are going to the droid she could just tag along. The human Isla is interrupted by Ahsoka who had now decided to speak up. Yes. Anakin is my friend as well, and he will let me use the droids. The childish reply comes out. Isla having been interrupted doesn't mind the child's ramblings and continues. As I was saying, do you mind if I can use the droids as well? Hesitantly Bears responds. I don't know. I'm unsure as you seem to not know Anakin, and he doesn't like people touching his stuff without permission. Really? What's up Skywalker's ass? Isla then says. Well, I'm sure that he would be okay with letting a fellow Padawan, right? Well, I guess he would be kind enough to help, but for just anyone. Bears's voice slowly starts to fade up into the end as she continues talking. Great. Lead on then. Yeah, let's go. Ahsoka also peaks in excitement. Bears decides to just go with the flow and would pass on all the responsibility if something goes wrong to the eldest here. Specifically Isla, because Bears was not against using deceptive tactics and had in fact been trying to train in this area as well. She would take this ability to see if she could pull off a lie against Anakin, who is the greatest lie detector ever. And what, pray tell gave you the impression it was fine for you to just leave the temple? Me straight out of the gate questions. Well Anakin begins only to be interrupted by another. Qui-Gon then speaks up. No matter the reason, as long as a proper and is not something silly, then we could make this pass with not too much punishment. You see Anakin gets interrupted again. There is no excuse for your absence in this great time of need, we could have used your help here Padwin Skywalker. Mace continues in a strict tone. Are these two really playing good cop, bad cop with me right now? 
Anakin, it is okay if you were out, and about as long as it was something to do with the GD, I would be okay with it. Qui-Gon states. I think not, Qui-Gon. I think the boy needs to be punished and what better punishment than being confined to the temple. Anakin had not been confined to the temple despite his status, and was allowed to enjoy everything that was Coruscant, as long as he kept up with the trainings, physical and mental tests they had endured. This was the only way he was able to start preparing for everything that had happened, and the only way for him to do more things in the future, if he was allowed some freedom, and was not monitored from dawn to dusk, dusk to dawn. Master Qui-Gon, Master Windu, I went off planet off planet. So you were not even on Coruscant. Mace lifts an eyebrow. Yes. I went off planet because I wanted to see my mother and see your mother. Anakin, remember attachments are forbidden within the GD and are not a part of the code. Qui-Gon states. If you two would let me finish. Anakin says with some heat. Silence ensues as Qui-Gon and Mace decide to stop messing around with him. Now if you two are done being trolls, I would like to properly explain myself. Go on. Mace gestures for Anakin to continue. I was going to my mother to get her off of the planet she was on for her safety, but it is not only for that reason I went back to my origin. Anakin stops for dramatic effect. I went back to help the slaves. Help the slaves. Yes, I had promised, no made a promise to people that I would help them overcome their terrible situation. Anakin says explaining the suffering of the slaves. Not only had I promised to help them, I was full of intent to fulfill that promise. That was reckless of you, and you should not have done so without informing anyone. Qui-Gon says. That may be true, but I had the feeling no one would let me go there. That is true, but now tell us the results of your actions. Mace asks, both him and Qui-Gon forgetting about the other reason Anakin had gone to Tatooine for. I did nothing much but help set up some technology that would send out a pulse to destroy and deactivate the slave ships implanted into the slaves. Anakin then continues. After that I just sat back, or to be more specific left knowing that I should not stay any longer. Mace hums to himself as he contemplates what should be done about how Anakin had disobeyed the simple rules put in place by those superior to him. For now, I think some confinement to only the temple for the next month will do. Qui-Gon speaks up about his decision starting the punishment off as low as possible, because he is currently the metaphorical good cop. No, I believe it should be longer than that. Maybe we should extend the amount of time Anakin has to spend before he can become an official Padawan. No missions and no opportunities to advance until we decide otherwise. Mace says in a teasing tone different from his usual demeanor. That does seem like a good decision, but to restrict him that much may hinder his progress. You have noticed that we are nearing the amount of things we can teach him just by staying here on Coruscant. Qui-Gon interjects. As they continue talking Anakin has to listen to their spiel over what should be done, the permissions that must be granted, the GD code, the what to do and what not to do. After a while his punishment is that he would be confined to the GD temple for three months. Other things were added on as well, that he would need to interact more with those his age, and join in on some of the lessons for younglings. He would have to go so far as become a sort of teaching assistant within those classes. I have to look after some kids. After we have decided that you have done a good job as an assistant, you will then be given the duties of a teacher. Mace says. That is right, young one. You will have to be an assistant teacher and in the future teach younglings within certain lessons. Qui-Gon continues. Anakin thinks over the punishment and decides to accept his other options will simply hinder his path, and it would not be bad to be able to influence the next few generations of Jedi. This will give him an in with the development of them. To slowly change their ways as with children education is important in shaping their beliefs. By becoming a teacher at least until he starts to do his first missions, would it enable Anakin to sway the younglings, so when they are inevitably saved after the fall of the Jedi, it would be easier on doing the brainwashing they do. Thank you my masters for this golden opportunity. Anakin thinks to himself before saying. I think I will accept. Good. You will be given information later on about your assignment and the students you will be teaching in the future. Mace leaves the room, but Qui-Gon stays behind. I will have to inform the council of your actions. Although the punishment was left to Master Windu and I that doesn't change the fact your actions will go unrecognized. I know but I had felt it was right. Anakin pauses for dramatic effect. For the people on Tatooine, for myself and for the betterment of everyone. Like you have said Master, the living force is present within everything that is alive. It is what connects us to the greater cosmic force, and through this was I able to see that without me going there, the people would suffer more. I am proud of you, but at the same time your actions have consequences. The light side of the force is absolute selflessness, and to embody this you have done just that, give yourself to others without a forethought for yourself. Not that true, but I did do this for more than myself. Because of this, the punishment was not as severe, and Master Windu will smooth things over with the others, for now you should go. Yes, Master. Thank you again. It is no problem, go on now. I am sure you will be curious about what has happened in your absence. Something has happened. Anakin questions knowing full well what had occurred. Yes, some interesting events have taken place. Dathomir. So you are leaving this planet then? It is to be left to me and my sisters. Tells in question to the holographic figure of Grievous. Yes, Master Skywalker said that he was to fulfill his promise to you now, and give complete diplomatic control over to you. We are taking all of the droids to Tatooine. Finally. What about the alliance between us? That is fine, everything will be kept the same. The only things is that now you will have to deal with anything that comes your way without our protection, at least it will take time for us to come and help you out. 
Talzin had been planning a lot of things throughout the years, and had been wanting to get the boy under her control, but it always seemed that his power and growth was becoming something she could not interfere with. Internally she wants to somehow make sure the boy doesn't betray her just as Sidious had. He is becoming much more powerful, I have not had the chance to see him, since he was but a small child, but I doubt he stopped progressing himself. Anakin was determined to make sure he was powerful. Not because he wanted to rule over everything through force, but to be so strong that not would be able to take away his freedoms or the freedoms of the people he cares about. We want something more. Talzin said because of course you don't keep the same deal throughout without any change, because both parties would change themselves. Whether this be for the better or for the worse a new agreement would have to made. Grievous replies with a curious tone. More. What more could you want from Master Skywalker? What more do you have to offer? Because it had long since been that Anakin had surpassed them within a lot of things. He would not need their monetary support, and Grievous really doubts they could provide military support they would need considering their current assets, but it is always better to listen for their offer first. I request that the boy speak to me himself. Talza knew, of course that Anakin could not speak to her right now, but was just being a Karen. If Grievous had eyebrows they would surely be raised by now. Master Skywalker had to go back to the GD Temple. GD Temple. What does that boy have to gain from going to those blasted GD? Talzin did not like it that she is now allied with the GD, even if he had helped her sisters tremendously, and the only reason she continued to be alliance with him was exactly because of that. But the main reason for herself was that he had helped save her favorite child, Maul from a fate that would be cruel. Incredibly selfish Talzin had learned that not everything will go her way, but was immensely grateful at least at that time to the boy, but now she tolerates him because of his decision to enter the GD. No matter the reasoning, she still has this hatred that had been imbued into her and various other Knight sisters, since the start of their culture, their ideologies. I am aware. But that does not excuse him because he would now be the leader of Tatooine, is he not? The leaders of both sides should talk. Talzin was bluffing as there was no way she would be able to contend with Anakin's military and economic might. It was simply impossible for her or the Knight sisters to do so, and that gap will only grow as more time passes. I will try to see what I can do. Grievous finally responds. The relationship between Grievous and Talzin was very professional, but the two had grown rather close, and the two had been having somewhat friendly conversations. If people would look from the outside in when these two were in private and were not walking about important topics, it would surprise people. The serious Grievous and the manipulative Talzin were an unlikely duo. Their closeness to each other did not go unnoticed though as Anakin had been keeping an eye out on both Grievous and Talzin over the years, to make sure their loyalties are kept in check. So far so great, but it seems something more was starting to develop between the two. By the way, are you to leave Dathomir as well? Talzin says in a somewhat vulnerable tone, but it is so subdued that one would not be able to notice. Grievous hesitant to answer finally decides to reply after some uncomfortable silence. I do not know if or when I will be returning to Dathomir, but it seems for now that I am to stay here on Tatooine. The two go silent again before Talzin decides to break it. Right. It seems that I have something else to do, I am quite busy after all. Yes contact me when the boy is ready to speak to me directly. Oh before Grievous could finish what he was about to say, Talzin dramatically cuts off communication between the two. Mentally sighing Talzin begins to ask herself internally. Why did I do that? Even if she were not a fair maiden and knows the ins and outs of relationships, that does not mean she would instantaneously recognize her feelings. She would vehemently deny them if asked, especially because of the way the dark side of the Force corrupts his user's mental state. Things have been changing and in fact a lot of the new Knight sisters and brothers indoctrinated were of new opinions that ruffled the feathers of the old. Out with the old and in with the new. Anakin had told her she was still against the re-education of her people. But sometimes things are actually much better than it seemed as she was benefiting, and so too were her people and those she ruled over, meaning his thoughts had encouraged growth, change in a positive direction. She could not deny the results, so she too had accepted that what he had said. Out with the old and in with the new. She whispered to herself mentally recording the words. Interrupted from her internal musings, a member of the Night Sisters enters. Mother Talzin, are we now the only ones here? The ones to rule over the entirety of Dathomir? Yes. I think it will be hard considering a lot of the droid army that was stationed here is now gone, but what we have here should be sufficient enough. Talzin did not have to worry too much about security, given the amount of droids she herself had been given by Anakin. What she actually worries about is their growth despite its progress, they did not have as much people or population to sustain the increase in the amount of things they cover over Dathomir. We need to increase the population somehow. The usual Night Sister tactics related to only replenishing the numbers of their people, not the growth so they could thrive and prosper. For now we are fine, but we will need a solution, so I do not have to worry about things. Droids may be useful but they aren't living. At least not like the living droids that worship the boy. Coruscant. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine otherwise known as Darth Sidious was not having a good day. Why? Because he had been assaulted, attacked. Someone had come at him with the intent to harm him, probably kill him if possible, but of course he was not going to allow some lousy droid to destroy him. It would be extremely pathetic and weak of him, even if he was to play the role of a wise, old but not physically capable person. Just thinking back to it, it angered him fueling his energies within the dark side of the force. Calm down Sidious, you do not want your plans to go to waste now. The stupid and idiotic GD may sense your presence. 
Six years now had it been since the great resynchronization for the Republic to keep a better standard for their calendars, and he had been using this system as well to measure the time till his success. It had also been two years since his election into office, and it would seem someone has it out for him. Interesting. He had thought at the time but had become quick to anger, remembering that the GD had nearly caught him in the act. His senses had been dulled enough to nearly allow such a huge slip up. Stupid droid. When I find your master, I will kill them. Remembering the GD barging into his office because of the droid and also fueled his hate, but he wouldn't let some momentary act of disrespect ruin him. Supreme Chancellor sir, you have someone that would like to meet you. One of the Red Guards Palpatine had made for himself. Who is it? Janus Grigidus. Yes, let him in. He and I have much to talk about. Palpatine's ascension to the position of Chancellor left a small problem. Someone had to assume the now vacant position of representative for Chomal sector in the Senate. He used his influence to promote the election of Janus Grigidus from Chomal Minor, one of his political allies. Grigidus had long since demonstrated that he had a keen political mind, and though he could not be seen embracing it openly, Grigidus's anti-alien isolationism served his purposes. Still, the election did not long stand. His isolationism was at odds with Naboo's newfound multicultural stance, and prominent political voices on Naboo cleared their proverbial throats almost immediately. Eventually, Grigidus was replaced just this year by Horus Fancel of Naboo, but Palpatine continued to keep him close, making Grigidus one of his advisors. Yes, the people of my origins were quite adamant in not accepting my new advisor Grigidus. In fact Grigidus was not only an advisor of Sidious's, but also a person he had been training as a dark side adept. Nothing too serious, certainly he was not material to be his apprentice, as he had plenty of others to take up that role. A role that Sidious sees as important. He currently had Dooku within his grasp, but he could see it would not last long. Not the way Dooku has been going, as despite his own darkness, it seems he is so resistant to his sway, to his corruption that he would not crumble. Supreme Chancellor. Yes, please come in my advisor Grigidus. We have much to discuss. Sidious the continues on discussing various things before calling it a day. But he is not done yet, as when night comes he will relieve himself as Palpatine, and once again take up the mantle of Darth Sidious, because he is now in full control of the Sith. He had killed his master after all. A few hours after the nightly proceedings, Sidious moves over to a communication device used for things not related to the Senate, or even a personal device he keeps for himself. It is another device used for other types of business. He doesn't use the same device simply because of the dangers of doing so. Things could be traced back to him so most of the ones he uses have to be clean, safe from transmission interference and hidden. Speaking into the device he begins to speak. Darth Tyrannus. Palpatine. Why have you called me? It would seem that despite become his apprentice, Tyrannus still does not want to answer to him as such, and it would not be any time soon he would begin saying so. Sidious very well knew he was being used by his apprentice, but that is the way of the Sith. Selfishness at his finest. Darth Tyrannus, my apprentice. I have come to inform you on an amusing attack on my life, and would like to investigate further into who it was that tried to go after me. Is this to be my job? No, that would be impossible for you as you are a well-known public figure, especially known to the GD. No, you are to continue with what I have set upon you to do. Yes, my lord. Good, good after discussing things for a while yet, as he would not mind satisfying his current apprentice's curiosity it would come to an end with nowhere to start what he does next. Sidious had come across a few roadblocks, if you will when it came to advancing his plans. It would take a while yet longer to form his droid army, as the person meant to be under his control was unsuccessful in gaining complete control. This was Sidious in a tight spot, considering he has a war to plan and continue with. Not only that but he had heard complaints from Tyrannus that he did not have any capable people to help him direct or lead the droid army they are constructing. Unfortunately Sidious had no one at his disposal despite having a large amount of people willing to work under him, Sidious does not see anyone capable enough to handle such a big responsibility. Only time will tell. My excuses were brought out. After Anakin had successfully managed to smooth talk and get a punishment much more lenient, he had nothing much else to do than check up on his training droids here. It was currently quite late at night and the GD, whether they be younglings, padawans, knights, everyone seemed to be awake. No rest for the wicked. No rest for the wicked indeed because Anakin had plans, big plans for his droids, for himself and the future. He will not stop at helping people regain their freedom, to live as they want with only the laws to restrict people from doing anything to crazy. Droids that could look after and keep the peace while he had others be used in areas that the population could be harmed from. He would not use the living droids for this, as it would surely taint his image within their minds. He continued to walk down the halls coming across many people who were tired or heading off into another direction. I wonder how Bear held up. Anakin thinks to himself going towards the training room he leaves his training droids. Coming towards the room, he is not surprised at Bears' presence, but he is surprised by two unfamiliar force signatures also within the room. Sure he had every so often let some people use his droids, but it was of acquaintances. An example being Fear Solon. While originally Anakin would have had a rivalry with the said individual it was more one-sided. Fierce would try to beat him at everything he did, and for fun Anakin would use Fierce as a test subject to test his abilities. Anakin starts to open the door. Well now, let's see who we have here. Within the room, Beerus would be seen side by side with the little Tigrita girl known as Ahsoka, watching a young adult currently engaging in combat against his droids. Anakin's entrance causes a distraction knocking Isla off her feet and onto the ground. 
Anakin begins to enter, Isla awkwardly begins to stand up, and the droid that was in combat with Isla had disengaged. Beerus speaks up seeing Anakin arrive. Anakin. She runs towards him. Where were you? I did not see you in the temple during that droid attack. Beerus says with subdued concern. That is because I was not within the temple, I was doing something else, but what really should be asked here is why are there two unknown individuals here? Anakin says with a strict tone. I, I Beerus seems to feel miserly at coming up with an explanation. Isla decides to save Beerus from embarrassment and steps forward. It was my fault. I wanted to use your training droids here, and have been doing so for only a small amount of time. Anakin turned towards the miserable Isla who was just defeated by said droid in lightsaber combat. It seems that my droids are getting better and better as I upgrade them, but to fail against one, she must not be that good with a lightsaber. And who might you be? Anakin asks knowing full well who the Russian Twi'lek is. Me. My name is Isla, Isla Sakur, and I am a Padawan. A Padawan? Who is your master? Isla responds. My master is Jedi Knight, Quinlan Vos. She says rather proudly and considering the bond between the two Anakin knows why. Well, fellow Padawan Sakur, I would suggest that you ask permission from the person who owns these things before using them. Isla raises her eyebrows. Own. I thought the Jedi didn't like having possessions. It seems the so-called talented Skywalker was actually breaking the code. Before Anakin could respond the little Tigrita girl makes herself known quite loudly. Are you Anakin? Are you my new friend? New friend. Anakin looks between Ahsoka and the other two to get some answers. Beerus is the one to respond. I kind of promised the little one that you would be her friend. Friend, eh? Anakin looks towards what would have been the original's apprentice. Deciding that becoming friends with the girl wouldn't hurt much, he ignored Isla's looks and directed towards Ahsoka. Sure. We can be friends. Yeah. Anakin is so cool. Ahsoka continues. Now that you are my friend we can do things together. Together. Beerus questions. Yeah, Ani is meant to be friends with me. I saw it. Ahsoka says something that catches everyone's attention. I was meant to be your friend. Where did you see something like that? Anakin decides to ask Ahsoka the question on everyone's mind whilst thinking to himself. Did she see an alternative timeline or something? The original where she is taken as the apprentice. This is not something that was a part of the original. Events were already starting to spiral out of Anakin's control, but it starts with the little things, where he would still be able to rely on his knowledge to help himself and others, but it seems that his presence has started to change a lot of things. Is it for the better or for the worse? Only time would tell. I dreamt about it many times. Deciding that it may be time to change the subject, Isla decides that the attention should shift back over to her. Anyway I am a bit confused about everything. For starters if I remember correctly, aren't you supposed to be like, only 11 years old? Isla directs to Anakin. That is true I am currently only 11. Says Anakin as his height reaches 1.8 meters and his overall being makes him look like an older teenager, somewhere around Isla's age in fact. Isla looks Anakin up and down. Are you sure? She says with a doubtful tone. There. Whatever you say then. Isla pauses before continuing. I wanted to use your droids, and I am guessing your friend here bears help guide me here, along with the little youngling there. You couldn't come to me. I didn't know where you were, and I most certainly would not be able to talk with any of your masters, given the situation that had just happened. That is a correct assumption, but remember I was not in the temple. I had said this a few minutes before did I not? That just means that I wouldn't have been able to use the room. You know what let's just forget about this matter and move on to other subjects like telling me what had happened while I was gone. Anakin decides to end any potential argument. Beerus interjects before they start. You have to tell me what happened with you as well. Sure. Anakin then proceeds to listen to what they experienced and what had happened when he was away, but Anakin didn't really need to know the event itself, just what they had went through, so he could better determine how well his control over the droids were. It seems I did pretty good. Very little damage was done to anyone, and any damage done to belongings or other miscellaneous objects was also minimal, not that the GD would care all too much about these things considering their code. I think that is enough. Don't you guys think you should be heading elsewhere? Bear speaks. Well, the lessons us younglings have to take are not going on right now, but so resume after a day or two. At least that was what I heard. Ahsoka nods in agreement. I was bored and had nothing to do. This was true, but she had very recently come out of a mission that had to come close to the dark side of the force. Right now she was just looking for anything to help her mind climb down after the events that took place. Losing her memories was traumatic, regaining some of them was also an experience she did not like, so she was looking for the things she felt was missing. She herself feared she was still lost after what had happened to her. That only advice she had gotten was from Master Yoda, and even then it had not been too helpful. Patient, you must be. A Jedi, you are. Yoda had told her the Force does not let people to things they always want, but to things they need. Believe, trust in the Force, you must. Guide you, it will. Help you, it must. It had seemed that the Force had guided her to here. Where the very strange individual of Anakin Skywalker was made known to her and the strange occurrences around him. Things had been going swimmingly on Tatooine after Anakin had left them, and had Grievous become his representative there. Moving all of the droids over from Dathomir had been a hassle, but it was worth it, considering he would need defenses in place. The Huts wouldn't take too kindly to what had been done. Especially when they have one of their own trapped within a cage, imprisoned by the people who have now taken over a system from them. A seat of power that was extremely beneficial. Tatooine itself was not of much importance, only becoming something of a seat of power. 
nothing more, nothing less because they did not have much to help propel the planet's economy or the growth overall in anything. It would take a while to become a superpower great enough to start their own conquests, but Anakin does not plan to do anything like that. Not so soon after his most recent acquisition, Shmai had moved back to Tatooine as well, and had been treated like a queen. Anakin did not mind this, but if everyone there started to see him as a prince, he may need to start answering even more questions, and this time it would not be from his masters. It would be by the GD High Council itself. He could only imagine their outrage, they would of course get over themselves after any explanation he gives them, but it would certainly be something to see. In fact, I now am quite looking forward to everyone's reactions. Clearly Anakin like always was training, but instead of any intensive physical workout he was working on the spiritual aspects of the force. Meditation. Not that fun but relaxing nonetheless. Thinking over everything that had happened so far, he could only lament the fact that no matter what he does the Republic would fall, and Sidious would probably rise to power and still create his own empire. Vader was both instrumental to Sidious and the originals, but also not needed. The events leading up to, to Sidious's uprising would happen, and he could only delay the inevitable, but that does not mean he would be unable to change anything. The Jedi don't deserve to die. Thinking his statement and projecting this outwards towards the Force, his response in the negative. You still want the Jedi to die, huh? Midi chlorians allowed for communication with the Force, the energy field takes gives people insane abilities. Anakin used this to his advantage to see if it would respond, and his experiments were successful. So far he had only been able to get possible yes or no answers from it. What wanted, what it desired. Things like that were hard to decipher, but it still wanted the GD to come to an end. HK-47, the first living droid. The first one to be given life by his master, by his lord that goes by Anakin Skywalker. HK sees Anakin as his father, he had after all created him. He was sent to protect Anakin's mother, whom he has started to consider as his own grandmother of the sorts, because even though he is not of the flesh and blood of Anakin, he was made through the energy field known as the Force. He had lived the longest out of all of the elite droids Anakin had created. This put him up on a pretty high position. Protecting Shmai was not that hard, sometimes attempts would be made on her life, but he would quickly dispatch of them. It wasn't all too often but a lot of people believed that could harm her or use her in some way to gain a fortune. Especially since she lives on a planet like Tatooine. Speaking of Tatooine, he had been commanding the other living droids around to help out after the rebellion took place. HK, sir we have come across no problems with the locals here, but would like to make an assessment of the area. Statement. Go ahead. Most of the living droids listened to him and in fact respected him, but there were a few that didn't really listen, but HK supposed that was the result of being reborn as a living being. He was worried at first that the others may want to betray his father, but none had even had the thought. What they were doing now was analyzing the environmental condition of Tatooine, and looking at various geographical locations to best determine where they could start their plans of terraforming the planet. This would take time so for now they would have to settle on creating utopian-based cities across Tatooine, as they get to work on stabilizing the atmosphere to make it more comfortable for Flora to grow and prosper. What they would have to do is bring over water from another planet, and the planet they have in mind was Dathomir. They did not need much else but water, as the water levels measured on Tatooine was not equivalent to the rumors or legends equating it to luscious trees and grand white oceans. There was no indication of the planet having any of these things. The moisture levels were not high enough for that type of terrain, so there must have been a grand event which made the planet like the way it is now. Thinking. Maybe this planet does not even have accurate historic records. Albeit the records were legends or myths passed down orally. It was not best to trust something, the words told by another so they conducted tests, and the tests said these stories must be false. Or they didn't tell the full story. Command. Begin the reconstruction effort. Roger, Roger. The term life quite gone and Anakin were currently holding a lesson between the two. Teacher and student. The ultimate goal of the Sith, yet they can never achieve it, it comes only through the release of self, not the exaltation of self. It comes through compassion, not greed. Love is the answer to the darkness. Qui-Gon continued. In fact the very words I have just spoken I had also explained to Master Yoda. According to the GD tradition, death was a part of life, and it meant becoming one with the Force. In death, sentients lost their ability to communicate with the living, but mastery of certain obscure paths of learning could avert it. An example being the method to preserve one's consciousness after physical death. Qui-Gon then continues. Today I am going to teach you this method. This technique. Now, I do not believe you would need this technique anytime soon, but to know it is of the utmost importance for those who wish to live on after physical death. Where was this technique created? Its origins. Its history. I don't know that and no one else knows the origins of it as well, but we know it exists. I have told no one else about this technique, not Obi-Wan and not Master Yoda. Qui-Gon then continues. Strangely enough, I also have some type of phantom pain in relation to that in particular. Like at one point I had told Obi-Wan and Master Yoda. So the origins of that knowledge, as well as its history, are not known. Anakin states with a questioning undertone, re-erecting the conversation that nearly went off topic. Oh, yes. Well, I was the first of the recent GD who rediscovered this secret with the assistance of a shaman of the wills. Qui-Gon states. Today I will reveal to you the secret to keeping your individuality after becoming one with the cosmic force. I have a question, why is the desire to have eternal life frowned upon? If it is possible through the way, the method you have discovered even though it is only after death why do we, should we not desire to do so? 
the question, but first I will tell you why or at least the explanation of why it is a method that is not as eternal as it seems. It is only meant to be temporary. This state was temporary, as Force Ghosts were an intermediate state between life and afterlife. After a certain amount of time, they would then have to move on to the netherworld of the Force, another realm of existence. You were told of this other realm by the ones who had assisted you. Yes. Is it possible to extend your time as a ghost indefinitely? That is also possible, but I am unsure as to how one would do that other, than becoming the embodiment of absolute selflessness. Absolute selflessness is the key to becoming a Force Ghost then. It is one of the many factors, but I have very little research on this topic, and even though I know of the method, I have yet to try it out myself. Qui-Gon then continues jokingly. I am still alive, or did you want me to die to test it out? No master, I would never imply such thing. Anakin states in mock seriousness. That is a relief. For a second you had me believe that you were willing to have me die just to see me as a ghost. It would be interesting wouldn't it? Qui-Gon chuckles a little already used to the antics his young apprentice gets up to. Come now, I believe it is enough talk and we should enter meditation so I would properly guide you. Yes, master. Anakin and Qui-Gon then spend some time in meditation, while Mace Windu is a teacher of great methods, his style is more oriented towards combat or things to do with militaristic action. That is just the way he teaches, the physical side s and aspects. Don't get him wrong, Qui-Gon can also teach physical based things when it comes to the GD, it is just not his strong suit when comparing himself with Master Windu. But he does have something up on the purple wielding lightsaber GD. Theoretical teaching capabilities. Anakin has learned a lot of things to do with the Force from him, including most of his Force-based abilities, as Qui-Gon has quite the varied skill set. He may not be as powerful, but there was a reason he was offered a seat on the Council. It was most unfortunate that he had declined, at least what others would have said. There is more for me to do, and I believe if I joined the Council something bad would happen. Something wrong. Qui-Gon had sensed many things and somehow had a feeling at least at the time, that if he joined the Council, he would not have meet with his new apprentice. Meditating is cool and all, but I don't think I will get anywhere if you don't help me here. Anakin speaks up at the silence and lack of teaching from Qui-Gon. This wakes him up. Oh, I apologize. That is my mistake I was just reminiscing about a few things. Quite distracted, you are. Teacher Padawan, you should. Anakin furthers his joking attitude in a mock impression of Master Yoda. Very funny. I suggest we begin truly this time. Anakin sighs while his eyes are closed while in a meditative position. I guess is where the fun stops. Anakin and Qui-Gon then spend the rest of their time together for the day in meditation and in training. Qui-Gon teaching and guiding Anakin when it comes to the special technique he had learned and Anakin thinking of uses for such an ability. Coruscant. At the turn of the new year a lot of things were starting to pick up. Specifically things that had been happening over with senior technologies, the corporation that Anakin had slowly been taking over from the inside. It started with the Sunfather duo that he had saved, and then started to expand to the rest of their clan. They had after all been a part of an even larger group, larger clan with even larger backing within politic governments all across the Galactic Republic's worlds. Ray the current CEO was thinking and all of a sudden had gotten an idea, an idea or concept so grand, but shouldn't really be put to use. He had discussed this idea and concept with one of his personal acquaintances, specifically one that he would call a friend, but not in a proper sense. Just in the sense that is beneficial to remain in casual contact with the man. Wilhaf Tarkin. Wilhaf Tarkin was born into the Tarkin family, an old wealthy and powerful clan that had originally been granted the world of Iriadu, and still remained dominant in the politics and business of Iriadu and the Siswana sector, as well as carrying strong influence in galactic politics. Wraith and Wilhaf had met around 10 years prior, he befriended Wraith Senior, and they had come to an understanding of each other. Wilhaf had tried to convince his friend before about helping in and participating in the fiasco that was the Naboo invasion. Wraith remembered his words. I hope you understand what could be a stake here. At the moment we are merely useful lackeys. We are below the level of awareness of those who will command the galaxy. If this planet and its ships are as useful as they appear to be, we will be richly rewarded. Wilhaf continued. We will be noticed. Some already share my belief that this could be very big. But Wraith had matters to take into his own hands, things that he couldn't control. At least not now, not with the way things had been developing as their corporation and the people within the clan had capitulated to Skywalker Industries. It all started on Dantooine. Getting over his thoughts he started to begin talking to his friend about the concept he had come up with. I have to to tell you about something of epic proportions, at least in the terms of what I envision. Envision, do you? What is it that you come to me with some excitement? I wish to bring into being an expeditionary battle planetoid. I remember you had told me that even though you have control there are some things that can't be done if you wanted to. Yes, the person who is now controlling us must have some relation to that Skywalker Industries, and in fact I had heard that there was a rebellion there, that had put the very same people related to the corporation in power. I have heard of that too, but from what I understand even though they have come to power there seems to be another power at play. Tarkin then continues. There may be more to it than what meets the eye. That is true, but I think we should stay on topic. I was just talking about my designs for this expeditionary battle planetoid. I think you would be most interested and something that the one above would be interested in as well. Tarkin was fascinated by the design of such a grand contraption. Unbelievable, with this you would be able to, in theory destroy a planet. Yes, I have taken to calling this project the Death Star. What a fitting name considering his capabilities. 
Tarkin pauses before his mind runs a million miles a minute, trying to think up of ways to use this to his advantage. Say, do you think I could have these schematics? Unfortunately, even though we have become friends and have an alliance to help gather important information, I cannot give this away. Why not? Tarkin would be lying if he was not disappointed. A massive space station designed to control star systems, which featured a giant turbo laser powered directly by the station's core. Tarkin saw tremendous potential in the concept, especially if the defensively potent design's weapon was upgraded to provide sufficient power to ruin a world. Fear of such a weapon's visitation, he believed, would solve the ancient problem of how to keep order in a galaxy too large for any fleet to patrol effectively, and deny support to guerrilla movements. What would happen next over the sequence of a few days would inevitably ruin Tarkin's plans. Thankfully the security for his friend's failed research lab was not at the top of his priorities. He would unfortunately fail in the end to get anything of use which will further set back Darth Sidious, as one of his most loyal supporters to be had failed miserably with no recourse. The plans for the Death Star would never reach City Seers, but he was to say that engineering at this level would go unnoticed. Especially when Anakin knows the immense potential of such a product, why wouldn't he come and swoop in to take what he needs, while leaving anything else as leftovers? When it comes to the ability Qui-Gon had taught him, Anakin knows that he would have to keep this secret from other Jedi, as it would seem Qui-Gon did not want to pass it down to anyone. Not yet, not even to his used-to-be student Obi-Wan. Now that I think about, I am pretty sure Qui-Gon thinks of me as more than just a normal apprentice, and may even see me as a son. That is also quite possible with how he views Obi-Wan. The youngest is always spoiled, I guess. The technique taught was not the only version, and was most certainly not only related to the relinquishment of selfish desires, as many people who were not Jedi, and were not aligned to the light, come use similar techniques. Some Sith Lords learned similar techniques, which in some cases allowed them to physically interact with their environment. This ability also allowed the Force user to interact with both living beings and other Force ghosts. An interesting fact to take away was how there was a mention of another realm so to speak. That even within the Force itself there existed a place that parallels the idea of a place to go to after death, somewhere your spirit resides after becoming one with the Force. An afterlife. This opened up many possibilities and to Anakin, how could he miss out on potentially creating something that was his own personal dimension? And one such idea coincides with another thing he had to consider. The droids had been seeing him as their creator, their god and had indicated as such within the beginnings of their culture. If he could somehow create an afterlife of his own, connected to him where he could access and pull upon the combined might of other souls to aid him, the potential would be unbelievably powerful. The idea he has, is to create a matrix of sorts. A heaven for the living droids that died, but instead of becoming one with the force, they conglomerate and create a matrix that combines various droid-based souls into a massive machine that would work for him. The concept itself is great, and he has ideas and workarounds on how to start such a massive project, but he is unwilling to just tell the droids to sacrifice themselves for him, even when he knows they are willing to. So he would just have to wait. First he would have to create the dimension, connected to solely himself, and make sure that only droid souls connected to him would go into it. Second would be that he has to teach the droids the ability in case something unfortunate happens to them. One might be thinking how Anakin would be able to tell when a droid passes. It is when the non-organic midi-chlorians start to dissipate, leading to the death of a droid. He had already started to see things like this happen, but only at a slow rate. As he learns more and more about the Force, about himself and midi-chlorians he knows that even if he created life it is imperfect. They cannot be immortal or have an eternal existence, but if he is successful they could get their very own droid heaven. She had capitulated. Submitted. Both she was to admit her fear, but the dark side of the Force particularly enhances negative emotions, further increasing their sway and power over user. She was now working under the Dark Lord known as Vader, and she would admit his power was far greater than hers. So much greater that she had no desire to leave him. She would never admit her obsession because she was drawn to the mysterious man behind the mask. If only I could see just what is behind it. Drawn to the lull and pull of his power, his presence within the Force was attractive to her at an instinctual level, not only because of some spiritual connection, but in her own desires as well. She was ambitious and craved power, and was not wary of looking to places that were dangerous. Despite working for the mysterious man for a few months now she had come to know that he was not a cyborg. But she could tell by his movements, she wasn't an academic for nothing. Tell me then. Renella mustered up her courage when the masked man had come to her again. Tell me what the deal you wanted to purpose to me was. Renella's resistance had been whittled down until her chances of recruitment were at an all-time high. She would do anything for Vader, whether Vader knew this or not did not comment on it. I want you to become part of my research division. There are of course terms and conditions to taking on such a prestigious job, but in essence what you will be doing is studying the Force. Renella's eyes start to gain interest other than the fact she is curious about her captor. Studying the Force. As in the abilities, powers, traits, and other things like that. Yes, but you would be doing so much more. What more could you have for me to study? You will come to learn about that once you join. For now I would suggest you take the offer as even before you have the chance to join you would need to go through a very intense training process. Her anger starts to flare at the insinuation that she would not be up to his standards. I am fully capable and should not need to participate in anything of the sort. I refuse to do it, you should just give me this position straight away. This terms of the agreement between the both of us is non-negotiable. Vader stated simply leaving no room for renegotiation or simple refusal. You leave me no choice. You are going to do something drastic. Vader questioned. 
No, why would I? What I mean is that you leave me no choice, as in I have no other option. Right, that did not sound ominous at all. Vader pauses before he continued. First we will start with the conversation continued between the two before Inala eventually gave up not wanting to go to mental warfare with the mysterious monster, and tire herself out mentally. She needed her mind as it was her greatest asset, and it would seem Vader knew it too. Certainly joining him in whatever venture she has come into was interesting. She believed that she would stay on Dathomir for a while, considering that this planet had been taken over by Vader and his allies the Night Sisters. It would seem that she was wrong. The new base of operations was constructed on Tatooine, supposedly a planet that Vader himself had some connection to. Renella was not blind or incapable of putting together the dots to get a picture for herself the situations, events, the basic 5 W's and house. Vader was connected to the Skywalkers and by extension the Skywalker Industries and the Slave Rebellion Vader had helped to orchestrate. She wasn't there herself, something about still not being up to Vader's standards, but she knows that is just an excuse to keep her from getting too deeply involved. He doesn't trust her fully, at least not yet. Fortunately she had been making progress when it came to training with the dark side, but it was slow, not to her liking. Vader seemingly was powerful, yes she could admit, but that did not mean he had the means or methods to reproduce a lot of Sith-based or dark side-based force abilities. From what she has seen he was only slightly better than her when it comes to knowledge, letting her know that he is not as powerful as he seems. I could take advantage of this fact by trying to lure him into some sort of trap to free myself. Vader had been kind, but that did not mean she did not see some of his flaws. The flaw of kindness is one, but there were others that could be taken advantage of. His greed, most in particular. With the short amount of time she has spent with him, Renella could see his interest in anything and the overwhelming desire to have things. Whether this be things like knowledge, which she can attribute with herself, to material and other things. She also could tell of his strange connection with the droids and the strangeness of the droids themselves. Albeit it was a very small group among the millions he has. She was curious at one point and had asked a question. What are these droids exactly? Only Grievous was there to talk to her, or at least she had thought so until she had discovered or stumbled upon why the droids were so weird. Those droids. They live. Live. Yes, they are alive. They were given life and have the ability to use the Force, and all of this was granted by Vader. Grievous obviously knows to not reveal Vader's true identity in front of her. How? Confused and baffled, Renala couldn't help the disbelief cross her face. How am I to know all of the details? I am no intellectual, but a simple military man, and my area of expertise is in that area. Grievous then asked her a question. Are you the one to know things in this area? I am sure you have studied things to do with the Force more than me. A bit stumped she replied. That is true, but from what I understand this shouldn't be possible. Well that must mean your understanding of things is not up to par with even mine. Vader was right, you do need to be brought up to standards. After that conversation she had redoubled her efforts in absorbing as much theoretical practical information and training, as much as she could, if only to catch up with the insufferable cyber. I must surpass him. Renella would surpass Grievous simply because she had more potential than Grievous. Grievous was also given the capacity to use the force like a force sensitive could. She did have an interesting conversation with Vader, and it had been the very last communication between the two that had happened a little after the events that took place on Tatooine. He had asked her on her opinion on how to teach. A surprising piece of information, but she was nonetheless happy to oblige with his request. She now had a way to prove herself and her usefulness, and if she did it right, she may be able to become much more integrated into the confidence of Vader. Only time will tell how far I could go. Her actions certainly displayed her determination and stubborn willpower to do what she sets out to do, willing to risk it all for a Sith artifact that may not have been at the location she went to. Of course she would be like this. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations. Vader had said once, but she would not fully agree to this statement directed towards her. Why? Because there is no way I fail. Arrogance though had become what would be her foe. And that is the pride before the foe. Again Vader had mocked her. I did submit, didn't I? Anel then continued with what she was doing before, making sure that she could impress the towering figure to give her more. When it comes to teaching children, there are many ways and styles to do so, and a teacher would have to adapt their methods as such for each student. Often thought of as one of the most traditional teaching methods, the teacher-centered methodology, attention is concentrated on the teacher. Teachers are in charge of the lesson and direct all activities. This teacher-centered methodology would not really suit Anakin's needs, because this strategy for teaching is seen to favor passive students. Ideally, he would rather have his students participate actively in the learning process. There are many other methods, but he would have to adjust for each and every student. There are things he wants to teach, and things he wants to pass down to other Force-sensitive children no matter their age, as long as they are not indoctrinated fully there is always leeway. Many things about the GD are unsatisfactory and could be improved upon, but Anakin doubts that the counselor or anyone else for that matter would change. Anakin being a complete newbie to teaching others, especially children, he had to come up with reasonable ways to be productive and not waste his own time. The time for the children is important, but so is his, so he would need to come up with plans in relation to what students he has. So far he had been doing well as an assistant, and had gotten help from a variety of sources. When being his own GD masters, Qui-Gon Jinn and Mace Windu. Given that these two had to teach him, they may have insights into what he could do. I do have my own plans and methodology, but it would be best to ask from someone else with experience. Ask away he did. The first person he had discussed things with was Qui-Gon. 
Well, my young apprentice it would seem that you have come to me for some wisdom. Kai Gan stroked his beard like some ancient Chinese cultivating ancestor. Yes master, I have come for your guidance as I have little to no experience in helping children learn. Well, from my understanding most children would dislike the way I approach the lessons. Why? Because they are active, always seeking excitement even if they have been somewhat adjusted to the lifestyle of a GD. That is true, I get bored sometimes. Kui Gan raised his eyebrows as Anakin said that out loud. Well then I guess we should stop our lessons together, there is not much to learn from me. What about me? Is there similarities? No, you are actually quite a unique case not only because of your own potential, but because of the level of maturity you have over your peers and those younger. Makes sense, so does that mean a teaching style similar to Master Windu is what I should do? That is also a no-go, because you don't even know what you are going to teach yet, so it would be best to wait for that. Master Windu is more physically oriented when it comes to his teaching methods, would this not be appropriate for children? Sure, if you want to tire them out. You have a point. Kui Gan pauses before he continued. If you are looking for some guidance, there may be someone who can help you in these trying times. Who? Why, Master Yoda of course. He does after all teach younglings himself and quite often at that. I see, then I thank you master for your time. No problem. Anakin had then gone off to see the enigmatic Master Yoda. Yoda is a cool enough dude, but is an extremely flawed individual, and he may not admit it, but I could see through him. Yoda and Anakin had a standard relationship between the two, but Yoda was wary of him despite Mace Windu speaking up for him given enough time. Well, I can see why Yoda would be concerned. Out of everyone Yoda was the most concerned only second to Mace. They knew of each other and had interacted even within lessons, but it wasn't anything amazing or insightful. Just that Anakin could see that Yoda was fearful himself a lot of the time, but was unwilling to admit it. Stubborn old geezer, but it makes sense when I remember the characteristics of other old geezers unwilling to change and stubborn to their last breath. Adaptability was never really taught within the GD, or more specifically the adaptability of themselves to the motions and currents of time. Change is inevitable after all. Master Yoda. Anakin greeted the diminutive being. Yun Padwin Skywalker, come to see me, you have. Yes master, I have concerns regarding my ability to teach younglings. Insecurities, I sense. No master, it is not fear like you are thinking or suggesting, but the desire to improve my ability to encourage and improve others. Punishment, I am aware, but the council agrees. Given to you, this duty, you will fulfill. Yes, master. Yoda then begins to explain his own methods and styles of practice to Anakin when he teaches younglings, especially when it comes to lightsaber practice. Patience, young Skywalker. The key, patience is. Students must, must be diligent in practice. Yoda says before he continued. Kept, attention should be. After a lengthy discussion between the two the learning session comes to an end. Enjoy, our chat, I did. Thank you, Master Yoda for your time. Today we will be learning about. Anakin was currently teaching to some students who were actually the same age as himself, and in fact this lesson was done within the same session Barris is to attend. Excuse me sir, but how old are you? When the prepubescent teens ask Anakin. I am of the same age as the rest of you. Not everyone within the temple knew exactly what Anakin looked like, so of course there would be some people who do not know about him. You are the same age as us. Yes. It's true, Anakin is my friend and is currently a Padawan. Paris speaks up at this moment deciding to back up and validate Anakin's claims. The classroom explodes at the confirmation and simultaneously surprised that their teacher is a Padawan while being their age. Well, I am one year older than this group, but it doesn't matter. That is enough. I think we should get back to the lesson. Throughout the rest of the day Anakin went around going to his newly assigned classes, and ones he has gone to before to continue where he had left of or is going to begin. You would think children would be discontent with those who do better than them. It is true that when very young people are more prone to being very emotional whether they know it or not, they would act on their emotions. The GD, or in particular younglings are very capable in withholding their emotions, making it all the more easier for an individual to teach. Today I will tell you guys about what midichlorians are exactly. We know, they are some kind of symbiotic thing that lives with us. Inside of all of us. Yes, but there is much more to them than that. That aren't as simple as they seem. Anakin then continued. A simple way to look at them is through the lens of communication, for example if I have 10 devices and Barris over there only has 5 my voice within through the devices is stronger. I have more leeway and will be more easily heard compared to her. Anakin walks around the classroom pacing here and there as he continues. Now just because I have more that does not mean I am necessarily more powerful, because it also means I need more control over the devices. I need to make sure they are synchronized together otherwise what I am trying to communicate won't be as clear, and I would say the same thing over and over without it being clear within the transmission. On the other's hand with 5 devices it would be twice as easier even if she does not have the power advantage it would be quicker for her to take control, and may even overpower my voice with her own. So you are telling us that midichlorians is like communication? Someone asked. Yes, midichlorians do act like that, where they transmit your will, your desires to the energy field, that makes up the force. Anakin then said. That is why not everyone is force sensitive, because they do not have enough midichlorians to be able to use the energy field. Their voices are just not loud enough because they lack the necessary tools. He pauses before he continued. But there are ways for even someone without an abundance of midichlorians to use the force even though limited. Some of the children become interested at this subject. But I don't think I will go into these details for now, but what you should know, is that no matter the amount of midichlorians you have you don't have to worry about it. 
Others may have more talent than you, but you could always beat them simply because of that very difference in synchronization. The control of oneself and their manipulation of the energy field of the force. Beresever the curious girl decided to ask a question she had on her mind, as soon as the topic of the lesson came up. Raising her voice she calls out loud. How many midichlorians do you have? The others within the class get curious as well eagerly awaiting the answer. Well, I am not sure of the amount because no device that we have access to can count the amount. Is it that low? Someone in the class suggests and the rest laugh at the joke. No it is not but in fact when tested by one of my own masters at the time, my results came over 20,000 per cell. Another exclaims. That is higher than Master Yoda. Beerus of course already knows that his record states he has over 20,000, but she does not know the exact amount, and feels that Anakin does know but was unwilling to tell. How does she know this? The womanly intuition was starting to kick in. Settle down now. Anakin started to calm down the class. For the rest of the lesson nothing much else had happened and most of the students he had throughout the day he had taught the same. The reason for his introduction on what exactly midichlorians was were because he wanted to test the waters as he would like to spread the ideology based on separating the living and cosmic force. Qui-Gon was quite right when it came to there being two versions of the force, not just when it comes to the energy types like darkness and light, but also based on the aspects and states of form. Anakin went on to explain after getting confirmation that everyone within his lessons were willing to listen to his information that he would like to pass down. He also here and there started to make sure that they were not as against their feelings. Especially since they were still mentally children and the suppression of such things can be explosive, he knows as it had happened to the original and many other Force sensitives before him. A few years teaching would not be enough to completely change the order, but it would be enough time for me to plant the seeds of doubt, further increasing the likelihood that these people survive. To join my own order I will create they would need to be unprogrammed from their brainwashing done by the GD. I do not want mindless subordinates in the future because they would be limited, and I, in fact already have droids to complete that check. Okay, now that everyone knows about how midichlorians work, I can introduce to you the concepts of the living and cosmic force. Anakin paused to create a dramatic effect. This will change the very way you view yourself and your view on the force. The Gemon Ku. Let the record show that Anakin had a vested interest in what the Yuz and Vong were doing, and so had it created a way for him to view what they were doing. The in and outs of their species, their biological technologies that had stemmed from their very culture and religious belief that metals were evil in some way. Their special biology that makes it impossible to truly sense them using the energy field known as the Force, even when some historical records were kept that their species were at one point very Force-sensitive. Now they had become as they are. A civil war had started within this grand group, large, massive in population species. This led to the ascension of Shimmer. The Jamon coup was a coup against Supreme Overlord Coriol by Domain Jamon, which made Shimmer Jamon the Supreme Overlord of the in Vong. Shimmer, Domain Jamon's leader and a candidate for the Overlordship, insisted that the in Vong invade the galaxy immediately, believing they could win a war easily. He had come to realize that Vong's society was falling apart, and that a unifying cause was needed for them to rally behind. Shimmer, gathering loyal warrior domains, including domains Choka, La, Shai, and the pre-right Vong, along with the warriors of Domain Jemon, launched a sudden attack on Coriol's warriors. Coriol was then killed, along with priests loyal to him, and any other so-called Coriolists. Shimmer thus became supreme overlord of the Yuz in Vong, and ordered the warriors to prepare for the invasion. When Grievous had captured one of their species, Anakin had created a device not only for himself, but for them to see exactly how many midichlorians they have. For himself as well to determine the amount he actually had. Testing out the new device on the beam, Anakin had discovered the presence of midichlorians, just that they were in such small amount per cell. So few that it surprised him that there were any force-sensitive views in Vong at all, but there were. If an average human had about 2500 per cell, then this one in particular, if taken as the average has 250 per cell. A very stark difference in their connection in the Force, but that in on itself would not be enough to mask their presence within the Force. No, there was something special about them, and Anakin intended to take this ability for himself, but this would require him to create or recreate something he remembers. Another thing he had taken account of was his own count. His current count per cell is 36,900 per cell, and if he were to reverse the process, it would mean he was born with 27,700 midichlorians per cell. That water of life was one hell of a drug. He remarked to himself mentally referring to one of the core ingredients used for the Night Sisters ritual. Ahsoka was a happy little girl. Well, as happy as a small child could be. A degrada from the planet Shaili, Ahsoka Tano was discovered by Jedi Master Plo Koon at the age of three while he was on a mission to Shaili, and was raised in the Jedi Temple. She was three years of age, and it had been three years since she had come to the Jedi Temple where she had made her new home. At first she was scared just as any child would be but had grand dreams and desires, and emboldened by what the future could bring, she had set off from Shaili. Not that she would remember much of her home planet anyway. Yungling Ahsoka Tano, are you paying attention? Someone had asked out to her. She was currently sitting in class and was supposed to pay attention to her teacher, as the lesson was about to start, but she wasn't. She had been prone to things like this, distracted a lot about many things in fact. Yes. I am listening. She replied. That is good as today we have a very important guest that would be taking over today's lesson for as long as required of him. Someone else is going to teach us today. One of the younglings asked the current teacher. Yes, someone else will not only do so for today, but for a long while after today as well. The teacher replied. 
Sounds of surprise are echoed around the room as Anakin makes his appearance. Most of the children here should not know much about Anakin, but it would seem that Ahsoka had been bragging a bit, and if it was any indication she did seem embarrassed when looked at by Anakin. Children know no shame, they say. Anakin thought to himself. Today, I would like to introduce to you all, Anakin Skywalker the current Padawan to GD Master Qui Gon Jinn, and GD Master Mace Windu. Again Oz could be heard echoed throughout at the teacher's declaration and introduction, as this is quite the stunning list of masters to have considering just how infamous both Qui Gon and Mace are within the order. Qui-Gon being a very wise man that was widely known for disagreeing with the Jedi High Council, some of the more rebellious students looked up to. There were of course other Jedi who had disagreed with the Council before, but none more so prominent than Qui-Gon. This was especially after taking Anakin as his apprentice. Next up was the other master, Jedi Master Mace Windu, who is also widely known and looked up to because of his outstanding talent and contributions to the Order. Who could ignore his accomplishments? Alright Jimlings, settle down, settle down. From now on you will have to listen to Padawan Skywalker from now on. Yes teacher. All the younglings reply in turn. After everything had relatively settled down the teacher had left all responsibilities to Anakin, and probably got the hell out of Dodge. Who would want to look after some snot-nosed kids anyway? The teacher, probably. Right, as you all know my name is Anakin, Anakin Skywalker. Most of you here can just refer to me as Anakin, as we are all not that far from the same age as each other. I am only 5 years older than most of you. If the children were surprised or even cared about that, no one had let it shown. What a reaction. Anakin thought to himself. After pausing because of the lack of reaction he continued. Today we will be discussing the GD code. The GD code. Ahsoka the ever curious spoke up at this moment, especially excited that her new and most favorite person in the entirety of her world, at the moment was here. The other students also seemed curious despite their very low attention spans due to their rather young age. Yes, we will be going into the GD code. Its strengths, its weaknesses and everything in between. As GD perspective we are force users united in our quest to understand the mysteries of the force, and to serve as guardians of peace and justice throughout the galaxy. We ground ourselves in a spiritual existence and give up individual attachments in order to focus entirely on greater concerns. Of course being children most don't fully understand or comprehend what exactly becoming a Jedi entails. All they know is that it is hard work. Ahsoka within her head was trying her hardest to mentally catalog any and all information that came from out of Anakin's mouth. She had really could to idolize him, and most of what he did, unfortunately for Anakin, she had been showing some rather suspicious tendencies. There is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no chaos, there is harmony. There is no death, there is a force. Anakin paused before continuing. Many things could go wrong if you were all to follow this indiscriminately with no critical thinking. Again unfortunately most had not been paying any proper attention, which would not keep their attention to focus in on what he is saying. Not that they would understand, this was pointless. I should do something else. I guess since no one is really paying attention, I could change this into a practical session. Anakin pulls out a practice lightsaber and directs the children to bring out their very own. Where the fun begins, this is. Anakin then said in a mock voice to make sure they were entertained. Are you not entertained? Anakin mentally thinks to himself. Well it was for my own amusement more than anything. Ahsoka pulled out her training lightsaber and began the attack, the rest of the class followed her lead. Oh. You're approaching me. Instead of running away, you coming right to me. I can't beat you without getting closer. Ahsoka exclaimed as everyone that was part of her class, her clan was motivated to join her in her approach towards Anakin. The outbound flight project. There were many things to keep an eye out for while the galaxy goes to shite, but there were some things that were more important to Anakin, than what others may go for. Anakin needed to divide his attention and concentration spread throughout a multitude of things, many in number, and thankfully he was starting to increase the potential of the force techniques he had created. When it came to the mind, Anakin was always searching for ways to increase the mental fortitude, intelligence and other mental faculties, to increase his strength. Three things he had identified that would be useful in attributes related to the mind. The first was the mental capacity, memories, emotions, organization and perfect memorization of everything he senses through every capacity. Physical or otherwise. The second to keep a close eye on was the increase in the thoughts he could have, parallel thinking came into play, increased the amount of things he could split his mind on, and had been slowly increasing over the years. Now he would be able to split his mind three ways, and with every major increase it was getting harder and harder. Capacity, recall and the quantity weren't the only things that mattered, as there was the problem of increasing the speed of such thought processes. The faster his cognitive functions were the slower he would perceive the world, and the faster he could do things because he could process things faster. All these things together helped to create what he would call the perfect mental force technique to encompass all facilities of the creature that has a brain. He knows that it would only work for those with the mind, and not for the droids, given they are limited to their physical functions. They are protected either way. Anakin mentally connected to one of his elite droids he has sent along with some others on an expeditionary project. How is the progress coming along on that next great adventure you are taking? My emperor, so far nothing major has occurred to report. The droid replied. Another weird thing was how Anakin had to start adapting to the way the droids were going back and forth between how they addressed him, and currently they had taken a liking to the title emperor. 
The outbound flight was an expeditionary project, led mainly by GE Master Chorsk Bath, that sent a mission of 6 GE Masters, 12 GE Knights, and 50,000 men, women, and children, beyond the borders of the Galactic Republic, into the unknown regions, where they hope to pierce the edge of the galaxy, and seek out extragalactic life. Still connected Anakin decides to question. Anything new with GE Master Chors? No, for now he has not done anything that would require a report. Outbound flight was the brainchild of famed GD Master Chorus Bev. Conceived this year, it was planned as a massive expedition into the unknown regions, and eventually beyond the galactic rim to another galaxy. Families would be brought along in hopes of colonizing worlds in the unknown regions and beyond, extending the Galactic Republic's reach. Officially, Outbound Flight was a proposal by the GD Council, but the Forceful Bath assumed control over the project, becoming its main champion. It was Bath who convinced the Senate to support and fund the mission. Though hyperspace travel to other galaxies was long thought impossible due to a hyperspace disturbance beyond the edge of the galaxy, Bath believed that the GD could use the force to smooth it, and allow the vessel to pass. He demonstrated this technique in a turbulent area of space at the edge of the unknown regions, and then recommended that 18 GD, including himself, be included in the mission. Anakin had taken a liking to this technique himself, and had usurped it, unknowingly so he would teach his living droids in the future, when he decides to extend his small but growing empire beyond. Remember to be careful as I expect an ambush to occur. Anakin told the living droid on the other side of his mental connection. Yes Emperor. The droid knew shouts mentally. Other than everything that was just recapped there were other things to keep an eye out for that, would require Anakin's attention on board, as he does not want people to die due to a very stupid GD master. Before breaking the connection the droid speaks up, informing him that it does have something to report. Emperor, before I forget, would your permission. Go on. During the expedition, Jorsk Bath took over the ship from Captain Pakmiller. Currently he is extremely strict and unfair to every non-force sensitive people. He stole children in the night to train, would not permit decoration, and punished people severely for accidents. The droid finishes. Not all GD were as great as they would seem, and some took the GD teachings too far, not that the teachers were not far enough already. Extremes are not healthy or good for either side or point of contention. They would both in the end inevitably become each other, blinded that their respective side is in the right. There are also talks of a rebellion brewing from within. The lead droid continued telepathically communicating. Fast former Padawan Lorana Jinsler, who disagreed with her master's efforts, tried to appease the disgruntled passengers. Interesting, I could use her in the future. I have become acquainted with her, and I hope to safely get everyone there back to Coruscant alive. Another thing, my emperor. Again the droid awaits permission to speak. You may continue. Anakin mentally cited how the living droids had been treating him, he was not a prideful person after all, and did not feel great from the chosen title. Obi-Wan Kenobi, your GE master's former apprentice came aboard the expedition. He had advocated leniency and the ability for parents to choose whether or not to join the aboard training facility, but Kvath would not listen. The droid paused collecting its own thoughts before continuing. Kenobi departed at Roxley, and it would seem Kbath was very much pleased at Obi-Wan's decision. Makes sense to me. For now just make sure everyone survives. Anakin had sent more than one living droid before its departure, and had even stealthily escaped the temple to use Mekuderu on the ships everyone was traveling on. Can't leave everything to chance, and I would like to not leave anything to chance at all. Anakin knew it wouldn't be long before Sidious had decided enough was enough, and sent someone to deal with the matter that was interfering with his plans. The creation of droids for the Separatists' droid armies to be led by Dooku, to be known at this point as Darth Tyrannus. There was not much he could do to put a stop to the full takeover of the droid factories on Geonosis, but Anakin had hoped he had delayed Sidious to prevent any further deaths in the future. He knows of the great catastrophe on Geonosis, and it would be prudent to make sure he could do something about it. Knowing the GD he may not be able to convince them or change their minds, but with less droids, there could be less deaths by the time events start to kick off. A battle cry pierces the air as a saber swing is swung down, aiming to land on Anakin's head. He nearly dodges out of the way as his attacker comes to light. Stop your thinking and fight me. The distracted state is only making me upset. Upset. I thought the GD are meant to control their emotions Isla. Anakin replies in a mocking but joking tone. Isla responds to his tone by aggressively attacking him once again, as they both engage in a lightsaber duel, of course using training sabers. She swings downwards, but Anakin parries. Who does that work anyway? How does a blade made of light have the physical capacity to parry? Anakin mentally thinks to himself as Isla goes in for another swing to his side. Easily dodging he moves out of the way as yet another saber comes from behind him at the same time, this saber coming from one of his training droids that was now helping Isla. Swiftly moving around the training room many other training droids make themselves known and start attacking Anakin as Isla also resumes her own pursuit after him. Getting tired are we? Anakin continuously taunts as everything is incapable of touching him, including the now much more skilled Isla after practicing with Anakin. Nearly out of breath Isla leaps one last time trying something new to catch him off guard. Only to fail at the last second as Anakin spins around, disarms and catches her within his arms. The droids deactivate and retreat after the success of Anakin overcoming Isla has occurred. You really are not that good at handling a saber, now are you? Blushing quite a bit Anakin sees it is quite visible to the eye, but decides to not mention anything about it. I thought I had you there, but it seems your talents in replicating what Master Windu has, has given you the ability to see any and all of my actions. Isla replies sounding a little but hurt considering she had been at this for an entire month now. True. 
Anakin states simply. Isla and Anakin had grown close, very close, but due to many things, nothing had really happened between the two. Considering that Isla doesn't seem to take into account Anakin's actual age, he would say this is progress. I have a few flaws I need to work on, don't I? Isla questions in a knowing tone. Yes, feedback is important for growth after all. Stagnation will hinder your progress into becoming better or improving. Isla sighs. Great. After the events that had happened the year prior, Isla had been trying to recuperate and recover from the events that took place on a mission she had gotten passionate about. This led to her brief influence under the dark side of the Force, and she had come back to the GD not long after. She had gotten all the guidance she could, but had been inevitably drawn to someone special. At least, someone special to her, but she knows he was special to others as well. She could see it in the eyes of her master, Quinlan Vos, whenever she mentioned Anakin. Lost for a while now, she had been stuck within the GD temple doing nothing and lazing around then that crazy but inconsequential droid attack happened, which led to her meeting with Skywalker. You should have some rest for now before we continue. It would seem I have exhausted you. Anakin said to Isla whom was in her thoughts. W what? Isla says before registering what he said. Oh, well, yes. I think I will. She had felt something weird growing from within, a feeling she had not had before, and it was exhilarating, anxiety inducing and strangely warm. This all happened when she was near Anakin. These feelings only increased, but she tried to suppress it despite Anakin influencing her to not follow the GD code blindly, she was still quite blinded, but had been only recently opened up to the dangers of the world. She did not want to go to anyone about this as for some reason she had felt embarrassed, but that did not mean she didn't want to identify these emotions. What was even stranger still was the weird occurrences that would happen every so often. A special connection had been unknowingly made between the two all by accident, and she had been subject to the effects. But because of the specialness of Anakin, it was taken to an even stranger degree. She was able to see and feel what many people were feeling, well at least to her what she considered many beings. First was Anakin. She could view through his eyes, hear though his ears, feel what he touched. Everything. When nearby to each other she could distinctly feel his thoughts and emotions, but it was strange as if there was some sort of barrier erected that was keeping her out. As time progressed it got stronger until eventually she was able to know what Anakin felt, his emotions and all. It was a strange experience and she had considered going to someone for this, but as for now she would take some time to see more before wanting some guidance. Especially since the guidance Master Yoda gave me was so helpful. She rolled her eyes at the thought. Strangely enough she could sense what Anakin was going to do as well, instinctively she had strong desire to be protective of him, and had noticed their synergy together was extremely powerful. That was not the only experiences she had as she also saw through the eyes of another, droids. As if she was in control of the droids, directing their actions. She wasn't able to glean any information by doing this though. It was chaotic and she unable to gain any from this strange perspective. Again unknowingly another effect of being unknowingly bonded to Anakin. All of these symptoms she was experiencing was the result of a special bond, a special connection that is so rare and unheard of, but just so happened to appear here. Anakin had noticed these effects on himself, but had not had the intense reactions Isla had, and if he were to connect the dots, if Isla told him what she was experiencing, he would know what it was. A force diet. A force diet, also known as a diet in the force, was a rare type of force bond that paired two force-sensitive beings, and made them one in the force. The power of a diet was as strong as life itself, and the individuals who formed a diet shared a connection that spanned across space and time. The only thing was how did this happen. For now, Anakin would not find out about this, and about how diet had formed between himself and Isla until the future, which would lead to some interesting results. I think it may be best to keep this to myself for a while. At least until I figure this thing out some more. Isla thought to herself before some more selfish thoughts entered her mind. Maybe I should just keep this to myself. It is something between Anakin and I after all the shrine in the depths. An ancient Sith shrine situated at a Force Virgins on the planet Coruscant, constructed before the rise of the modern Galactic Republic. However, the residual power of the dark side inherent in the shrine, seeped out over the intervening millennia, weakening the precognitive abilities of the Order. This weakening would result in the Supreme Chancellor otherwise known as Darth Sidious to rule supreme. The Sith constructed the shrine on the planet Coruscant on top of a sacred spire, a powerful light side virgins, hoping to corrupt it with the dark side of the Force, which eventually succeeded. The enormous black edifice stood against the Coruscant sky as a symbol of Sith dominance, until it was raised by the Jedi at the end of the Great War. In a symbolic attempt to bury the legacy of the Sith that had been left behind on the galactic capital, following the Sith Order's defeat, eventually the Four Masters erected the Jedi Temple over the Shrine's foundations. That was until Anakin Skywalker, the prophesized Chosen One had secretly been hard at work uncovering the Shrine, looking for information about the techniques available to someone practicing the dark side of the Force. Anakin, along with some droids, the droids that had flown under the radar as just some simple training droids meant to help him, were now accompanying Anakin into the depths. These droids were not living and did not have access to the Force, but were good enough to help him in this venture. Symbols covered the walls, a deep dark red hue illuminated the shrine centered at the middle, along with nothing sitting in its place, but a simple looking holocron. Broken pillars that were quite high up off the ground were just about ready to crumble. What is this? Anakin knew that coming down here the energies of the dark side would be prominent, and was most certainly going to find only the shrine. It would seem he was incorrect, as there was something conveniently placed right at the center. A pyramid-shaped object that gave off a red light of its own. 
A Sith holocron located beneath, that shouldn't be B. Anakin thought to himself then commanded his droids. Spread throughout the area and make sure to check for other corridors that may lead to other areas. Do not enter them just yet and be alert just in case. The various droids fanned outwards and helped to secure the area. Moving towards the shrine, Anakin walks up while feeling his own connection to the Force Surge. Controlling the energies here is hard because it is a convergence point that was corrupted. If it was originally of the dark, Anakin would not having any problems, but because it was of the light and then corrupted it was especially malicious. Walking up the steps getting closer and closer, Anakin feels his natural instincts tell him to not go towards the Sith Holocron. Why? Because of the inherent darkness that lay within. The droids had now safely assumed their positions, reporting that there was no other corridors or hallways connecting to a larger infrastructure. Only the entrance created by Anakin leading towards the shrine that is contained within a large room. No hesitation could be seen on Anakin's face as he advanced towards the unknown. Yes, yes, yes. Anakin could start to hear voices. Voices of a time long past trying so desperately to be heard. The cries and distant surges of angry screams kept tearing through his mind, but his mental shields helped prevent any further damage once he caught on to the mental manipulation being down. Come to me, come to me. A disembodied voice speaks to him telepathically. Anakin keeps getting closer. Closer, yes, closer still. Power, unfathomable power. None the likes of what you have seen. The disembodied voice continues trying to agitate Anakin. Take it, it is your destiny to become so much more. So much more. Peace is a lie, there is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The force shall free me. The voice started to chant over and over overlapping many times. The tenets of the Sith are more than just words to be memorized. Learn them, understand them. They will lead you to the true power of the force, the power of the dark side. Conflict forces one to better oneself. The forces change, growth, adaption, evolution or death. It is our goal to be stronger, to achieve our potential and not rest upon our laurels. We are the seekers, not the shepherds. Without strife, the victory has no meaning. Without strife, one does not advance. Without strife, there is only stagnation. Unless the victory is achieved by demonstrating that your power is superior, it is only an illusion. Temporary at best. We seek more. One who has freed themselves from all restrictions has reached perfection their potential fulfilled. Perfect strength, perfect power, perfect destiny. The Force is our servant and our master. Our teacher and our companion. A weapon and a tool. Know it and you know the universe. Master it and you master the universe. Strive for perfection and the Force shall reward you. The same disembodied voice kept repeating all of these words, the chant of the Sith Code and so much more, all overlapping, creating a dissonant effect. Anakin as if immune to the headache the voice was trying to create, continued his jaunt up the steps of the altar. Upon reaching the top, the voice stops his insistent and annoying mad rambling. The top of the altar, the shrine, was huge enough to fit a few of himself, and it formed a circular pattern alternating along the edges. Anakin got closer to the middle as an uneasy silence had now filled the room and reached down to pick up the Sith holocron placed at the center. Immediately after Anakin was assaulted with visions that disoriented him a bit before he regained control of his mind. The vision entails a conversation between two people. Why did you have to try and search for that? A female voice said. What, did you not believe I could achieve what I was looking for? Perfection. Absolute perfection in human form, a result of the Sith abilities within the dark side. The masculine voice said. Perfection. What you are trying to create are nothing but monsters. The feminine voice then continued. I don't think you understand the scale of your operation just yet. The things these beings would be capable of would cause destruction of untold scale. A paltry price, that I am willing to pay. The male continued. For all shall know me, or of me within the future to come. My legacy shall be spread throughout the galaxy. It is wrong of you to try something like this, dangerous and quite possibly will turn against you in the end. No matter what you do, it would inevitably come back to bite you in the ass. Robush. Do you think the GD are strong enough to topple me? The dark side of the force is much more powerful. Your arrogance will be your downfall. Enough of this, I need to get back to creating my masterpiece. You shall see, in the future I will be known, I will be feared, my very name echoed across time and space. Nearing the end now of the flashback the male figure finished off. All shall know me, for I am Terra Stars. There was not much to be found underneath, but there was a special holocron with information pertaining to the manipulation of the body. An ancient Sith had left their knowledge behind inside this holocron, but unfortunately it was incomplete. Strangely enough it was not a standard holocron that would have it being be imprinted onto the artifact, but was only a list of things pertaining to the manipulation of the human form. Incomplete as they may be, but was intriguing nonetheless. The creation of a specialized system to create human super soldiers. The creation germ cells and viral machines that have been genetically engineered to develop into the various organs that are implanted into a normal human adolescent male, to transform him into a transhuman being. Developed during an era now bygone, this would be the start of a project that Anakin would use to his advantage. He could also see some similarities over what this could do, and what the other genetic manipulations from others has done. The difference being this one was more successful, but incomplete and not as perfect as the male figure had wanted it to be. Anakin had secured the temple underneath by leaving behind some of his droids to cover the entrance, as no doubt people within the temple would be interested in this. Interested in trying to destroy it that is. It wouldn't matter to him either way, he had come to study and discover if there was anything left behind by the ancient Sith. 
He had gotten what he had wanted. A vergence in the Force was located here and could be used to his advantage. A vergence or nexus point was a phenomenon of the Force that was centered around a place or object, and in rare instances around an individual. The vergence was a place in the galaxy where the Force flowed the most freely, in a concentrated wellspring of energy that could be more easily harnessed by those sensitive to his power. He of course could count himself as one as well, no doubt others within the Order would agree, and at the top of that list would be Qui-Gon. Vergences are locations within the galaxy where the Force is heavily concentrated around places, objects, or individuals, and easily manipulated by forceful beings. The Jedi Order created many theories on how vergences were created and why, but all theories put forward showed great flaws. Vergences could appear anywhere in the galaxy and varied in size, from entire planets to a single room. Many vergences in the Force appeared at locations with a strong history of its presence, where Force users gathered, or great tragedies occurred. The laws of time and space did not confine a vergence, as they could exist outside it. Vergences could exist for a single moment in history, or be maintained for millennia. They could grow and expand, or diminish completely. Not all vergences were the same, some encouraged certain abilities, such as giving visitors visions, or strengthening psychokinetic ability. Both the Jedi Order and the Sith sought out these vergences and used them for their individual purposes. These groups often built temples around or over top of the Nexus, or used the vergence as a talisman, if it was centered around an object. Legends and prophecies spoke of vergences forming around individuals, a rare occurrence that had not been studied well by either order. With Anakin he had become sort of a subject to be studied himself. He did not totally dislike the way that sometimes he was treated, but that does not mean he liked it either. When it came to Coruscant and the shrine underneath, that Sith Holocron had been at the center of such a vergence, and had become imbued with the energies of the Force. This is likely why Anakin had experienced such weird happenings and events upon arrival and ascension upon the altar. The holocron he now has possession over would be called a talisman. The objects left in the presence of a Force Nexus for extended amounts of time, eventually became saturated with the Force, which imbued the object with special abilities. Examples including a blade edge that will never dull, the ability to absorb certain Force powers like Force Lightning and Electric Judgment, or even the ability to enhance the wielder's perception of time, allowing him to think and react faster than otherwise possible. This effect allowed even a being who wasn't force sensitive to use the talisman to a great degree. Moreover, objects imbued with a particular aspect of the force be it light or dark, could actually become so saturated as to make their very presence intolerable to those of opposite alignment. Now that Anakin had come into possession of such an object, he could feel the corrupting energies of the dark side, and it was true that he would have felt repulsion, if he was only in line with the light. Its energies radiated darkness not only because of the original creator being a Sith, but the location of interest as well. I am excited to find out the uses of this object, as there should be much more to this holocron other, than the information stored within. Other than Anakin being a vergence within the Force himself there was another that existed long ago, that took place during the Mandalorian Wars around 4000 years prior to now. Her name being Mita Sirk. But I think that is enough of a history lesson for now, I should really start delving into the knowledge that is within my grasp. Kaminans were tall thin amphibian sentient species native to the isolated extragalactic aquatic planet of Kamino. Living in large silted domed cities that rose high above the ocean surface, Kaminans were known to specialize in pioneering cloning and genetic engineering, as well as developing technologies for various clients, including the Galactic Republic. Now, their list on clientele will increase by one. Anakin dressed in his Vader suit, but communicated with the Kaminans because of the information he had gotten from the Sith Holocron, but which it contained the secrets to becoming a superior human, transcendent above a normal human, and transforming themselves into a superhuman. Kaminans usually keep to themselves and to get a deeper understanding of why they are heavily invested into genetic engineering is because of purpose. The Kaminans don't create without a purpose. While Kamino remained unknown to most, the Kaminans' skill in engineering and genetic engineering was whispered of in some parts of the underworld. While Anakin had wanted to get an in with the Kaminans, he did not need it originally, but now he would need to approach them to try and convince them of his desires. Within his Vader persona, he had gotten outside of the Jedi Temple, or to be more specific, he had renovated the Sith Shrine underneath into an appropriate base of operations here on Coruscant. It was here that he would conduct himself in his Vader persona to control and plan things out, at least while he as Anakin was on lockdown within the temple. For now, he has secured a valid and encrypted connection to the Kaminans, and was going to use it. Calling in, the Kaminans are quick to pick up. Both sides see the respective holographic figures appear from their own ends. Greetings, it has come to our attention that you wish to use our services. Vader on the other end replies. Yes. You must know by know that we Kaminans do not just help anyone. Not without a benefit of our own, not without a purpose. I know of this act. The Kaminan on the other end questions Vader's intent. For which purpose is this meeting called? Do you also wish to have clones, some genetic manipulation of sorts to be applied to yourself or others? Or are you only here to waste their time? Vader's breathing on the other end starts to unnerve the Kaminan as he pauses to create the desired effect. I have something that might be of some interest to you. To all of those who practice medicine within your people. Noting the silence on the other side as curiosity, Vader continues. I have discovered some very useful information that pertains to the manipulation of genetics. Genetics in particular to do with humans and their development from young to old. I wish to complete and perfect the source of this information. The Kaminan at this point, interested introduces himself. 
Well, before we properly begin I would like to introduce myself first. My name is Lama Su, and I am the statesman who leads the ruling council of Kamino. Vader replies. You may simply call me Vader, I am of no particular significance, but come from the recently liberated planet of Tatooine. I am here on behalf of the people of Tatooine to help further increase our military, and wish to create something incredibly powerful. I have heard about Tatooine, supposedly your planet is under the control of some sort of criminal empire, is it not? Yes, but you are wrong because Tatooine is currently not under any criminal. It has come under the role of a governmental body that is a combination of a democracy and monarchy together. Interesting, it would seem that I myself have missed out on some interesting news, but let's get back on topic. Tell me more about this interesting bit of information you have stumbled across. Like I said, it is based of creating germ cells and viral machines that would be used to develop into various organs. Vader then continues. More specifically it has been developed for those who are human. That sounds interesting indeed, and we have been and still currently are in the process of experiments that include human DNA. Lama Su and Vader then continue to discuss the terms of their agreement to do things, and an interesting little tidbit did pop up that surprised and somewhat offended the Kaminans. I wish to bring some other things into this project, or more specifically I wish to bring in researchers and medical technicians of my own. Vader said. Not to get too angry quickly, Lama Su waited for Vader to finish. They will be of great assistance and in fact should not get in the way of what we plan to do. Vader presented to them the concept of the droids he had under his command, and while this did not concern Lama Su too much if at all because of droids imitations, he was nonetheless intrigued, but decided that his employer would not like him asking questions. The Kaminans did not need anything of too much importance from Vader, except the information he so graciously provided, and the payment was for public credits. Something which Vader had confirmed he could provide. Being the calculative species that they were, they were completely independent of the Republic, and had no need to report about themselves which increased their autonomy. But this limited them to relying on the Republic still. The Kaminans performed calculations and came to believe it was less risky to work on their own, as they could have been colonized, lost resources, and undergone a change in culture. The Kaminans also preserved the land-based species and adapted themselves, their flora, and their fauna to survive on the changed planet. Again establishing why their species were such great geneticists. Maybe not as ethical as they could be, but if scientists had their way with the galaxy, everything would be put under the knife to further the survivability of the species. It just may come under heavy price. The first thing the Kaminans had to do was the creation of the genetic data necessary for the transformation process. They needed to use something for a basis and what better sample than Anakin himself, provided they were to use his genetics for the process. Using his cells they would then use viral machines to manipulate and shape what his cell samples are to become. Organs specialized for Anakin, made from Anakin. He was given a time frame within which they could complete and perfect the first few implants that he wanted, and it should be that within this very year they would complete it. Taking the first step in becoming a superhuman being. It was just a year prior she had been celebrated and re-elected to represent her people. Re-elected as the Queen of Naboo. Many things had happened over the course of three years, so much so she was starting to feel the overwhelming pressure, but she did not cave. Not once did she break down, but had risen from the situations and events presented to here. With some help, she had even not needed to worry too much about their protection anymore. The boy known as Anakin had taken up a special place within her heart, and for some reason, she quite missed the boy. After the invasion she had many responsibilities to get back to, which included looking after the well-being of her people. Her actions throughout the crisis earned her immense popularity with the people, and the Naboo and Gungans became officially unified during the celebration in Thede, attended by Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, and by the Jedi whom had protected her. After the celebration, Pad was approached by the Jedi Master Qui-Gon, who, on behalf of the Jedi Council and in agreement with the Supreme Chancellor, asked her to keep all knowledge of the Sith a secret. Pad had heard some very weird or strange rumors circulating within the Republic, and no matter how small these voices were, she had taken a keen interest, once she discovered it had to do with the planet Anakin had come from. Tatooine. The planet with which she did not like all too much, the heat was not to her preference and the outlaws that stay in that area, quite not right. My queen, I believe it would be prudent that you stay away from coming in contact with that planet or those in power. One of her advisors had told her. From what I have heard, the people of Tatooine have freed themselves of their oppressors, and have taken examples from the Republic on how to better their situation. Well that may be true your highness, in general it should be taken as a rule that systems that have not been included into the Republic are dangerous. Especially those in the outer rims. She did not disagree with that statement, as she had done some research of her own into the political situation within the outer rims, and there was an empire. An empire run by the Huts, infamous in their criminal acts. I cannot just refuse to help them. Ever the compassionate woman she was concerned with the people there. Whatever aid she could provide she would try, given the situation on Naboo had gone back to peace, and had been prospering ever since their agreement with the Gungans. Your Highness, I still strongly disagree with anything you would like to do. Well, you will just have to deal with it. What Pad was confused about however was why Tatooine and their elected officials were refusing to become part of the Galactic Republic considering their situation. Something even more outrageous to her, well not outrageous but extremely surprising was the object of the people on Tatooine's affections. The Skywalker family. Even though not a lot of people knew exactly of what had happened, people had come to know of the ascension from an ordinary family that only comprised of Shmai and Anakin Skywalker into a type of monarchy. 
most of the power was actually given to Shmai, given that Anakin had to give up all worldly things from becoming a Jedi. But if he were to ever return, he would return a prince, a king, maybe even an emperor of his own. Now having a personal connection with the current ruling monarch of Tatooine, Padme had decided to contact Shmai Skywalker. No doubt she would be struggling to come to terms with her sudden election into power. The people trusted her, but what was even more important was her being the mother of Anakin and her own contributions towards the common folk. She had established some messages being sent between herself and Shmai, but there was never a time that they could talk in full about what had happened. Hello, your highness. Shmai ever the humble and polite woman had addressed her. No, it is I that should be calling you by your title. Padme had not informed Shmai of her real identity, so she does not know that herself as Padme is in actuality the same as the queen she's now. Chuckling to herself, Shmai seems as if she was minorly stressed out from her predicament. Your Highness, I am grateful for your call, but I'm confused as to why you have all of a sudden reached out to me. Padden decides that discretion will be needed because she still keeps her advisor's words in mind. There is no need to be thankful, you have done more for me, than I have done for you. That is why I am willing to repay the favor. Shmai may not be ready to adapt to a political lifestyle, but I've been in the business world enough to help cultivate her leadership abilities. Truly. I don't think we are in desperate need of anything at this moment. And Shmai was correct in saying this as from all reports everything had been going swimmingly. Really. Padme says in a dubious tone before saying. There must be something, anything really. No. Shmai knows better than to divulge now important state secrets to others, even if they are trusted allies. The queen to her was obviously only still a stranger she has had some minor dealing with in the past. I could help you come to terms with your new position. Padme suggests. I could provide assistance not in terms of economic or militaristic options, but diplomatically, and even give advice on how to govern. Shmai thinks it over, thinking it is actually a good option, but decides to one-up her deal. Your Highness is very kind, but an offer of that sort should be compensated in some way. Nonsense. I have no need for anything monetary or of anything else you could offer. If I may suggest, I think it would be better to form an official alliance between the two of us. This way there will be a valid reason for your insistence on your providence of assistance. Padden thinks it is a good idea and berates herself for not coming up with an idea of sorts herself. Some sort of non-aggression pact. That would be best, your highness given the culture of your people, it would not be a good idea for other reasons. That is true. Pad with no hesitation agrees. I believe that settles that, now onto other subjects just to satiate my curiosity. What might that be, your highness? Padme's starting to get annoyed at how Shmai was addressing her as she first gets this out of the way. Please Queen Dowager, I think that is enough of the fancy terms of addressing me. Becoming much more emboldened Shmai decides that what she had said is fine with her. Okay, then what should I call you? Smiling, Padme decides to drop the bomb that Shmai has not become aware of yet. Just call me Padme. The Kaminans sure do work fast. It had only been three months, and they have already perfected the first few implants using his DNA. Considering they have a much larger project to work on, in particular the clones, it makes sense that it would not take too long to complete something like this. At least it didn't take long to complete the implants, because the initial concept, outline and planning of the set of implants was already created. Today of all days, he will be going through with them. Some alterations were made to the process to make it easier and better to go through with the process. His medical droids, the ones that had been granted a living consciousness, were now professionally trained, and were fully capable of doing the surgical procedures needed. My emperor, we are ready to start the procedure. A living droid said to Anakin as they stood within the Sith temple located beneath the Coruscan Jedi temple. The shrine had been redecorated and renovated to fit what Anakin desired, it would be a great place to do surgery. Hidden away from the rest of the world, and he had in fact been granted some leave. Some time to rest. This combined with his own physical regenerative abilities, should give him enough time to recuperate from the insertion on implants. Anakin moving over to the specific part of the room that entails an entirely new entrance to another part of the Sith temple. Other medical droids that were not a part of living group, also followed along, so as to assist the living medical droids. Before, Anakin could have left to go towards his shop that had a special room reserved for himself here on Coruscant, but now he had a whole building he owned, while well his mother owned, but that is besides the point. Now, he had moved everything from there to the shrine underneath, because it provided greater security measures and above all else, a better state of secrecy. Other things have been renovated to better uphold the infrastructure, so the place doesn't collapse on him or any of the droids working down here. Moving on to the surgery and implants, there are a total of 19 types of implants, but Anakin was only to have the first three introduced. There was obviously more to the lineup of implants, and Anakin had felt it was incomplete. So too did the Kaminans. Let's begin. Anakin spoke as he had to align himself to the dark side of the force wall within the shrine. He had noticed that if he does not align his force signature with the dark side while being this close to the virgins located down here he would feel repulsed. Laying down on the surgical table, Anakin awaits for the operation to start. My, Emperor. As many of these implants are neural in nature, it is important to note that for many of these implantations, the subject must be awake for the surgery, and the mind cannot be dulled by the use of painkillers. The living medical droid spoke of the pitfalls of the process. I know of the consequences and I am fine with the process. Many of these organs are cultured in vitro from his modified cells, whilst others require that his modified cells be injected into his body, and then grow into a new organ using his own physiological processes. 
Anakin would use the modified cell's organs to unleash and control the metabolic processes that would transform him from an ordinary mortal into a superhuman. First, I believe that this should be given an official name. Before the operation begins, Anakin decides he would like to start calling the modified cells through another name. Deciding to be a bit narcissistic he says. I will now dub this the Sky Seed. The Sky Seed itself is encoded with all the genetic information needed to reshape ordinary human cell clusters into the special organs he would possess in those instances where they are not directly implanted after being cultured outside the body. The Sky Seed contains genetically engineered viral machines which rebuild the human body according to the biological template contained within it and originally crafted by the combined scientific acumen of the Anakin, the Kaminins and living medical droids. Seeing the process is about to begin, Anakin stills himself preparing for the pain of the process. Now being put under the knife, Anakin starts to think about what these implants would do. The secondary heart is the first and least difficult of the 19 Sky Seed organ implants I would receive to transform myself. It resembles a smaller version of the human heart, and is implanted in the chest cavity, and connected to the rest of the neophyte circulatory and pulmonary systems near the original heart. This function is to enhance the performance by supplying more oxygen and nutrients to the muscles, by increasing blood flow well beyond, that capable for even the most fit normal human being. In the event of combat damage to or failure of the original heart, the secondary heart is usually capable of pumping enough blood through the circulatory system to maintain survival, until I can be treated. The surgery was lasting a very long time, and would take the entirety of the day to complete. The smudula is the second of the 19 sky seed organs to be implanted. This implant, surgically placed alongside the pituitary gland at the base of the brain, thus becoming a part of the endocrine system, secretes a specially engineered form of human growth hormone. When the effects of this hormone are combined with a diet laced with microscopic ceramic-based minerals, they will act to synthesize the rapid growth of the skeletomuscular system, which results in superhuman strength and massive size, compared to a baseline human male. It was projected that two years after the surgery to implant these modula is completed, the my skeleton will be larger and exponentially stronger than a normal man's, with growth having topped out at around 2.1 to 2.3 meters in height, with an equivalent amount of skeletomuscular mass. During this time the ribcage will fuse into a solid mass of bulletproof interlaced bone plates. The resulting structure protects the organs from damage in a way the normal human skeleton never could, though at the price of producing greater difficulties for the medical professionals, when they must perform surgeries on his body cavity. The Biscopi is the third of the 19 Sky Seed organs to be implanted into myself. This organ enhances physical combat ability and survivability to superhuman levels, should I live to become a fully transformed being. This organ is implanted into the chest cavity. It is small, approximately spherical and, like the Ismodula, its primary action is hormonal. The presence of the Biscopi stimulates muscle growth throughout the body, greatly increasing physical strength. It can be implanted at the same time as the first two organs, the secondary heart and the Ismodula, generally between the 10th and 12th standard human years of age. The nanosuit that Anakin had achieved symbiosis with had in fact not been a problem when the droids were hard at work operating on him, exactly because of symbiosis. He could retract the armor, consciously and subconsciously he has complete control over its form over himself, and most of the time it is hidden. If Anakin were to somehow go completely unconscious the suit would appear fully around his form. Anakin was many things, most if not everyone he had made would call him kind by nature. Compassionate in wanting to do something, to create actions that brought about change for the better. But, there was the other side of him. His possessiveness, his greed, his lust for things, people, power most of this ambitious nature to seek out perfection, comes in line with the Sith Code. His passion, his drive, everything about him radiated that there was more to the universe than what anyone could possibly hope to imagine. For Anakin though, just because there were more darker parts of his personality did not mean he rejected these aspects and threw them away. No, he embraced it. Fully. Which leads us to the current situation, where Anakin had sent some droids into a system that was quarantined. No visitor, no one was allowed to come here, for if they do only death would seek them back. The Lehan system. Once referred to as the Rakata system or Starforge system, was the system in the unknown regions containing the planet of Lehan and the Starforge. Statement. We are here. The Emperor had said he wanted to locate the remains of the Starforge. HK-47 said as he was in command. Abo, the star of the system, was feeding the Starforge, built by the Rakata and placed close to the sun. The system afterward became part of the Galactic Republic. Following the Battle of Rakata Prime, the wreckage of the Starforge and the vessels lost during the battle, made the system difficult to navigate. After the GD Civil War, the Republic made the entire Lehan system a protected historical site, and dictated that it was not to be entered without permission. This lasted until the Republic Dark Age, when the crumbling government could no longer protect the location. Sir, we have arrived. Current location, Lehan system, unknown regions, tempered wastes. Inquiry. What planets orbit this star? Reporting, that would be planets Iwar, Muldina, Taxiode, Lehan, Destin, Jirup Sul, Verlaclest and Dingbriar, that orbit the star named Abo. The planet Lehan, also referred to as Rakata, Rakata Prime, and the Unknown World, was the homeworld of the Rakata species, and the secret capital of their infinite empire. Looking towards their planet of interest HK-47 commands those on the ship they are on to descend. Statement. Let's take a closer look. This planet's a technological graveyard. One droid says looking at the mass destruction caused by the great wars of the past. 
The droids may not be all talk, but sometimes they could not hold back from vocalizing their amazement at the wreckage. Even the lifeless could see the view is quite something. Lehan was a tropical world in a remote and relatively unknown corner of the galaxy known as the Tempered Wastes, a largely void area of space. The surface was largely covered by oceans dotted by numerous clusters of islands and archipelagos. It was the only habitable planet in the Lehan system, but it used to share an orbit around its primary star, with the Star Forge, an ancient rocket and space station and factory which drew its fuel directly from the system's primary star. The planet itself was orbited by two small moons, but one of them was close enough to be visible from the surface during daylight, covering a significant portion of the sky. Statement. Go down, we are to recover the fragments of the Star Forge. The Emperor wants what is rightfully his. Artificial intelligence is a weird thing, especially within the galaxy here. The technology can imitate life, where droids could have personalities of their own, but were not considered fully living, sentient, and sapient beings. The droids created by Anakin to live could be considered alive, but not in the biological sense. But the Star Forge Anakin would be able to do so much more, to further his powers within the Force, his understanding of creation and the process of transference of power. It is lamentable that the Emperor would be unable to acquire Darth Raven's Sith Holocron. HK-47 thought to itself. Landing safely and secure, HK along with the droid battalion it had come with, started to explore the islands and the archipelagos surrounding it. Everything, all of the bits and pieces of the Star Forge, had been sunk deep beneath the oceans of Lehan. The Star Forge was a giant automated shipyard, designed to create the most powerful army of all time. It was constructed by the Racket and Infinite Empire, 5,000 years before the rise of the Galactic Republic. The Star Forge drew energy and matter from a nearby star which, when combined with the power of the Force, was capable of creating an endless supply of ships, droids, and other war material. The Arcata, also known as the Builders, constructed the massive space station through the use of slaves from many subject worlds including Dulcivis, Corellia, Korskin, Dantuain, Drawl, Duro, Kashik, Manon, Salonia, Slaherin, Malister, and Tatooine. This technological marvel came at a terrible cost, as the Arcata were by nature a cruel and savage species, the Star Forge began feeding off these negative traits inherent in its creators. As a result the Star Forge became an immense tool of dark side power. The Star Forge, now a fusion of technology and dark side energies, began corrupting the Rakata in order to gain the immense power it required to operate itself, and ultimately cause the collapse of the Rakata Empire. HK-47 feared what may come if his emperor wanted to reconstruct such a dangerous artifact, but his better judgment is clouded by his devotion to his emperor. But certainly, my emperor, to want this marvel of technology, means he has a means or method on controlling it. HK-47 then realizes why his emperor is so bold. He could use Mechadere. The Star Forge may have been semi-sentient at once, but has now the eyes, and if his Emperor were to imbue himself, his energy into a newly constructed Star Forge created out of the previous Forge's remains, it should be under control. If his Emperor could control millions of droids and ships, surely he would be capable enough to mantle such an abyss of the Force. HK started to realize his heretical thoughts. Oh no. I have detected heresy within my programming. All jokes aside, Anakin would not have been a good leader if he did not allow those beneath him to think for themselves, as they could help him make up for his failures. Statement. We won't need to modify the terrain, but we'll need to secretly bring in more transportation ships to go back and forth between here and Tatooine. Command. You there, get to work on this while the others will set up base. HK-47, then continues. We need to start construction of powerful submarines capable enough of salvaging the wreckage. Roger, roger. A group of droids replied. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.